Home on the Harbor. Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book Four. Written by Ellen Joy. Narrated by Jennifer March. Chapter One. Harper stood in the corner of her old high school gymnasium, thinking of ways she could escape her current situation. She could either stick the toothpick in her eye from her strange-tasting vegetarian meatball and be rushed to the hospital, or she could just be an adult and leave. Who cared that she went to high school with these people? It wasn't even their tenth reunion, but their twelfth. If she hadn't talked to them in all those years, why would she want to talk to them now? Unfortunately for Harper, she'd had no excuse when Mateo Perez, her oldest and closest friend, had convinced her to go. They're just so fake, she said to Mateo, who stood with his arm around his fiancée, Renee. He made a face that suggested he was tired of the same conversation. Lila probably spread hundreds of rumors throughout the four years there, Harper said, staring at the group of people who had basically ignored her in high school. She's the fakest of them all. Mateo continued with the face. Who's fake? Renee asked, leaning over to see who Harper was referring to. Harper pointed to the typical specimen of Martha's Vineyard elite and privileged, Lila Whitmore. Like most of the women who surrounded her, Lila wore her long blonde hair in perfectly iron-curled ringlets, long past her shoulders. Her couture-sized negative fashionable burnt orange dress looked stunning against her bronze tan. She looks like Barbie, Renee said, hiccuping as she took another sip of her punch while examining Harper's arch nemesis. If there were ever a villain, Barbie, Harper said, noticing Renee sway a bit as she looked at the group. Harper wished she hadn't spiked Renee's punch so much. Baby Mama Renee was going to pass out before the reunion got started. Then Mateo would have to leave and bring her home, and Harper would remain the wallflower like always. High school was miserable, even 12 years later. Lila's not so bad, Mateo said. Harper's face twisted in disgust. Are you serious? She shot a glance at Lila's perfect nose and shook her head. That girl made high school a living nightmare. Mateo rolled his eyes. That's a bit dramatic. He shrugged. I always felt a bit sad for the twins. I played football with Andrew, and he was always cool. Harper almost choked on her drink. He's the worst! Renee pointed ahead. Who's that? Harper turned to where Renee pointed. If the scene had played out like one of Harper's daydreams, Dr. Joel Schaefer would make eye contact, and everyone else would would be shadow. And a spotlight would go on Harper. He'd instantly leave the group he was talking to in mid-conversation and walk straight over to her, unable to keep himself from seeing her. Oh, right. He's engaged now, Harper said. How could she have forgotten the engagement of the year? Everyone on the island who was anyone had been invited to the party, except her. Mateo had offered to bring her as his plus one, but she'd felt like a complete and total loser. She'd always be the nerdy book girl who didn't have a mom to teach her how to do pretty hair and makeup, who had a father lost in books and his writing and his heartbreak, who lived with an eccentric aunt who was mentally sick half her life. Mateo made a face. Didn't you hear? Harper shook her head. Hear what? Mateo! Andrew Whitmore said as he made his way from his twin sister Lila to Mateo. Renee turned to Harper as if to ask who it was. Harper let out a long, silent breath of disdain. That would be Andrew Whitmore, Martha Vineyard's golden boy. Andrew sauntered over to Mateo, holding out his hand and giving him a bro hug. To Harper's disappointment, Mateo greeted Andrew with the same enthusiasm and they immediately started talking about the glory days of playing football. Did you know your fiancé ran 50 yards without a hand on him? Andrew said with his hand on Mateo's shoulder. 
Renee's eyes lit up at her hero fiancé, and Harper groaned silently in her head. Andrew Whitmore was the worst. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth, Andrew Whitmore had been on top throughout the four years at the school. He thought his you-know-what didn't stink. Most of the time he had treated people like they were idiots, spouting out his opinion over everyone else's. His confidence had carried him throughout the years, and he took any title he felt was his. Football captain, homecoming king, and editor of the school paper, to name a few. Harper understood why. They'd have lost their jobs otherwise. Andrew was a Whitmore. His daddy practically owned the island. The absolute worst part about Andrew Whitmore was that he was also a writer. A journalist, to be exact. With his nepotism, he received a spot at the coveted Boston Globe, right out of his Ivy League school. Hey, Harper, he finally said after he finished another story of the good old days. I saw you published a book. Yep, she said, not looking directly at him, more like past him, beyond him. That's great, Andrew said. She glanced at her feet, suddenly feeling extremely underdressed in her flip-flops as Andrew stood in a fitted suit that did not look like it came off a rack. Everyone looked at her, waiting for her response from Andrew's comment. But she didn't have anything to say to him beyond something that would come across snarky. She published it last year, Mateo said, shooting her a look. But Harper said nothing. What did she have to say to Andrew Whitmore? Well then, Andrew stuffed his hands into his pockets. It's so great to see you again, really. The conversation turned back to football and Coach Joe. Harper stepped back, surveying the crowd. Looking around the room, she tried to remember her classes and place the faces and names together. She looked for some of her friends from the drama club or her art classes. None of the faces looked familiar. She looked back at Mateo as he chummed it up with Andrew and wondered why she remembered so much about the jerk from fifth period English, but not the names of the kids she spent most of her time with during her teenage years. The more she looked around, the more she realized she didn't know anyone. Hey, Renee grabbed hold of Harper's arm. I'm not feeling so well. Where's the bathroom? Harper groaned from the predictability. Renee could not handle her alcohol. She let Renee take hold of her arm as she walked her toward the women's restroom. Mateo instantly left his conversation with Andrew as the women began to leave, and swooped in between them. What's wrong? he asked. Should we go home? Renee dropped Harper and grabbed hold of Mateo, leaving Harper behind. I don't mind staying, she said, swaying a bit. You look like you should go home, Mateo said, his face wrinkling as Renee turned a different shade. No, I'll be fine. Renee's eyes widened as she grabbed hold of her mouth. She dashed off toward the restroom, with Matteo quickly following her. Harper stood behind, watching as they left the gym. Then to herself, she mumbled, How much punch did she have? Excuse me? Joel Schaefer asked, suddenly standing next to her. Harper jumped, not realizing anyone had been standing close enough to hear her speak to herself. Oh, nothing. I was talking to myself, she said, immediately blushing. Had she just talked to herself in front of Joel Schaefer? The hottest and coolest guy at Martha's Vineyard High? She couldn't formulate any more words, even as he stood there smiling at her. Joel Schaefer had been an upperclassman when she started high school. You're Harper Marin, right? Joel said squinting his eyes as if that would help him recognize her from a dozen years ago. Yes, she said, nodding, not sure if she should pretend not to know who he was, although everyone knew who he was. I remember you, he said, shaking his finger at her. Really? 
she wondered if he was trying to buy time to remember her name. She looked for Renee and Matteo, hoping they would reappear from the bathrooms, and quick. Even a dozen years later, Joel Schaefer had a way of making her swoon. The handsome doctor stood a perfect six-two, his chestnut-brown locks perfectly gelled into place, and his perfect pearls glowing as he smiled at her. You wrote a book, he continued with the finger thing. He came closer to her. Yes, she smiled, stepping a bit closer too. You run the med spa here on the island. She had heard of his success from practically everyone, one of the island's own bringing business and jobs for people on the island. Dr. Joel Schaefer had turned into a local hero with his charity work and big donations for the local community. Throughout school, she'd had a huge crush on the upperclassmen. But Harper couldn't remember a time when he hadn't been with Lila. You here with Lila? she asked. She looked at the group of women who had tortured her daily, still cackling, and probably still gossiping about the same people. When she looked back at him, his expression changed. Um, uh, we aren't together. Mortification burned her cheeks. I'm sorry, I hadn't heard. That's what Mateo was probably going to tell her. He made a face. Yes, well, when you're with your trainer... Harper's eyes widened, and her sight went directly to Lila, who laughed loudly from the crowd of women around her. I have a secret, Joel said, moving closer to her. So close, she could smell his aftershave and alcohol. I've always had a little bit of a crush on you. Harper lifted her hand to cover her mouth in surprise, and in doing so, bumped into Joel and spilled her drink all over his suit. Oh my God! she said, immediately looking for some sort of towel. Let me get something. He grabbed her hand and stopped her. No, it's fine. You barely got me. He wiped away the small drops of punch. Is that vodka? Um, she didn't know what to say. Mateo had warned her not to bring the vodka. Yes? Joel smirked, then leaned in closer to her his breath against her ear. You look amazing tonight, he whispered. She jerked at the compliment. Um, thank you. Joel pulled out his card. You should call me. She looked out at the crowd while Joel turned to walk away and noticed a pair of eyes. Andrew stared at her, almost glaring at her. Good to see you, Harper Marin. Joel said as he left. Harper turned toward the bathroom when she heard someone come up behind her. Andrew stood in front of her. Are you all right? Excuse me, she said. She narrowed her eyes and kept walking, shaking off whatever that was. Andrew spun around following her, his face screwed up. Did he come on to you? She stopped walking flabbergasted at the audacity one must have to ask another person that question. I think you should mind your own business, Harper shot back. He held up his hands in a sort of surrender. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Why don't you worry about yourself? Harper turned and walked off, faster this time. Thankfully, Andrew took the hint, because he didn't follow or create more of a scene. He'd probably tell Lila. Harper didn't want to stick around when that happened. She looked down at the card. Dr. Joel Schaefer. She stuck it into her purse as she left the gymnasium and found Mateo coming in from outside. Hey, I took Renee to the truck. We're headed home. Take me with you, she said, noticing Andrew and Lila standing next to each other. Sure you don't want to stay? Mateo asked. I could pick you up later if you need a ride. Harper's heart melted at the gesture. Thanks, Mateo, but I'm ready to go. He pulled back his neck, surprised. Really? I thought you wanted to stay all night. Her argument for spiking the drinks. I just want to leave, okay? 
She looked behind her again to see Andrew still standing there, still staring at her. Mateo looked around her. What's the deal with Andrew? He had noticed too? Then she looked back and saw him walking toward her again. He's just a jerk, she said. Come on, let's go. Mateo nodded and walked her out, grabbing the door before she reached it, like always. He opened the passenger's door for her. And like always, when Mateo dropped her off at her apartment, he made sure she got in safe. She waved from the window, watching as Mateo and Rene pulled away from the road below and disappeared. Meow. Joan, her overweight Maine Coon cat, cried out. Meow. Harper fell onto the couch as Joan patted her way to her spot on the top of the back. I know. I should have stayed home. Joan paced behind her head, rubbing her butt and tail against Harper's hair. Joan, I don't want your tush in my face. Harper picked Joan up and sat her in her lap, but not without a cry from Joan. Do you want me to give you love or not? She asked her geriatric cat, as though she would answer. Joan plopped onto her lap. See, that's what I thought. Harper began her routine of scratching Joan's ears, then neck, while moving down her back and belly as she stretched out. Why do you always have to be so difficult? She asked Joan. Harper rubbed the cat's head as she purred loudly. Her own head spun as she sat there. The night had been a complete bust from beginning to end. She had initially invited Gerard to be her plus one, but in typical Harper fashion, she broke up with him right before the big event. Then when Matteo and Renee found out about the breakup, they included her as their third wheel, like her life seemed to always be going these days. Between her dad and Evelyn, Gerard and his art, Matteo and Renee, and every guy and her mother. Harper always felt like a third wheel. She thought about Joel and immediately pulled out the card. She stared at his name. Dr. Joel Schaefer. The Joel Schaefer, who she had purposefully taken the long way to her fifth period class every day, just so she might catch a glimpse of in the hallways. Joel Schaefer, the doctor who owned his own practice. She put the card on her coffee table. He was still the cool boy she couldn't form a sentence in front of. The super talented football player. The guy every woman on this island would practically die to date. That Joel Schaefer wanted her to call him? There's no way I'm calling him, she said to Joan. I mean, he'll find out I'm a weirdo who talks to her cat. She picked up the card and shoved it into the coffee table's drawer, to be lost with all the other things Harper wanted to ignore, like bills and deadlines and... She stared at her computer. Then she pulled it across the coffee table and into her lap, not really knowing why. Each day she pulled that darn computer over, and each night the same routine, but nothing seemed to want to come out of her. Her first book had taken her nine years. Nine! Now, a year later... Her publisher wanted a third of the draft done in less than a month. Less than a month! She would never be able to write it. She didn't even know what she was going to write. She had babbled at dinner when she'd met her editor, or Evelyn's, her father's girlfriend's editor. Now she was stuck above a pizza place in a tiny apartment, trying not to eat gluten or think about her career crumbling, as the cursor blinked back at her. And worse, realizing for the one thousandth time, she'd passed up the best thing she'd ever had, Mateo. Chapter Two Biddy's favorite thing to do these days was sit on the porch swing at Seaview, looking out at the flora and fauna of Martha's Vineyard, listening as the waves washed ashore, and smelling the tangy, salty Atlantic air. But lately, even in the most beautiful spot, she couldn't stop thinking about Oklahoma. She had thought the longer she stayed on Martha's Vineyard, the less she'd think about her home state. But instead, 
She thought about her son and his family more every day. Was it because his calls became less frequent, or that she hadn't seen or heard her grandson over the phone in months, or that she still hadn't worked things out with her son and his wife? The blow-up after Richard's funeral had been ugly, and Biddy hadn't been proud of what she had said in the thick of it, but she had just lost the love of her life. What had her son expected? Biddy had thought the whole thing was over, but then she'd asked to stay with him until she could find a new place to live. Biddy recognized she may have put him in an awkward position, asking to stay with him, Darlene, and DJ, but never in a million years would she have thought her own son wouldn't let her, even for a night. Biddy! Evelyn called from her writing room. Yeah? Biddy turned on the porch swing and called back through the open window from the back porch. She could hear Evelyn saying something, but couldn't make out the words. She got up and walked through the French doors that led to what they called the gathering room, which had been Biddy's favorite room in Evelyn's beach house. The gathering room sat off the kitchen and dining room and faced the water with a full wall of windows and French doors. It was magnificent. There was no television, just a wood-burning fireplace, lots of seating, and window after window after window. Biddy might be thinking about Oklahoma, but she thanked her lucky stars every day that she got to live for free with Evelyn. The whole thing still boggled her mind. Who would have thought she would meet her closest and dearest family on a cruise to Martha's Vineyard with strangers? But there she was, walking through one of the most beautiful rooms she'd ever seen, surrounded by glass windows that looked out at the endless Atlantic Ocean. Have you talked to Wanda today? Evelyn asked, walking into the kitchen. Evelyn stood at the counter, looking at her phone. No, why? Biddy walked to the kitchen stools and leaned on one of the backs. She got all her stuff from Palm Springs, Evelyn said. Biddy thought about her own things in the storage unit back home. That's great. Evelyn nodded. She's a full resident. Biddy tapped the wood back with her freshly done nails. I guess I better figure out what's next for me. Evelyn cocked her head. Biddy, this is your home. Biddy sighed. I know, girl. Evelyn meant what she said. Never once had Evelyn made Biddy feel like a burden staying with her. Never once had Evelyn made her even feel like a guest. She just made her feel like part of the family. But the writing was on the wall. Biddy knew after today she'd have to start planning her next steps because Evelyn's boyfriend, Charlie, planned on proposing tonight. Of course, Charlie had it all planned out and had everyone involved. It would be perfect. And Biddy couldn't be happier for her friend. The whole thing was quite exciting. But the proposal created a definitive timetable to her situation. She had to get out of Seaview before the two tied the knot. And where would Biddy go? Her son and Darlene didn't want her around. Richard's family had kicked her out. She knew Evelyn and Charlie wouldn't kick her out or even ask her to leave. Evelyn would probably insist she stay but she couldn't possibly think about sticking around much longer. Biddy needed to pick herself up by the bootstraps, like her daddy used to say, and get on with it. Find a new place for her to go. She would love to find a place on Martha's Vineyard, but she couldn't afford anything on the island. Maybe she'd look for a place close by. Somewhere in Boston, maybe. Or maybe Maine. She had heard it was a gorgeous seacoast. She really did like living by the water. All her life she had been landlocked and never knew the healing power of water until she had seen the endless blue. It sang to her soul. It spoke to her spirit. Now she just needed to figure out how she could afford it. Where are you and Charlie having dinner tonight? Biddy asked, changing the conversation. She pretended as though she didn't have any idea about the plans Charlie had prepped for months. The wharf? Evelyn smiled. Biddy nodded. Isn't that where you two met all those years ago? Biddy knew the story. She also knew Charlie's plan for the proposal, 
which was to take Evelyn through a treasure hunt that had clues that walked her through their shared history together. It was so romantic that it was almost nauseating. I hope we don't stay late. Evelyn had no clue about what tonight would bring. That's because Charlie continuously made romantic gestures. Candlelit picnics on the beach, cozy fireplace weekends spent in Vermont, getaway trips to see the Red Sox or walk the halls of a museum. Evelyn deserved every second of being spoiled. Biddy didn't begrudge her friend just because she didn't have the same thing. She wasn't jealous or even disappointed it hadn't worked that way for her. She had loved Richard with all her heart and soul. And he her. She had been lucky to have those years with him. And she didn't feel sorry for herself that it hadn't lasted forever. She was grateful for the time she'd had. She only wished she could stay on the island. You could stay in the cottage, Evelyn said. Like always, Evelyn read Biddy's mind. Biddy shook her head. Girl, you have a sixth sense. Stay, Evelyn insisted. I need to do something for myself. I'm afraid I just don't know what. Biddy's only skill was taking care of people, which as a nurse had been a great career. But now everyone seemed to be doing just fine without her. Wanda got married and moved in with Marty. Renee and Mateo would be getting married within a few weeks, which meant she and George would be moving out. And now there was Evelyn and Charlie's engagement. That left Biddy alone. She had been fine with alone. Most of her adult life she had been alone. Her first husband had left her months after they'd eloped, her second had turned out to be bad news, and she'd taken Drake and left him. She had met Richard in her forties, just as Drake had turned sixteen. A heart attack had brought him to the hospital, and she had been his night nurse. She had immediately liked the good-hearted patient, and soon started talking more and more throughout her shifts. The first thing she'd liked about Richard was his humor. He'd been funny, always making her laugh out loud. He also had one of the biggest hearts she had ever encountered, even when others weren't kind toward him, like his ex-wife and kids. She could apply for a nurse's position, most likely without too much hassle. Her license had been kept up to date. Hospitals were always looking for traveling nurses to cover maternity or medical leaves for staff. She wouldn't have any trouble, even at her age of 63. But she was 63. She didn't want to work like that any longer. Working 12-hour shifts on her feet all day, usually dealing with one crisis after another, had been hard, even on her 20-year-old body. She might earn enough to afford a small rental on the island when she wasn't traveling. Maybe she could invest what she did have in a space she could rent out when she traveled. But God, could she do that kind of work still? Now that Marty's retired and taken time with Wanda, I've thought about going back to work, Biddy said casually. There's even a nursing home looking for staff. She shrugged, but she could tell this news surprised Evelyn. You want to go back to nursing? Evelyn asked. She nodded but shrugged again. I don't know. Maybe not travel far. There are plenty of hospitals in Boston. Evelyn sighed loudly. That seems like really hard work. Biddy almost confessed, but stopped just in time. Today wasn't about her. Biddy didn't want her friend to have anything to worry about before this huge moment in her life. No, I miss it. Biddy said it more enthusiastically than she had meant to, but it seemed to work because Evelyn smiled, which made her keep going. It had been such a rewarding career. And besides, Wanda has the best care one could have with Marty by her side. I feel as though this is a perfect time to offer my help. You are incredible, you know that? Evelyn said, looking at Biddy admiringly. I just love how you always keep living life to the fullest. Biddy lifted her eyebrows. I just try to get through each day. 
Evelyn sipped her coffee in her little love bubble, totally believing Biddy's story. She should, since Biddy had been sprinkling her hints since Charlie had revealed his plans to propose. There would be no excuse for Evelyn to not say yes. In fact, Biddy said, ready to make it even easier for Evelyn to say yes. I found something that I'm interested in. She had found something. Interested wasn't exactly how she would explain it, but Evelyn didn't need to worry about her any longer. Biddy knew how to take care of herself. She had all her life. Chapter 3 Evelyn had been starving all day. Between running around with errands for Renee's wedding, watching George so Renee could do a few things in the afternoon, and stopping at Wanda's with a few frozen casseroles they had all put together, she hadn't eaten. When she finally got back home, the plate of chocolate croissants Renee had brought home from the bakery sat in a glass cake stand in the middle of the kitchen island. Evelyn plucked off the glass cover and removed the top pastry. What are you doing? Samantha scolded from the doorway as she came inside from the back patio. Evelyn jumped, not expecting to see her. You should give a warning before coming up on someone. Evelyn looked down at the chocolate croissant in her hand. I'm hungry. But Charlie's going to be here in like an hour. Samantha lunged at her and swiped the pastry out of Evelyn's hand. Evelyn blinked a few times at her daughter's over-the-top reaction to an afternoon snack. You'll ruin your appetite. Samantha said it as though she knew she'd have to explain. But then she started rambling. I mean, aren't you guys going out to eat? Shouldn't you be getting ready now? He's picking you up in less than an hour. Is that what you're wearing? Evelyn looked down at her coral red linen dress, which she had picked up in the city with the girls. She thought she looked fantastic in it. You have a problem with my dress? Evelyn asked. No, it's just that it's so casual, Samantha said. You should wear something fancier. Fancier? Evelyn looked around the bottom floor of the house for Biddy. I think I look just fine. Seriously, Mom, go change. Samantha gently pushed Evelyn back toward the front hall. Samantha, what's going on with you? A line creased between Samantha's eyebrows. Nothing. Why do you ask? Evelyn couldn't figure out what her daughter was up to, but something was going on. First, she had come home from school for her birthday, which seemed nice, but she hardly spent any time with her. Every time Evelyn turned around, Renee and Samantha were kibitzing and would quiet down as soon as she walked by. What did Charlie have up his sleeve for her birthday? Evelyn couldn't believe she was celebrating another birthday in Martha's Vineyard. Last year, everyone had thrown a surprise party for her. Today, Charlie had made plans for just the two of them. She couldn't tell how involved the girls were, just enough to tell her to go and change. I should probably grab a sweater, Evelyn said, not listening to her daughter, who dressed like a Kardashian. At 57, Evelyn did not want to dress like a Kardashian. When Charlie arrived, Evelyn rushed out of the house, tired of Samantha fussing over her, and got right into the car as Charlie was about to get out. He held a bouquet in his hands. Oh, those are beautiful, Evelyn said from inside. Charlie looked back into the car, his face wrinkled in confusion. She didn't usually meet him in the driveway, allowing Charlie to come inside and talk with the girls. I had to escape before Samantha drove me crazy, Evelyn said, folding her sweater in her lap. What do you have her involved in? Charlie smiled and leaned into the car. Let me put these in a vase and I'll be right back. Evelyn relaxed into the passenger seat as Charlie skipped up the steps to the house. She looked out the window at her house, a dream house she had named Seaview. Every room in the house had a view of the Atlantic or the valley's hills of seagrass. She had earned all of it on her own, her books, then her television show. Her career had been more successful the older she got. 
which had been the biggest blessing of all, especially after George, her husband, had died at fifty. Most careers fizzled out at her age. People pushed into retirement, or worse, put to pasture, as she had once heard an editor refer to an older writer. Luckily, Evelyn Rose, the writer, had bestseller after bestseller. At this point in her career, she knew it was a team effort. She had some of the best editors in the business, and an agent willing to throw her body in front of a moving train, if that's what she had to do to sell her story. She had the writer's group with Charlie by her side. She even had Harper, who she enjoyed running dialogue by. Things couldn't get any better. So why did her stomach twist, as Charlie came out of the house a bit more dressed up than usual? Had he shaved? You look very debonair, she said as he got into the truck. You look gorgeous. He smiled at her as he leaned over the console and kissed her softly on the lips. Happy birthday, Evelyn. She cupped his chin with her palm, feeling its roughness. Did I tell you how lucky I feel right now? He shook his head. You haven't, no. Well, I sure feel lucky tonight. She rested her elbows on the middle armrest as he kissed her again. You feeling really lucky? Charlie asked. She grinned, slanting her eyes at him. He reached behind her in the back seat and pulled out a present. Evelyn eyed him, then pulled off the tape from the bottom fold, opening the wrapping paper. Inside, she could feel the leather journal before she saw it. Charlie had a talent at binding books together. The hardcover journal had been wrapped in a decorative leather. Slowly, she opened the cover. Inside, across both pages, was a hand-painted watercolor map. Is this Cliffside Point? She could see Greyhead and Prayer Cove, even a bird's-eye view of Seaview against Sugar Beach. She traced the black ink lettering and outlines. It's gorgeous. Charlie turned the page. The next page had a title, also in a handwritten script with twirls and swirls that said, A Treasure Map. You did it! Evelyn flipped to the next page, her heart pitter-pattering in her chest. Charlie had finished the treasure map. She noticed the dedication. Happy birthday, Evelyn. That's when she realized it wasn't the treasure map he had been working on for years from his aunt's journals. This was an entirely different map. She turned the page and read the title out loud. First Clue Start at where it all began when time stood still on land. She flipped the page of the map, checking the landmarks Charlie had placed on it. The wharf, she said excitedly, guessing the first clue. Charlie smiled. Let's get going. He turned the engine, and Evelyn couldn't help but giggle like a teenager. She loved every little thing Charlie did. But it was his big moments his celebratory moments that she loved the most. Charlie read the map, staying serious the whole time, as though the clues were an actual treasure hunt. I guess we should head to the wharf. Charlie held Evelyn's hand the whole way into town, which, she had to say, felt good. She hadn't been much a handholder with George, but now as she got older, simple touches like holding hands, a rub on the back, or just sitting close enough to feel the other, felt good. She had missed human touch for so long. She wanted as much as she could get. Let's order a drink while we're looking at clues, Charlie suggested. Evelyn took hold of his arm and squeezed it. Who would have thought, thirty-some-odd years later, they would be walking into the wharf arm in arm together again, together after all those years separated and in love? They walked straight to where they usually grabbed a seat at the bar and where Victor, the bartender, would place their usual drinks. But instead, Victor set down a package in front of her. Look what I found. Victor pushed the package in front of the two of them, but he looked to Charlie, who gave a wink back at him. Evelyn clapped excitedly and opened the package. 
She held up a gorgeous gold necklace with a gold charm of a pirate hook. She cradled it in her palm and sneaked a glance at Charlie, who smiled down at her. Charlie's grin grew. Ready for the next clue? Yes. She flipped to the next page of the notebook and read out loud. All good treasure hunts have pirates and danger. Like the sun rising in the east, these pirates use yeast. Let's head to the bakery, Evelyn said, scooting off the stool from the bar. Evelyn downed her dirty martini, swept her sweater into her hands, and waved to Victor. Have a great night, she said, taking off through the restaurant and to the front door. Wait up, Evelyn, Charlie said behind her, throwing down money. She stopped for a second to wait for him, but her excitement took over, and as soon as he came a bit closer, she took off again. She scooted across the street as soon as there were no cars and practically ran through the doors of books and bread. Usually at this time of night, the store her daughter and Charlie owned would be closed, but the place was lit up. Evelyn's hands clasped her mouth in surprise. Glowing candles flickered throughout the space placed on every table. Behind the counter stood Renee, Samantha, and Harper, who held George in a pirate costume. Evelyn immediately laughed at the eye patch that had been drawn on his face. Nana, George said, reaching out his hands. Did you get everyone involved? Evelyn asked, as George held a framed photograph. It had been the last photo they had taken with everyone at Wanda's wedding. She opened the journal again to the next page and read the clues with the poem on the back of the photograph. Grayhead, she yelled out, hugging George and kissing her daughters and Harper on the cheeks and taking off again to Charlie's truck. Evelyn, wait up, Charlie called after her. But Evelyn couldn't wait up. She couldn't wait one single second. She had to see what Charlie had planned next. Chapter Four Harper didn't rush out of the store when everyone else left for the next part of her father's proposal. Instead, she hung back, closing up the store for Renee, who had to rush and feed George. She didn't mind being the one off on the side, watching from the background. Watching Renee and Matteo, Samantha and her boyfriend, and now her dad and Evelyn. She couldn't help but question her own decisions. What was she doing with her life? Sure, she didn't need a relationship. She didn't need a man to fulfill her. It would just be nice to have someone to share moments with. Someone she could experience joys and thrills and happiness with, but also complain about the lows and share some of the pain that comes with life. Harper had never been one to have a best friend. Most girls didn't get her, and most guys just wanted to date her. Mateo had been entirely different. And like always, Harper had dumped him before he dumped her. Because someone like him would figure her out soon enough. She wasn't this cool girl, but a messy woman who didn't have a clue what it took to be successful at life. Someone like Mateo deserved to be with someone like Renee, who had it all together. Harper's mother hadn't even stuck around. Now Charlie didn't have to deal with Harper's manic behaviors. He could hardly handle all her highs and her lows. Lately, though, she could barely hide her lows. After she locked up the back door, she turned to head to her car when Lila Whitmore stood in front of her. Oh! Harper jumped. Holy jeez, Lila! What are you doing here? Did Joel hit on you last night? Lila asked, her hands clinging to the leather strap of her purse. Harper froze. She didn't usually have a hard time telling the truth, but she reverberated back to high school, and Lila, who had enjoyed ruining girls' reputations, frightened her. Lila let go of the straps and huffed. Look, I just need to know if it's like... She paused. If it's more than him hitting on you. Harper could not believe the nerve of this woman. Like I told your brother, you really should mind your own... Harper stopped talking when Lila's bottom lip trembled and then stiffened, her jaw tightening as her eyes welled up with tears. 
Oh, God, Harper thought to herself. What should she do? Should she call Joel and tell him about the confrontation? Would that be too presumptuous of her, to think he was hitting on her? Maybe he wanted to do a consultation for Botox. Maybe the fine lines around her eyes were more noticeable than she realized. A rumor like this could ruin his practice's reputation. Lila's face puckered like she had tasted something sour. A rumor? Harper couldn't believe this woman. Didn't Lila have enough to worry about without concerning herself with her ex-fiancé? Lila's holier-than-thou behavior, filled with a privilege very few in this world ever experienced, grinded against Harper. Lila came from a long line of high-profile public figures. This certainly wasn't her first scandal. And from this scene, Harper believed it wouldn't be her last. Then Lila said, He obviously had too much to drink. Harper stood there, frozen, trying to digest what had just happened. She didn't even respond. Lila Whitmore hadn't changed a bit from the mean girl from high school. I should go. Harper walked past Lila and straight to her car without looking back. Her hands trembled as she turned the keys in the ignition and pulled out, trying not to hit the teary Lila. The whole drive, Harper went through what she should have said. She should have said something like, Your trainer probably ruined any kind of reputation you have. But like she expected by the time she arrived at Seaview, everything was under control. Renee had taken charge of basically the whole event. Samantha had filled in where she was needed, and the guys seemed to know what Charlie wanted from them. No one had asked Harper to do a thing for the night, except show up. Do you need any help carrying anything out to the tent? Harper asked as Renee and Biddy rushed around in the kitchen. Wanda waved Harper over to the other side of the counter. I find it best to stay on this side and out of the way of those two. Harper smiled, but her face reddened, slightly embarrassed that she had been directed out of the kitchen like a child. She drifted off to her usual corner, out of the way like always. Harper the Wallflower. When the car pulled up, Renee called out to the room, They're here! And just like they had planned, Christmas lights lit a path all the way to the ocean, the last spot where they would end up together forever. God, her father was romantic. A Nicholas Sparks kind of romantic. No wonder she couldn't find someone. No one could live up to her father. Not even Matteo lived up to Charlie. From inside, everyone could see Charlie, finally, after going through town all night chasing a buried treasure, drop to one knee. Evelyn pulled him up into a kiss, and all the lights came on in the house. People started cheering and yelling and emptying into the backyard, where Charlie and Evelyn stood. I said yes, Evelyn called out, holding up her hand with a yellow canary diamond. Where had her father gotten that kind of money? Harper looked around at all the happy couples celebrating adding another couple to the mix. Wanda and Marty clapped as they stood together. Hank held up his champagne flute and said, Cheer! Cheer! Renee and Matteo and George all hugged Charlie and Evelyn. Samantha and Chase stole kisses off on the side. Biddy, who was the only other single, seemed perfectly content seeing her best friend find true happiness. The longer Harper studied each of the couples as the party went on, the more she realized she wasn't going to be one of those couples. Her parents' marriage had been a disaster the second it had begun. Her mother had taken off when she was a young girl, always going in and out of relationships. Nothing had ever stuck. Charlie never dated anyone after that taking care of her great aunt instead. Then poof, one day Evelyn had shown up and everything was perfect. And now they were engaged. Congratulations, called out the crowd as they walked around drinking champagne, celebrating with their friends. Harper moved around the room, wishing she could talk to Mateo about her run-in with Lila, but not wanting to talk about it in front of Renee. 
she wouldn't understand what Lila had been like in the past. Knowing Renee, she'd probably feel bad for her. Harper excused herself to the bathroom. When she finished, she heard Renee gathering the group in the backyard. Everyone needs to get in, Renee called out. Sam, Mateo, Chase. Renee moved everyone around the happy couple who were standing in the middle. She moved Biddy to the back, Wanda and Marty to the side, Chase and Samantha, and all the others. Say cheese, the photographer called out. The crowd all said cheese back. No one noticed Harper wasn't even in the picture. The rest of the night, Harper remained in the shadows, watching from her perch in the kitchen, waiting for the crowd to dissipate so she could come up with an excuse to leave. Just as she was about to go up to her dad and say goodnight, Mateo came into the kitchen. Why don't I get a picture of just family? The photographer said. Come on, you missed the first one, Mateo said. Everyone except Mateo, apparently. I'm good, Harper said. I saw you watch everyone from behind, he said, still friendly but distant. I was walking out from the bathroom, she defended herself. You could have said something, but you stopped, Mateo said and watched everyone. Why didn't you say something to get me in? She said. He could have easily spoken up. Because you look like you wanted to stay behind, Mateo said, looking at her with those deep brown eyes. He stood off, giving distance between the two of them. A year ago, Mateo would be wrapping her in a bear hug, saying, Come on, Marin, don't let this bother you. But now... Mateo saw through her games. I just feel left out, she said, shrugging. I feel like I don't belong in that picture. Mateo frowned. They want you in that picture. He crossed his arms over his chest. The question you should ask yourself is, why don't you feel comfortable in that picture? She rolled her eyes at the therapist session. Geez, Mateo, when did you turn into Dr. Phil? What's going on, Harper? She could feel a lump growing in her throat. Nothing. Just Gerard stuff. Harper, you know you can still talk to me, Mateo said, not realizing her tears had nothing to do with talking, but everything to do with regret. When she told him she wasn't interested in getting involved with him, she had been lying to herself. She hadn't just swooned at his kiss. She had fallen hard. And she couldn't have risked being with a guy as perfect as Mateo. His crime? He had been too nice. He'd stick around even though she would drive him miserable, just like Tanya had with her dad. Sure, her father had found happiness, but after almost 30 years of misery, the risks involved in happiness seemed too great. Harper would rather grab a book or her pen and escape into another world. Yet, even imaginary worlds didn't seem to come so easily these days. What was going on with Harper? Chapter 5 Harper sat at her kitchen table and sipped her coffee, staring at her blinking cursor. Joan, who lay in a patch of sun streaming through the window, groomed herself at the same rhythm as the clicking second hand on the clock. Harper held her head in her hands as she stared at her computer screen, not sure how to start. What did her main character want? She wanted acceptance, to be part of her community. She wanted to love freely and openly. Oh, how did that make her different? Wasn't that what everyone wanted? How was Harper going to write about her character rising above and finding herself through her struggles when Harper hadn't even done that herself? She wanted acceptance. She wanted community. She wanted to be in love. Fat chance now. She would never leave the island, even though she wasn't sure why she stayed. Oh, God. 
she was going to end up like her Aunt Martha, but without a store or a nephew. She pushed her chair back, slammed her computer shut, and swiped her coffee off the table. She looked out the window of the back door, at the same view she'd been looking at for four years. Nothing had changed. She was stuck on a never-ending hamster wheel. Three chapters. She was supposed to have three chapters done, which meant at least 40 pages of something, and she had 40 pages of absolutely nothing. Nothing. She was going to ruin everything if she couldn't get the words down. Anything at this point, even if it was garbage, would be better than nothing. Nothing. She was in so deep. She had to confess to Evelyn. She had to explain. But how could she? Evelyn had given her this shot, believed in her, helped her each time Harper needed it. She had been the best mentor ever. How could Harper let her down? That Harper had writer's block, which Evelyn didn't believe in, which Evelyn never seemed to go through. Harper would have to call her editor, the same editor that Evelyn got her. Catherine Emerson didn't work with just anyone. She only worked with the best, like Evelyn. Now Harper would have to call her and tell her she didn't have the chapters. Again. From the back door window in her apartment, she could see the roof lines of the small seaside village of Eastport. She could even make out a sliver of water if she stood on her tippy toes just right. She could see her father's place, which seemed too close if someone were to ask. But she didn't have many choices for a rental that she could afford. At first, living above a pizza place seemed like the perfect solution until she found another place to live. But the more Harper told people of her temporary situation, the more permanent it became. Now, four years later, she was no closer to leaving this place than she was when she had moved in. I should get going, she said to Joan. Joan didn't even look up from licking her paw. Harper glanced at the calendar hanging on the wall. She had a few more days. That was it. The other day, Evelyn asked how things were going and suggested Harper send what she had written. Catherine always gets to things right away. Thankfully, the autumn had dispersed the writer's group for the last couple of meetings. Between weddings and showers and engagements, everyone had been busy, which meant Harper hadn't needed to come up with some excuse as to why she wasn't sharing her writing with everyone. How would she explain herself without looking like a complete jerk? She had been lying for weeks to her soon-to-be stepmother. Harper grabbed her purse and her phone and opened the door before taking off to go down the steps. She was stopped by her landlord, Mr. Milano, wearing his pizza jacket. Just the girl I came to see, Mr. Milano said, smiling, but he shifted as he stood in the stairwell. Hey, Mr. Milano. Harper said, in her cheeriest of voices, as if she wasn't contemplating the last few years of her life. What's up? She wondered why everyone seemed to be sneaking up on her when she tried leaving a place. The middle-aged man had been in business as long as she could remember. Now his sons were getting older and starting to work in the pizza place, too. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a month's notice. Mr. Milano handed over an envelope. This is your deposit. Since I'm breaking your contract, I won't charge you for this month. She stood there, dumbfounded. You can't kick me out, Mr. Milano. We signed a lease just last month. Yes, and I'm willing to pay for my broken agreement. Mr. Milano looked troubled, but he certainly wasn't backing down. Why? She had been a great tenant. She never had noise coming from her apartment. She had been clean. She took out her garbage. She parked where she was supposed to. She never complained and even fixed her own issues if she could handle them. You've been a great tenant. It's just Sonny's ready to move out of the house with his girlfriend, Mr. Milano said of his son. He'd like to get married soon. 
Sonny, the kid she used to babysit, was getting married soon? Before Harper? That's great! She plastered a smile on her face, lifting her eyebrows up her forehead. Wow! So you understand why I need the apartment, Mr. Milano said, smiling back at her. Yeah, but in a month? I'm sorry, Harper. But you know, he's my son. Mr. Milano did look sorry, but he was right. Sonny was his son. Charlie would do the same thing in his situation. Okay, Mr. Milano, Harper said. I'll start looking for a new place. It would be winter soon. Maybe she would find someone who'd rent for the cold months. But what then? People her age, like Sonny's age, were getting married, settling down. Mateo had created a business and bought a house by her age. Her father had been married with a child. All she had was a novel that had debuted horribly. Mr. Milano sighed. I can maybe give you two, at the most. Harper's heart dropped, thinking of Joan. Would she find a place that would allow pets? Not those big, fancy summer homes. Her father's dog, Stan, hated Joan. Not that Joan liked him, either. Harper was pretty sure Joan hated everyone. Harper had even questioned her own relationship with Joan and had been known to sleep with one eye open. Mr. Milano left without another word, skipping down the steps and out the door. Harper stood frozen, two steps away from what would no longer be her home in less than two months, if she even had that. She thought about her plans to center herself at the beach and grab a bite to eat at Books and Bread, but should she be spending money if she had no place to live? Oh, God, she had no place to live. She decided to head to Evelyn's. Someone in that house would know what she should do. But when she arrived, no one was there. Hello? She said as she walked through the porch door after using the pin pad to get in. When Harper had been a little girl, she had prayed every night for a fairy godmother, a woman to fall in love with her father and become the mother who wanted a daughter just like Harper. Never in a million years had she thought it would have come true. But then Evelyn came walking into the bookstore. Evelyn was a wonderful mother and a true friend, a woman with a successful writing career and a gorgeous house nestled along the coast, and she was head over heels in love with a great guy, Harper's dad. Harper should feel as though her dreams were coming true, and in many ways she did, but something deep inside kept saying, that's just stuff made up in books. Things like that don't happen to people like you. Everyone leaves people like you. Just look at your mother. Harper moved through the house and back outside onto the front porch, feeling silly being at the house without anyone else there. Harper didn't have errands she needed to run for Evelyn. Evelyn hadn't even said if she'd need help this week. There was no reason Harper should be there. Then a movement from the road made her look up. Was that Biddy riding a bicycle? Wearing a bright pink helmet and a matching spandex outfit, Biddy rode expertly onto the gravel driveway, not missing a beat as she transitioned from pavement to broken seashells. Harper couldn't contain her shock. Biddy, look at you! Have you ridden the cliffside trails? Biddy asked as she came to a stop and got off. Harper shook her head. No. Biddy's mouth dropped. You grew up on Martha's Vineyard and didn't learn to ride that trail? Harper shrugged. I didn't really ride bikes as a kid. Biddy shook her head. Darling, that's not an excuse. This is one of the most beautiful places to ride a bicycle. Get a bike, girl. Harper thought about it. But it's almost winter. The trees were already turning colors. It would only be a matter of time before old man Winter would be biting at all her extremities. Borrow mine, 
Biddy removed her helmet and handed it over to Harper. Biddy's silver hair shined under the sun. Go for a ride. No, I mean, I can't. She pushed back. I don't know how. You're kidding. Biddy's mouth dropped open again. I grew up in Los Angeles until I was seven. When I moved here, I lived above the bookstore. And there really weren't many places to ride without having my dad drive me somewhere. She felt very judged suddenly, and she didn't like it. Well, I guess I know what we're doing today, Biddy said. What? Learning how to ride a bike. Biddy hooked her arms onto her hips. The six-foot natural blonde must have been a bombshell in her twenties, like a Dolly Parton or a Lonnie Anderson, or the blonde in the Dukes of Hazard. Harper had heard Richard, Biddy's husband, had adored her, but his family didn't like her. I will fall and die. That's a bit much. Biddy patted Harper on the shoulder. You might get seriously injured, but the chances of that are very slim. An adult learning to ride a bike, and you say slim chances of getting hurt? Harper felt her current height and weight would land her in the emergency room if she were to fall. I've always wanted to try surfing, though. You haven't surfed? Biddy appeared amazed by this. Did you go and play at the beach? Harper hadn't, but she decided not to admit that tidbit. Biddy seemed to take offense that Harper hadn't taken advantage of the island. But she liked to read. She liked to write. She daydreamed most of every day. She hung out at the bookstore with her dad. Oh, dear Lord, Harper said, suddenly channeling Biddy's southern twang. I am my great Aunt Martha. Who? Biddy asked. My great aunt, Harper said. Yes, we established that. But who is this great Aunt Martha? Biddy asked as she put the kickstand down and rested the bike. She owned the bookstore and lived above it with her cats. Until we moved in. Harper had always joked about ending up like her. But if she moved back to the apartment as her father moved out to live with Evelyn, she'd be exactly like her aunt. Living above the store with her cat. All alone. Harper's breath started gaining momentum. Big, heavy breaths. I'm going to end up like her. Biddy's smile slowly went away as Harper shook out her hands, her heart speeding inside her chest. You okay? Biddy's face now had a look of concern on it. No, Harper cried out. I'm not. I've just been evicted from my apartment, and I can't go back to my dad's place. I will seriously end up just like my Aunt Martha. And I couldn't stand living with her. She was an absolutely miserable person at the end. And you know what? Harper said, and Biddy shook her head, letting Harper rant away. Everyone would tell me what a happy person she had been, and how wonderful and nice she had been before. But I only knew the sick Martha the one who had lost her mind because she never left her house and lived in books all day and night. Harper clutched her throat. I'm going to die in a recliner. You are not going to die in a recliner. Biddy said the words one by one, accentuating them all. Let's go ride bikes. Come on. It'll be fun. What else do you have to do except sit and worry about the future? Biddy gestured toward the bike. I'm going to fall, Harper said, not moving. Harper looked at the silver bike with the wicker basket attached to the front. The seat was exceptionally cushioned. You'll never forget this moment, Biddy said. Did your Aunt Martha ride a bike? Harper looked at her. She didn't even want to remember this moment. She could feel cracks starting to open, thoughts spinning wildly, and her losing control of everything. Where would she live? How long could she put off her editor? When would she have to tell Evelyn she was a fraud? Harper? 
Biddy leaned closer to Harper, who began to hyperventilate. In and out, her chest tightened as she tried to take a breath. It wouldn't open, no matter how hard she tried. Her chest felt like a vice was squeezing it shut. Come over here and take a seat. Biddy led her to the front porch and helped her sit on the steps. Now, cup your hands in front of your mouth and breathe through, counting to fifteen. One. Harper tried inhaling, but couldn't slow it down. Two. Use your diaphragm, Biddy instructed, her voice calming and slow. Three. Tears stung the back of Harper's eyes. Four. Now that's it. Biddy rubbed Harper's back in gentle circles. Five. Six. Harper could feel her breath slowing as Biddy massaged a little deeper. Seven. Now try breathing through your nose, Biddy said. Eight. Harper nodded, inhaling through her nostrils, her chest suddenly filling with air. Then she breathed out through her mouth. Nine, Biddy said. Ten. Harper took in another long inhale, closing her eyes and blinking back the moisture. She'd keep it together as long as she could. Eleven. You want to talk about it? Biddy asked. Twelve. Thirteen. Harper shook her head. I'm thinking I should ride that bike. Fourteen. Biddy ran over to the helmet and grabbed it before handing it off to Harper. Let's start in the grass. Fifteen. Harper took the helmet, getting up from the step, thankful for Biddy, and deciding to make some memories. Chapter Six It turned out teaching an almost 30-year-old woman how to ride a bike was a lot harder than Biddy had anticipated. Now we need to get a drink, Biddy said, exhausted. Harper shook her head. I should go home. To an empty apartment, Biddy said. Come on, live a little. I'd give anything to have that face and figure and be in my 20s again. Plus, there's a band playing at Mooncussers tonight. I can pretend to be a long-lost rich aunt. Harper laughed, and finally, after a little more convincing, she agreed to go with Biddy. Both cleaned up a bit and headed out in Harper's station wagon. I've never been to Mooncussers before, Harper said as they walked in. It always has live bands on Sundays, Biddy said. I love to listen to the music. A man in a Hawaiian shirt played the acoustic guitar and nodded as Biddy walked in. Harper looked around the empty dining section and realized Biddy and her were the only people at the bar. Where's the crowd? Harper whispered as they sat down on a set of stools. Biddy held up her hand. I'll take my usual, and... Harper didn't know what to order. Usually she had what the other person was having. I'll take whatever she's having. All right. Biddy slapped Harper on the knee. I like tequila. Two margaritas were placed in front of them, and Biddy held up her glass. To the unknown, Harper winced. To the unknown. You want to talk about your living situation? Biddy asked. Holding the drink in her hand, she crossed her leg over her knee. Even in her sixties, Biddy knew her legs were still fabulous, and that Tommy, the man singing up front, kept an eye on her. Harper looked at Tommy and then to Biddy. Are you two a thing? Sometimes, Biddy answered honestly. Harper's eyes widened. Really? Yes, Biddy answered curtly. I'm an adult. I can date who I like. Sorry, I didn't mean it was a bad thing, Harper said. Are you not looking for something serious like my dad and Evelyn? Biddy adored Harper. 
But times like this reminded her of how young Harper was, how much life she still hadn't experienced. It wasn't fair for Biddy to judge Harper on her lack of experience, but sometimes her ignorance came off rude. She had no idea what finding the love of your life meant, what it felt like having a child, what divorce felt like having a husband leave you. To finally find the one, only to lose him to cancer. To have a family that seemed so close and inclusive, only to turn against each other when it came down to the money. Biddy didn't like the idea of Richard's family kicking her out of the home she had shared with her husband. But she didn't want anything to do with all of that. So, she enjoyed spending time with some men here and there. Tommy had been a fun time, and a gentleman, which turned out to be hard to come by at her age. Most men just wanted sex and nothing else. Worse than when she was in her twenties. Now they think she's desperate. Well. She's not that desperate. No, Tommy had been a decent guy, never suggesting more than a kiss at the end of the night. He'd taken her out to eat a few times, a movie, even took her to the local playhouse to see the musical Oklahoma. But if she was looking for forever, Tommy wouldn't cut it. Only one man did that, and he was dead. He is sweet but I'm not looking for any of that kind of romance. Biddy picked up her drink and tapped her foot to the beat. Tommy did have a sexy voice for someone their age, even a full head of hair, which was a big plus for Biddy. What about you? What's your Mr. Wright? That's hard, Harper said. I don't know what I really want or what I'm even looking for. Sometimes I think I do. But then other times, I'm so far off. Girl, don't I know it. Biddy took another sip of her margarita, finally feeling like the real Ms. Harper was starting to come out, and she liked it. I always chose the wrong kind of man until I met Richard. Bad men I had no business being with. Like criminals? Harper asked. Biddy clicked her tongue. They got into their share of trouble, but not necessarily criminals. Like a James Dean? Harper asked, thinking those types were romantic. Just stupid. Biddy left out the jealousy and aggression. The nights they'd swung and missed, the nights they didn't. She had left her second husband before he could kill her, which she was certain he would have done if she had stayed in that relationship. My problem is, I like a man who likes to have deep and meaningful conversations. And those types of men always like to hear themselves talk. I don't really like people who can't go deep. Harper picked up her margarita. At my reunion, I realized people who are surface always stay on the surface. They have no feelings whatsoever. They're so narcissistic that all they care about is themselves. Hmm. Biddy twirled the stem of her glass between her index finger and thumb, glancing back at Tommy, whose eyes still focused on her. Sounds like you had a good time then. Biddy playfully hit Harper on the knee. Harper made a face. Sorry, I'm not much fun tonight. You're fine, Biddy said, but she wasn't convinced. Has the apartment been what's bothering you lately? She might be overstepping her friendship with this young lady, but Harper hadn't been her same happy-go-lucky self as before the loss of the apartment. Biddy had a feeling her lack of book sales was really upsetting her, too. I can't seem to write the story I'm supposed to, Harper said, looking into her drink. Tommy sang a sad song about beaches and weather and love. What are you supposed to write? There are certain tropes I have to cover, and if I don't, then the reader is going to get mad. And I already broke some rules with my first book. Harper rested her elbows on the bar. What's the trope you can't write? Love. Biddy almost thought Harper had been joking, 
and luckily she didn't laugh like she wanted to. She held back, then asked, Are you saying you've never been in love? Harper shook her head. I mean, I love my family and friends, but I've never been in love-love. At least I don't think so. You'd know, Biddy said matter-of-factly. Like an earthquake shaking the Earth's core, Harper would know if she'd been hit by Cupid's arrow. Biddy turned toward Tommy, listening as he sang the chorus of the song. He had told her he wrote most of the music he performed, but she recognized this song to be by another artist. She swayed back and forth as a few more groups of people came into the bar. It wasn't a crowd for a 30-year-old single woman, but it was definitely a night for some bonding and to forget about the day's troubles. We'll take two more, Biddy called out to the bartender before the servers took the newcomer's orders. Harper held up her hand. I can't. Why? Biddy asked back. Harper blinked a few times before answering. I have no idea. Two, Biddy held up her two fingers. By the end of Tommy's set, the women had had three margaritas, and Biddy had even convinced Harper to dance with her once another group of women had gathered on the dance floor. The two women had danced and laughed, and Biddy had to admit she enjoyed herself. Is this your sister? Tommy asked Biddy once his set had finished. Biddy couldn't help but roll her eyes. More like granddaughter. Tommy winked at her, undeterred. He held out his hand to Harper. Tommy Taylor, nice to meet you. Harper Marin, she said, taking his hand and shaking it. You play great. Harper had come alive after a few drinks. No longer sat the girl drowning in her sorrows. The energetic, fun-loving young woman was back. Are you Charlie's little girl? Tommy asked. Harper smiled at the recognition, but didn't appear surprised. Given the size of Martha's vineyard, Biddy shouldn't have been surprised either, but nonetheless, she enjoyed the connection. Charlie's engaged to my girlfriend, Evelyn. Biddy connected the last piece for Tommy. He knew enough of her situation to know she lived in Evelyn's beach house. Are you done playing? Harper asked. You should join Biddy and me. Biddy shot the tipsy Harper a look. They had made a pact that they weren't looking for men tonight. Tommy pointed at Biddy. You ladies should join me. I'm about to head over to Vineyard Haven and play a house party. Biddy started shaking her head, then looked at her phone. It's already nine. We'd love to, Harper said. Biddy's mouth dropped as she swung her head to face Harper, who was beaming. She couldn't believe the transformation. Then Harper turned to Biddy and said, Biddy Lightfoot, you need to live a little. Chapter 7 Andrew Whitmore stood in his parents' house, wondering if he could sneak up to his room. The crowd seemed to be the same crowd that had been coming to his parents' annual lobster bake for years and asking the same questions. Where are you working nowadays? His father's golf buddies asked. Andrew had worked for the Globe for two years now, but had been a freelance writer for a few years before that. He wasn't surprised they didn't know. I thought you went to law school, one of them said. Yes, that's right, Andrew replied. But he didn't feel like expanding to explain how he ended up where he was now. At this point, he wasn't quite so sure about his career. His last assignment had been at a trial for a football player, charged with sexual assault. He always felt the point of journalism was to shine light on injustices. But no matter how much he shined, nothing changed. The offender got off, the victim's character had been crucified, and everyone was on to the next story. He hadn't had his name on a byline in a few weeks, which meant someone else's name sat where his should be. Now he was stuck on Martha's Vineyard at the end of the season, praying the situation in the Middle East didn't steal his spot in the next paper. He should have skipped his reunion. His gaze moved toward Joel and Lila. There stood his supposed friend and his sister, 
pretending to be the island's most adored couple, when the whole village knew their dirty secrets. He wondered how determined his sister was to get married, or how little Joel cared about her well-being. Thank God no children were involved. Yet. His sister had been an idiot to date Joel in the first place. The two of them had been in this seesaw relationship of breaking up and getting back together for years. The only difference from high school to now was Joel's effort to cover up his tracks. He didn't seem to care much anymore. The first time he had heard about Joel's behavior, he had punched him square in the jaw. Joel had stumbled back onto the pavement. What was that for? Andrew had picked him up by the shirt collar. How long have you been cheating on my sister? Joel had jerked out of Andrew's grip. I was just talking to her. But like Andrew had suspected, Joel had been sleeping with her. Andrew had been the one to tell Lila, who had everything banking on marrying Dr. Joel Schaefer. Her lifestyle, her house, her reputation. So when Joel had messed that up by sleeping with half the women on Martha's Vineyard, he had thought his sister would have walked away from the dream of becoming Mrs. Dr. Joel Schaefer. Instead, she had gone back to him, listening to his empty promises. At this point, Andrew felt like a driver slowing past an accident on the side of the road. He didn't want to see the destruction, but he couldn't help but look. His sister wouldn't be able to control Joel any more than she could a wild horse. Last night had proven that. He didn't understand. But it had always been about the glitz and the glam. The show. It's why Andrew never really fit into the Whitmore family. Being real was never a Whitmore thing. Andrew! His father called from the other side of the massive room that no one used except for a night like tonight. Andrew made his way toward him. A circle of men stood around his father, William Whitmore, whose loud, booming voice could be heard above the murmur of the crowd. Come meet Mr. Weber from Covington and Schofield. Nice to meet you, Mr. Weber. Andrew shook hands with the short, statured old man but silently groaned to himself about the next five minutes of his life. How do you do? Call me Don. Mr. Weber's Rolex slid out of his shirt sleeve. Flashy taste for his father's kind of friends, Andrew thought. Your father tells me you write. I told you he wastes time writing, his father said, his voice echoing throughout the room. Andrew waited for Mr. Weber to continue the conversation. So you just write then? Mr. Weber asked. If investigative journalism on the corruption in courts meant just writing, then... Yes. He hated these parties. Such a waste of a law degree, his father threw out. Andrew clenched his jaw. We're actually working on a piece on corruption in Boston's top law firms and the Hill. Mr. Weber's eyes widened. Really? Andrew's father didn't seem at all impressed. As far as Andrew could find, William Whitmore's only problem had been women. It was also the reason why his father kept his mouth closed with his son-in-law's indiscretions. But Mr. Weber didn't lose his apprehension which made Andrew make a note to check into Mr. Weber and his law firm. Where did you say you worked again? Covington and Schofield. And like most men in Mr. Weber's position, he handed over his business card, hoping for any shot he could get with a man like William Whitmore, even if that meant groveling with a writer. Andrew took the card and listened as the men continued with the conversation they'd had before Andrew arrived. A mixture of politics and current affairs that bored Andrew. The top 1% discussing how they could keep hoarding more money. Are you trying to mess with me? Lila hissed in his ear from behind. What do you mean? Andrew turned to see his twin pointing to a woman on the back patio under a heat lamp. Is that? He couldn't believe it. Harper Marin. Lila stared through the glass at Harper, who stood with a group of older people. 
Is she with the band? Andrew asked. He couldn't help but find the humor in the situation. Free-loving Harper Marin showing up to the annual uptight Whitmore lobster bake. This should definitely make things a bit more interesting. But then Joel smirked, pointing her out with one of his buddies. Andrew knew that smirk, that lean over and whisper in the ear. He could almost hear what Joel was saying. He was most likely bragging about his conquest, how badly she was into him, and how now she was even stalking him by coming here with the band. Andrew didn't care if his sister had this weird and twisted relationship and ignored the flagrant disrespect, but he wouldn't. He immediately made his way over to the band, and without thinking went straight up to Harper. What are you doing here? Andrew said, with little more venom than he meant. Harper had been smiling and laughing with the older woman when she immediately turned white. She didn't say anything. Watch it, buddy, said the older man who was the lead singer as he set his guitar case on the ground. He may be in his late fifties, early sixties, but he was still jacked and someone Andrew didn't want to mess with. She's with me. Andrew blinked hard at that one. She was with that old guy? He shook an image out of his head. Do you know this is my parents' house? He didn't skirt around the issue. I think it's best you leave. By the way her face dropped, he realized Harper wasn't aware of that fact. I should go, Harper said right away. She turned to the woman who was shaking her head. I could take an Uber. What do you mean? Why are you leaving? The older woman gave him a look. We'll all go, the guy in charge of the band said. Come on, boys, we're out. That's when, from the corner of his eye, he saw his mother coming toward the commotion. What's going on? Sonia Whitmore didn't allow anything to slide by her, especially something happening at her organized event. Tommy, is there a problem? The man nodded at Andrew. Your son seems to have a problem with my band member. It's fine, Harper said. I should go. Andrew? Explain yourself. His mother scolded him as if he were a child. I apologize. Andrew didn't know exactly why he had upset Harper so much. She had come to a party uninvited. She had to have known Joel would be at his fiancée's party. But he'd apologize nonetheless, hoping she'd drop it. But Sonia Whitmore would not drop anything. He looked at Harper, wishing he could be completely honest but he gave her a nod. Harper didn't move. She stared at him as he turned away. He didn't look back but heard his mom apologize again for his behavior and tell the group she had no idea what had come over her son. When Andrew turned around, a whole crowd of people, including the one person he had tried to protect, were watching the scene. Lila's eyes teared up. What is your problem? his mother said when she came back to the party. Why did you ask my guests to leave? He swallowed his pride as Lila looked on from the other side of the room. I'm sorry, I just thought... He stopped himself before he said anything more. What could he say? Sorry, I thought your daughter's boyfriend would harass the band? Or worse, confess how Joel already had. Well, get down there and fix this! His mother threw her hand into the air in the direction where the band had left. That girl you harassed wants to leave, and now so does the band. He sighed and looked at Lila, who turned away. I don't want my party to be over at 9.15, his mother said, as though this would urge him to move faster. He stuffed his hands into his pockets, a habit he had started when he was a boy and his mother caught him fidgeting. He dug them deep, straining his muscles. Just as he was about to walk out, he swooped up a glass of champagne and chugged it back. Then he went out to the service area, where deliveries came in and the staff worked. This part of his family's vacation home reminded him of a hotel service station. 
In the driveway, the band packed up in a van with an HVAC company logo on the outside. Harper, wait, please, he called out. The man, Tommy, moved toward him. You've already made her upset. You should be the one who leaves now. Andrew looked behind Tommy and saw Harper with the older woman, who gave him the death stare. Her arm sat protectively around Harper's shoulder. Andrew held up his hands. Look, I'm here to apologize for my behavior. The woman's eyes narrowed. I'm really sorry if I came across rude, he said. He hoped that would work. He wasn't quite sure how he'd get the band back inside, but at least he could try to fix the real situation. That Harper Marin was upset, and it was because of him. Harper glared at him as he walked toward them. Andrew held out his hands in a surrender. I didn't want another situation like last night, that's all. Harper's face looked incredulous. Young man, why don't you leave while you're ahead? The silver-haired woman stood tall between them. He nodded. I'm sorry I've upset you. Harper held her jaw up, her stance powerful and defiant, just like the girl he remembered from high school. Annoyingly confident, the kind of person who dressed the way she wanted, behaved however she wanted, would do cartwheels on stage or sing a song or recite a poem in front of crowds, and who never seemed to care who watched or what people thought. The complete opposite of him. How he wished he could be himself right then. He'd tell her the truth about Joel, how he had promised to marry Lila but had rendezvoused with other women. But Andrew's loyalty was too strong so he swallowed his pride for the second time that night. How about I pay you all for your time, and we can call it a night? We don't want your money, Tommy said. Good night, Mr. Whitmore. Harper got into the vehicle with the rest of the group, and soon they were gone. Andrew didn't move from the driveway, even as people hurried around him, catering his mother's party. He didn't want to go back up and hear how he had ruined it. They left? His mother flung her hand at the empty spot where the band should have been playing by now. Yes. You have to apologize, Sonia said. I did, but they still left. Do you have any idea what it takes to create this evening for your father? His mother began. I work for months getting things together, setting up all the different things to make your father and his clients happy. Now I have a bored crowd that wants to go to bed. Andrew's loyalty to Lila often caused complications for him. She was his twin sister. As stupid as she may be with her relationship, he would protect her and keep her secret for now, even from their mother no matter how upset and angry Sonia Whitmore became with him. I'm sorry. She continued talking about the effort it took to make a party like the one she had that night. He pretended to listen, because he loved his mother with all his heart, and knew her role in this game. He just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. Chapter 8 Harper held her head as she tried to sip her coffee. Tell me you have more of that, Biddy said from the couch. Harper smiled, thinking about the night before. I can't believe you made me take more shots when we got back. We had to have some girl talk. Biddy said it as if having tequila shots was a normal occurrence, even though Harper knew it wasn't. You cut loose last night? Harper then waggled her eyebrows up and down. I like Tommy. Oh, my music man? Biddy seemed to have forgotten clinging to the guitar player all night. You two were cute together. Harper poured a cup of coffee for Biddy and handed it to her. Biddy ran her fingers through her hair. I need it last night. Did you tell the ladies where you are? Harper was almost certain the police would be searching the island if she hadn't. Evelyn went away for the weekend with Charlie, Biddy said. Harper's mouth dropped. She had no idea. They went away? 
didn't you know? Biddy said, making a surprised face. Harper thought about the day before. Everyone had been gone, but she had no idea they were away away. She slowly shook her head. They didn't tell me. Biddy waved her hand at her. They probably meant to. They forgot about me. Harper then had an image of her crying in the back of Tommy's truck. Oh, God, did I cry, like, all night? That was why Harper tried not to drink more than a couple glasses, if that. She had been known for crying when she drank. She had never been to the shady bar in the basement of the Oyster House. She had heard all kinds of stories from the old-timers in town, but could never confirm or deny the legends. I had a blast last night, Biddy said patting a seat on the couch beside her. I haven't had a night like that since college. Harper thought about dancing with Biddy, then sneaking into the party, pretending to be backup singers, and practically peeing her pants as Biddy tried to keep a beat with a tambourine. I felt like Janis Joplin, Biddy said, looking up to the ceiling. Who? Harper said, a joke continuing from the night before. Don't you even, girl. Her accent fully accentuating its Oklahoman drawl. She tisked her tongue and took another sip. Harper laughed. Then another image of Andrew standing in the driveway flashed through her head. That guy is such a jerk. He sure was unpleasant. Biddy set her coffee down and stretched out her arms, then folded them against her chest. He made you mighty upset. That whole family is nuts. Harper couldn't believe the nerve of him, coming up to her in the middle of the party and acting as if she'd been there to cause trouble. Tommy was really nice to stick up for us, Harper said. What's right is right, Biddy said, as though she expected nothing less from the man. How well do you know him? Harper raised one eyebrow this time. Biddy leaned forward and took her mug again, ignoring the question. Tell me about this doctor. Harper shrugged. She thought she had seen Joel in the crowd, but now she couldn't remember if she had dreamt it or not. Well, he's very handsome, Biddy smiled. And? Lila, the other guy's sister, was engaged to him. Harper could see that Biddy understood the situation now. Biddy nodded. Ah. I see. And she came to me to ask if there was something going on between us. Harper still couldn't believe she had come to the store. She came to you about the doctor? Biddy tisked her tongue. That poor girl must not be over him. Don't feel sorry for her. Harper shook her head. Lila was the meanest girl in school. Time and time again, Lila had hurt people throughout her reign at Martha's Vineyard High School. She had ruled over the student body. I wouldn't want to marry that. Biddy placed her hand on Harper's knee. I always found those kids who were the meanest were hurting the most. No, she was just a jerk. Harper didn't believe in excuses. I didn't have a mom or live in a fancy house or drive the newest sports convertible, and I was still kind to people. That's because you're cooler than someone like her, Biddy said, getting up off the couch slowly. She went into the kitchen and grabbed herself another cup of coffee. Well, it's a good thing we didn't stick around then. Harper thought about the look on Andrew's face when he'd come up to her. She squeezed her fists. Biddy sat back down and jabbed her elbow in Harper's side playfully. I sure did have a good time, though. I had a blast. Harper laughed, thinking about the two of them dancing to Lionel Richie and Diana Ross. I can't believe the police didn't come, Biddy said. Harper had never been that loud before. I should have had more parties. Biddy shifted in her seat to face Harper. Then have them. What? You are in your twenties, my dear. Live a little. Throw a dinner party, be loud, dance and sing all night if you want. You don't have more time. Biddy took a big gulp of her coffee. And call that doctor. 
Biddy got up from the couch and put her mug in the sink. I'm spending the day in the sun, cleansing my body from all the toxins I put into it. She grabbed her purse and made kissing noises at Joan, who was sprawled out on the table. Come spend the day with me. Harper looked to Joan, who meowed for Harper to feed her again. She almost said no to Biddy out of habit, but why not? Okay, that sounds great, Harper said. Let me get some pastries while I'm in town, and I'll meet you at the house. Perfect. Harper wondered if Renee would be at Books and Bread. She'd know that Charlie and Evelyn went away for the weekend. He'd have made sure to tell his business partner and new stepdaughter his whereabouts. Oh my God, thank goodness you're here, Renee said as soon as Harper walked into the store. She handed George over without another word and went right back behind the counter. Harper smiled down at the one-year-old, whose favorite thing to do at this stage of his life was cling to his mother. You need someone to watch him? Usually someone from the house would watch George, and lately it had been her. But she didn't mind whatsoever. In fact, she swore George listened to her better than Charlie. She swung George up into the air and pretended to gobble his belly button. Is he yours? A man's voice asked from behind her. Harper turned around to face Joel, who was holding a coffee and a pastry bag to go. No, she said. She continued to make George giggle in delight. I heard about what happened to you last night, Joel said, his brows furrowing sympathetically. George dropped down from her arms like one would perform a cherry drop on the jungle gym handlebars. Upside down, hair hanging down, his arms reaching toward the floor. Is he okay? Yes, he's a little boy with an overactive spirit. A kid after her own heart, she thought. George stuck out his tongue and blew bubbles. I hope Lila didn't... He stopped. She still hasn't gotten over our relationship. She doesn't really understand boundaries. Harper shook her head vehemently. Please don't apologize. You had nothing to do with their behavior. I just care about her well-being, Joel said. He looked pained. Her mental health and all. Harper immediately felt for him. If Lila had gone to Harper just because he had spoken to her at the reunion, she couldn't imagine what Lila would do if she had called him. She wanted to know if we were more than just friends. Harper said. She talked to you about us? Joel's face looked stricken. She's out of control. She wondered if Joel had dealt with this kind of behavior all these years with Lila, or if this had started when it had been over. She shouldn't have slept with her trainer if she wanted Joel so badly. Look, let me make it up to you, Joel said. Let me take you out for drinks. Does tomorrow night work? You don't have to take me out, she said, holding on to George's ankles at this point. He continued to blow raspberries, then wave to customers with pure gusto. He should be your welcome committee. Joel pointed his cup at George as he waved to Mrs. Rinaldi, who had just purchased her normal loaf of bread. Hi, Mrs. Rinaldi, Harper said, waving to her neighbor. Date night? She held up a pink box. It's our anniversary. Harper could feel her anxiety brewing at the idea that Joel Schaefer wanted to take silly little Harper out. She let out a whoop. Joel's face showed bewilderment. Did you just whoop whoop? Yes. Harper wondered why she let out a holler, and if he still wanted to take her out. Tomorrow night, six o'clock. He smiled wide, showing off his perfect grin. Meet me at the wharf. George's arms wrapped around Harper's body like a pole in a fire station, upside down and ready to slide down. Joel's jaw dropped as she swung George back upright into her arms. You're a natural with kids, Joel said. Harper let out a holler of a laugh. She was nervous, both at being around Joel and his kind compliment. 
Her laugh was so loud it surprised George, who let go of her body and almost fell out of her grasp. But luckily, Joel swooped in just in time to take him into his arms. George happily did the switch, clinging on to a new body. Harper went to take him back, but Joel started to show George what was inside his pastry bag. I got one of the infamous pain au chocolat. He then said it in a French accent, which sounded so much fancier than in English. It's his mother's croissant, Harper said, wondering if he had made the connection from the other night. Mateo's fiancé is the baker, and that's her son. This is Mateo's son? He looked at the fair-haired, blue-eyed boy. Yes, and no, she said, imagining how beautiful their family would look when Renee and Mateo do have a baby. This is Renee's son from another marriage, but Matteo is raising him as his own. Ah, I see, Joel said. He looked down at his watch, an expensive watch from just the quick glance Harper made out. I should be going. I have a flight out in an hour. You're never going to make it to Boston in time, she said. His face flushed. No, I've got a private flight scheduled here on the island. Her mouth dropped. Joel Schaefer could afford a private flight. Wow, that's awesome. I have a conference in Boston for the day. He looked down at his phone. But I'll be back tomorrow for dinner. It's dinner now, she said, trying to sound cheeky. Actually, he began. I wanted to invite you over to my place so I could make you dinner, but you never called me. Her face immediately blushed. I didn't know with everything. Send me your address and I can pick you up, he said. He handed George back to her. The toddler slipped right back onto her hip and waved to Joel as he left. Bye-bye, Joel said, waving to George and then to her. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow. She could barely get the word out. Her mouth dried up as she stood there. I have a problem with men, Harper said immediately as she lay down next to Biddy on the beach. Biddy passed her a plastic container of pink lemonade. I put some electrolytes in that, but should I run inside the house for something stronger? I agreed to go out with the doctor. Harper still couldn't believe it. Oh, God, what was she going to wear? He's flying a private flight to Boston as we speak. So, Biddy said. So he's way too good for someone like me, Harper said. He's like way too cool. You're way cooler, Biddy said. Harper made a face at Biddy. You haven't even met him. Yes, but the people he hangs around with are not really cool, Biddy said, as if that explained everything. I'm not going to go out with him. There's no way. What was I thinking? Biddy's forehead creased as she listened. You're amazing, Harper Marin, and that's why the handsome doctor asked you out. He wants to make me dinner at his place, Harper said. It seemed much more romantic than just going for drinks at a tourist trap. Biddy's smile lifted on one side while her eyebrows lowered. Well... You better give me the address so I can call the police if you go missing. Harper then thought about Lila finding out they went on a date. What if his ex goes crazy? If you ask me, Biddy reclined in her beach chair. He seems like a pretty smart guy breaking up with a woman like that. And he wanted to make dinner for a woman as smart and wonderful as you. Harper fell back onto her spot in the sand resting on her elbows, and looking out at the waves rolling onto shore, the sunlight sparkling on the water. Seems like the perfect catch. Biddy put her sunglasses on and leaned back. Sometimes you need to take a leap to get you going. The beach had been exactly what Harper needed. In fact, Biddy seemed to relax as well. They sat in the sun with books to read, but they gabbed and gobbled pastries the whole time. They acted like two giddy teenagers gossiping about boys. 
When Renee showed up after closing the store, Harper and Biddy had dinner ready for her, Mateo, and George. All of them sat together, talking about the day and new projects Mateo had been working on. By the time Renee pulled out a few Dale desserts, Harper received a text from Charlie and Evelyn giving her their itinerary for the rest of their trip. Well, look who remembered me. Harper held out her phone to Biddy. The text made the two of them crack up in stitches. Mateo and Renee made faces at each other, clearly not understanding the joke. Yesterday, Harper might have thought Biddy would have spilled Harper's secret, that she had been hurt by her father's forgetfulness. But now she felt a sisterhood she'd never felt before, joking and telling secrets, revealing her faults, and confessing her sins. Biddy didn't make her feel weird when she talked about Tanya leaving as a kid. She understood what it was like to be a single parent, but also a daughter of a single father. Are you going to tell me what you and George were talking about with that guy from the other night? Renee asked. Mateo smiled at her. There's a guy? Harper shook her head. She noticed a little tinge of sadness, thinking Mateo seemed happy she had met someone. No, it's nothing. Who is it? Mateo asked. Harper took her fork and stabbed an olive from her salad before popping it into her mouth to avoid answering the question. The doctor, Renee said. I can't remember his name. Not Joel Schaefer. Mateo looked surprised, but not in a good way. Is there something wrong with that? Harper asked, her tone a bit harsher than she intended. Mateo shook his head, but she could tell he did think something was wrong with that. Isn't there something between him and Lila again? Mateo asked. They're not together anymore. Harper had thought Mateo knew that. Do you know that Lila actually came to the store and confronted me about him? Mateo looked almost sad by this. She did? She did. Harper rolled her eyes at the thought of it. She came to the store to ask if we were together. Mateo looked distressed about this news. Don't forget her brother telling us to leave the party, Biddy added. Oh, yeah, that jerk Andrew told us to leave his party, Harper said. You went to Andrew Whitmore's party? Mateo asked. Why did he kick you out? Renee asked. The both of them looked completely confused. Harper and Biddy told Mateo and Renee about their night, starting with their adventure at Mooncusser's. I had three shots of tequila, Harper said to Mateo, who knew her low tolerance. Biddy told them about Tommy Taylor, whom Mateo, of course, knew. We pretended to be his groupies. Harper couldn't stop laughing long enough to tell the story of the tambourine. Renee had to piece together the words. You went to a party in Vineyard Haven and played the tambourine? At the Whitmore's? Mateo didn't seem to get the humor. Harper said, Andrew kicked us out. She ended the story there without telling them Andrew apologized. After dinner, when George had been put down and Mateo had said his good nights and goodbyes, Biddy turned on a rom-com. Stay the night and watch a movie with us. As Biddy patted the couch, a feeling of warmth grew inside Harper's belly, a yearning of someone wanting her to sit next to them, a feeling she couldn't explain, but something she had been nostalgic for all her life. Then she had remembered her mother patting the couch when she had lived with them, when she hadn't minded sitting with Harper for extended periods of time. God, she had missed that feeling. I need to get going, Harper said jabbing her thumb behind her. I have a ton of writing I need to get done. Then the familiar sinking sensation of worry flooded back as soon as she reached her car. The tidal wave of reality rolled over her. Biddy wasn't her mother. Renee wasn't really even her family. Charlie couldn't remember to tell her he had a vacation. And as much as she didn't want to admit their relationship had changed ever since he had found Evelyn. Everything had changed. The person she had always counted on, and who had counted on her, didn't need her anymore. 
And where did that leave her? Chapter 9 Biddy woke up earlier than usual, dressed, and went for her walk with Wanda. So, how's married life? Biddy asked. But she was really thinking about her day ahead. Biddy had planned on looking for some sort of work on the island, something that might pay enough for a small rental. Did Richard do chores? Wanda asked. Biddy smiled. Only outdoor ones. Richard's home had been beautiful, sprawling lawns outside the long ranch home. Fields and pastures where cattle grazed along the wooden fences. A large watering hole, she had called a lake, where ducks would visit every year. Biddy sure did miss it. Biddy shook her head at herself. There she goes, thinking about Oklahoma again. Marty does everything. Dishes, washing, toilets, Wanda said. She sounded upset about it. Sounds like you hit the jackpot, Biddy said. She never minded doing chores, but having some help would have been nice during those days of 12-hour shifts and little kids running around. Richard's children had lived with them after they had gotten married. She had raised them like her own, Richard Jr. and little Sadie. She wondered if Richard would be rolling in his grave at what the children had done to each other, what they had done to her. When she returned from the walk, she resigned to the fact that the beautiful day she had before her would be spent on a computer finding a job. She looked through posts upon posts of available job openings, positions she'd feel comfortable taking. But even if they looked at her application, and being 63, that was a big if, she just didn't want to. She was 63. She wanted to enjoy the ocean and the last of the autumn days. She wanted to clean and do chores and read and ride a bike when she wanted to. She deserved to slow down, not pick up the pace. She deserved to have her retirement. Richard hadn't changed his will. The estate had been in his ex-wife's and children's names. Nothing for Biddy or her son Drake who had been like a son to Richard. Neither Richard Jr. nor Sadie seemed to care that the woman who had helped raise them had been left with nothing. When they'd started fighting over the inheritance between each other, Biddy's attorney had said there'd be nothing left when they were done. She went to the regular websites to apply for jobs for traveling nurses. There were plenty of employment vacancies for registered nurses, just none on the island. There was a temporary part-time position in Oak Bluffs, but even as Biddy filled out the application, she knew the pay wouldn't cut it. She slammed the computer screen, too angry to concentrate on anything. She got up and walked to the window. She stared out at the former garage Evelyn had renovated into a small cottage. Harper would be just fine. Maybe she'd have a bruised ego while she stayed with them, but Charlie and Evelyn would do anything for their kids and would tell her to stay for as long as she wanted. She thought she'd have that. She thought she'd have grandchildren running along those sprawling lawns. She thought she'd have her children taking care of the family's ranch for their family. She never imagined that at 63, she'd have nowhere to go. Outside, two car doors slammed shut. She looked out the kitchen window and saw that Evelyn and Charlie had returned from their mini vacation. She grabbed her laptop and stuffed it into her knitting bag. She was all smiles when they told her of their adventures in Vermont. It's gorgeous this time of year, all these deep reds and bright oranges. Evelyn looked wistful, as though she still floated in the clouds. Charlie glowed behind her, staring at his bride-to-be. And Biddy was happy for her friends. She was. The two of them hadn't had it easy. They deserved this happiness. But even though she was happy, sadness penetrated through her like a leak in a boat. She could feel herself slowly sinking the more the two told inside jokes and finished each other's sentences. I need to go, Biddy said suddenly, cutting Charlie off about their hike in the Green Mountains. I'm sorry. I forgot I have putters. She didn't know why she lied. She had let her country club pass expire over the summer. She couldn't afford it now. 
but she liked seeing Evelyn worry-free, and she knew her friend would only worry if Biddy told the truth, that she was in trouble. She couldn't ignore her problems any longer. She needed to find a job. She needed to find a place to live. And she needed to get her finances in order so she could retire someday. She grabbed her purse and took off in her car. She'd have to do something. She drove up to the local nursing home and went straight into the manager's office. Places like these were always looking for help. Are you here as a visitor today? The young woman asked behind the counter. She almost asked if she looked like someone who belonged there, but Biddy took in a long breath, holding back the smart remark she had on the tip of her tongue, and collected herself. I'm here to see if there are any employment opportunities at your facility. Biddy could feel her heart race as the words stumbled out. I've been a traveling nurse for years, and I've worked in nursing homes all over the country, but I'm willing to do anything, cooking, cleaning. The girl looked confused. Um, well, I'm just the receptionist. Is there someone I could speak to? Biddy felt her age through this girl's bewildered eyes. Did you say you're a nurse? A voice said from behind her, and Biddy swung around to see a slender woman around her own age, standing there in sunglasses and a Chanel coat. Yes, Biddy said. And you can cook and clean? The woman asked. Biddy couldn't help but be curious about what the woman was getting at. She was dressed well, high end. She had jewelry on her ears and neck, but Biddy noticed the massive diamonds clinging on her twiggy fingers. She wore a strong scent of a perfume Biddy had never smelled before, but liked, even as overwhelming as she wore it. Her Fendi bag was bigger than her petite stature and Biddy. Yes. Mrs. Whitmore, the girl behind the counter said. Are you here as a guest? The young lady appeared nervous in front of the fancy woman. My name is Sonia Whitmore, Sonia ignored the girl. I'm looking for a caregiver for my father, who's 86 and going home from a broken shoulder in a few days. Biddy hadn't thought about private care, but she wasn't looking for temporary work. I'm looking for something a bit more permanent, I'm afraid. The woman tilted her head while narrowing her eyes. I'll pay you better than this facility. Do you live here on the island? Biddy shook her head. There's housing available. Sonia passed over a card. Biddy looked for the occupation of the fancy woman, but she had nothing besides her name and contact information. Sonia Whitmore apparently didn't need a title. I need someone right away. I'm looking for more of a live-in situation for an extended period. He can become confused at times. Biddy hesitated. A live-in situation would be perfect. It wouldn't be difficult to at least see what the situation entailed. I'd have to meet your father, see the house before I'd even consider it. Yes, of course. Sonia opened her phone. How does this afternoon sound? Biddy had an urge to open her own phone and check her calendar, as if she too had tons of plans, but she had none. That sounds great. You could meet my father now, Sonia said. I actually don't have much time to stay, but I could introduce you. Sonia Whitmore didn't take no for an answer. She didn't even take an answer. She just pushed Biddy past the receptionist, through the doors, and down a long corridor. My father was a judge before retiring here, but he's struggled with living on his own since my mother passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Biddy said. Sonia sighed, fixing her cashmere coat that hung on her shoulders. My father has always been a bit of a handful thinks he's still twenty and spry. He fell out of a tree while using a chainsaw. Biddy covered her mouth to hold back her laugh, thinking about Richard trying to act like he was twenty in his seventies. This is his room, Sonia pointed to the door. Inside, an older man sat in a chair watching the television. His arm sat in a sling. 
He wore a plaid shirt with a pair of khaki pants. He had an air about him, like a captain of a ship. Are you bringing me home? He asked as soon as Sonia walked into the room. No, Dad, a few more days. Sonia stepped aside to let Biddy come in. I have someone I'd like you to meet. Who's that? He asked grumpily. He looked up to Biddy, and the scowl on his face suddenly faded, a smile growing in its place. I must have died and gone to heaven. Who is this angel in my presence? Biddy couldn't help but let out a laugh at the confidence of this 86-year-old man. I haven't been called that in a very long time. Not since her daddy, she thought. A pang of sadness stopped her conversation for a second, thinking of the nickname he had given her. I'm Biddy. Randy, he said. She held out her left hand so she could shake his good arm. Did my daughter tell you I'm a widower, he said, winking at Biddy. Daddy, Sonia snapped at her father. That's enough, please. Sonia inhaled a heavily annoyed breath and shot a look at the man. Biddy smiled at the woman as if to say she overlooked his behavior. Well, for now. You better be nice to me. Your daughter wants me to help you out, Biddy said. He looked up at his daughter, whose mouth dropped wide open, as if Biddy wasn't supposed to say anything. Oops. I don't need a babysitter. His friendly demeanor was gone. Dad, we've gone over this. You can't stay alone at the house, and you don't want to stay here. Sonia sounded exasperated. Biddy could feel his embarrassment as he sat there in front of a stranger, as his daughter demeaned him unintentionally. Randy looked at the women suspiciously, piercing his lips together. I can take care of myself. I heard you tried cutting down a tree. Biddy shook her head and laughed. My Richard would have done something that stupid, too. Your Richard sounds like a great guy, Randy said, which made Biddy let out a holler of a laugh. You are a firecracker, she said to him. Biddy looked at the television and checked out the score. The socks look good this year, Randy huffed. You seem like a lovely woman, Biddy, but my daughter has just lost her inheritance and can no longer afford you. It's my money that pays her, Daddy, Sonia said, looking tired and worn down. She turned to Biddy. Don't listen to him. He loves me very much. He just doesn't realize that having someone around would be helpful. Biddy sized the old man up. She had a feeling that behind that tough exterior, it was pure pudding inside. He was scared. Sometimes all it took was a fall, a broken bone, or a simple cold to end someone's life at Randy's age. Over the years, Biddy had seen all kinds of reactions, but anger and denial were usually the first stage. Biddy understood both positions. Her Richard had been lucky, because he'd had her to take care of him in his last years. But without her, he probably would have died alone, too stubborn to bring people in during the end. Randy harumphed. Two weeks. Two months at least, Sonia countered. Lila can't take care of you full time. She has her charity work. That's when everything clicked for Biddy. The fancy party the other night. The rude man who had wanted Harper to leave. The fancy woman who had tried to apologize. Sonia Whitmore was their mother. Did you have a lobster bake the other night? Biddy asked. Sonia nodded but looked confused. Yes? Were you part of the service staff? Biddy wondered if a woman like Sonia would ever sneak into a party uninvited. I'm friends with the musician you had hired for it. The woman's face fell. You know Tommy? Biddy nodded and noticed how Sonia used his first name. It was less formal and sounded odd coming from such a proper woman. Yes, he's a good friend. Sonia, whose body had been stiff, 
shifted her posture and lost the hard exterior. Biddy may have had reservations taking a job like this before, but now that she recognized the family, she wanted nothing to do with this situation. It was nice to meet you, Randy, Biddy said, extending her hand at him. Call me if you ever want to go for a boat ride, Randy said, taking her hand in both of his. She smiled at the offer. I'll do that. Sonia looked surprised by Biddy's sudden departure. Please consider taking the job. There is no job, Randy said from his chair. Biddy extended her hand out to Sonia. Thanks for the offer, but like I said, I'm looking for something more permanent. Sonia held out a limp hand at her. You have my card? Biddy nodded and wrapped her fingers around Sonia's bony hand. Good luck with the shoulder, Randy. Biddy didn't even stay to see if Sonia had more to say. She didn't need to stay. She wasn't going to take a job working for a family like that. She didn't bother stopping at the front desk. She knew the only way to find a job was through the websites, where she'd put down that she was a 63-year-old, and anyone looking would pass her up. When she got into her car, she pulled out her phone and dialed Drake's number. It went straight to voicemail. Hey, Drake, it's your mama. Just checking in to see how the family's getting along. It's fall here on the island. Sure miss the fall there in Oklahoma. How's school for the kids? She paused as if she were talking to an actual human being and not a machine. I miss you, baby. I miss the kids and Darlene. Tell them all I said hi, okay? She paused again, holding back the tears that pricked the back of her eyes. Talk to you later. She hung up and threw the phone on the passenger seat. She let out a roar from inside her chest, pounding the steering wheel with both fists. Why had Richard not followed through and changed the will like he had promised? They had been together for years. Why had he not taken care of her, or Drake, or his own kids for that matter? None of this would have happened if he had just done what he had always promised to do, which was take care of them. None of the fighting, none of the betrayal, none of the division. It would have been so simple. If Richard hadn't wanted her to have anything, she wouldn't have cared. But to be lied to, told he would leave something for her, she would have still cared for him, but she wouldn't have left her career if she would have nothing in the end. She squeezed the steering wheel so hard that her hands hurt from the tension. Her head dropped on the back of the chair, and the tears fell down the sides of her face. She looked out the windshield, and standing across the parking lot looking back at her was Sonia. Biddy immediately turned the ignition and took off out of the parking lot and onto the road driving with nowhere to go. Chapter 10 Harper didn't text Joel. Yes, he told her to send him her address, but the little voice inside her said he didn't really want to go on a date. So when she got a text from an unknown number saying it was him and that he'd really like to have dinner, she was shocked he'd actually found her number. When are you going to text me your address? said the text. She stared at the number, then closed the app so he wouldn't see her looking at the message. What was she going to write back? Her address, she guessed. I hope I'm not being too forward, his next text said. No, not at all, she thought. The whole thing could be a scene from one of Evelyn Rose's novels, where the handsome guy finally sees the nerdy girl in the corner and takes her out. She needed to call someone, tell someone about this. She dialed Biddy's number. He texted me, she said right as Biddy answered. And, Biddy said, a hint of excitement in her voice. And I'm not sure, Harper sat on her couch. I live in a dump. You have your own place, Biddy corrected her. I barely have a job. You're a published author. Biddy said. I'm a mess. 
And he's a doctor who owns a successful practice here on the island. Harper, maybe he sees what we all see, Biddy said. The beautiful woman who's creative, kind, and fun. Harper could feel her eyes moisten. She tried to talk, but the lump in her throat made the words stick. Harper realized she had been waiting for her mother to say something like that her whole life. Even as a published writer, she wanted her mother to read her book and tell her how proud she was, because she hadn't. And if her own mother didn't even think that of her, how could this great guy think that? Just say yes, Biddy said. Channel your inner Shonda Rhimes. Harper thought of the book Biddy had brought down to the beach. Just say yes, Harper repeated. She opened the text. It's like riding the bike, Biddy said. You have to pedal to move forward. Harper typed her address. And waited. And waited some more. Then, after two hours, there was a knock on her apartment door. Joan? Did you invite anyone? She grabbed her phone and opened to her emergency numbers. Tiptoeing to the door, Harper peeked through the peephole and saw a florist holding a large bouquet. She opened the door. Harper Marin, the woman said from behind the flowers. Yes? Harper had never, not in all the years of her life, received a bouquet of flowers. Not even when she'd had a part in a play. Her father had forgotten. Not when her book had been published. Not ever. She reached out for the glass vase in the woman's hands, just like she'd seen in the movies. They're beautiful. She noticed a card attached to a holder. Enjoy. The woman took off and Harper closed the door. Joan, look at these. It was a huge bouquet of calla lilies. It was gorgeous. She pulled the small card from its equally small envelope. Join me for dinner at my place. S'mores by the fire and drinks under the stars. Joel. Harper wondered. If she were writing a character and that character had been asked out by a handsome doctor, what would they say? They'd be confident. They're gorgeous, she texted. I'll be there by six to pick you up, he texted back. She wondered if she should send an emoji or just give him a thumbs up. Or maybe she should cancel. She still had time. Joel Schaefer dated bombshells like Lila Whitmore. Harper's unruly curls mixed with a lack of style didn't seem to fit the perfect doctor. She texted Biddy. He's picking me up at six. I'm on my way. In less than a half hour, Harper opened the door to Biddy and Renee holding George. You all came? Biddy walked right in with a huge plastic container that looked like a tackle box. I love doing hair and makeup. I brought some of my best, Renee air quoted with George, casual dresses. She walked in holding at least a half dozen different dresses of all different styles and colors. Isn't this cute? She held up a lavender dress with a tulle skirt. It was gorgeous. It's gorgeous, Harper said. But I can't borrow those. Why not? Renee looked at the dresses. Because I'll probably ruin them. And it's only casual. Harper had been known for being spacey and spilly. Then this one. Renee held another one up after dropping the remaining dresses onto the couch. I haven't worn them in years. Harper couldn't believe the beautiful dresses Renee just had hanging around in her closet, ready to be worn. Biddy held up a record that Harper had taken from her great aunt Martha after she had passed away. Now, let's get our girl ready for the ball. As Aretha sang in the background, Biddy poured Harper a glass of champagne, and the women took over from there. First, Manny's and Petty's. Betty did a full blowout, and Renee helped with styling a casual sundress paired with platform sandals with straps that laced around her ankles. 
I look ridiculous, Harper said. You look gorgeous, Renee said. Like a fairy princess. Harper looked at herself in the mirror. And for the first time in a really long time, she felt pretty. Thanks, you guys, Harper said, as George crawled after Joan. That's when the doorbell rang. Harper looked at the clock. Exactly six o'clock. She rushed to the doorway and opened it. Joel stood there in a blue button-up and khaki pants, the typical Martha's Vineyard dress code, and he looked so handsome, she sucked in a breath of shock. He smiled as she opened the door, but frowned immediately when he saw the rest of them behind her. You have company? he asked, leaning a bit to get a better view. Biddy and Renee both waved. Don't mind us, Biddy said. We're just here to check your credentials. This made Joel frown. Biddy's joke didn't seem to land with the doctor. Harper smiled and said, She's just joking. This is Renee and George and Biddy. Renee winked at Harper and pulled at Biddy's elbow. We should be going. Nice meeting you, Dr. Schaefer. Joel, please. He nodded at them. Yes, nice to meet all of you. Renee whisked George and Biddy out of the apartment and left Harper standing with Joel. The hottest guy on the whole island stood in her tiny apartment above the pizza shop. Welcome. She looked around at what once had seemed like a cute and cozy apartment, but now it just looked small and dingy. Joel walked in holding a large brown bag in his hand. He held it. I brought dinner. Oh, Harper said, surprised. She had thought he was taking her to his house. She looked down at her dress. Let me get some plates. Joel set the bag on the counter and pulled out not just any takeout, but a very expensive dinner, along with an aged bottle of wine that must have cost him a fortune. This is too much, she said, looking at all the food he continued to unpack. Fresh oysters on the half shell, seared scallops bathed in a white wine cream sauce, and a lobster florentine. Joel looked up as he set down all the extra utensils and napkins. I thought we could just hang out and get to know each other. Turned out, Joel was funny, telling stories of some of his craziest clients and med spa treatments. He told her how he had gone straight to college in Boston, then off to medical school. He returned to Martha's Vineyard to be close to his family. She noticed he hadn't mentioned Lila or their past relationship when he talked about high school. Did you go to college? He asked. She shook her head. Her dad had always wanted her to, but she had taken some community classes online and nothing more. She had told people it had been too expensive, but Charlie would have done what he could to have her go. I was never really interested, she said, hoping the truth didn't sound as bad to him as it did her. I knew what I wanted to do, so... He looked at her thoughtfully, as though he were examining a patient. You are magnetizing, he said. She blinked at the compliment. Oh, wow. Thank you. You just do whatever you want. Whenever you want, he said, resting his head in his hands and staring at her. She realized she didn't like the attention. When did you open your office here on the island? Just then, Joel leaned over the table and kissed her on the lips. She froze at first, surprised by his sudden advancement. But his soft lips melted away any apprehension. Dr. Schaefer was a good kisser. When they separated, she kept her eyes closed for a second, trying to regain her composure. The room felt like it was spinning. Wow, that was amazing, he said, taking the words right out of her mouth. He reached out and took her chin in his hand and kissed her again, short, fast kisses, as he got up from his chair and pulled her up on her feet. He kissed her again, harder, faster, 
Whoa, she said, putting her hands on his chest. Her body had warmed with steam. She took a breath. Sorry, Joel said, catching his breath. I can't get enough of you. Harper liked to kiss, very much, but she didn't want to be one of those women who made a wrong decision in the moment. What about checking out those stars, she said. We could walk down to the harbor. Her apartment wasn't that far away. I wish I could, but I have an early morning consultation tomorrow. He kissed her again on the lips. Agree to have dinner with me this weekend? She looked at the clock. She hadn't realized so much time had gone by. Was it already that late? That sounds perfect, she said, hoping he'd be more specific, but not wanting to ask in case she came off as desperate. Saturday night, he said. And this time, I promise to sit under the stars. She smiled as he kissed her one last time before he left. Chapter 11 Evelyn had called Harper and invited her out to lunch, just the two of them. Over the past few months, Evelyn had noticed a change in the happy-go-lucky young woman. These days, she seemed stressed, and she was withdrawing from the group. Evelyn wondered if Harper felt left out from the Rose women, since she had stopped coming over so frequently. Harper had even stopped sharing her writing with Evelyn, which had been a huge red flag for her. Had Evelyn done something? That's what she wanted to know. She wanted to know if everything was okay with Harper. Was she okay with all the change? Was she okay with the engagement? She pulled up outside Harper's apartment and got out. But Harper was out the door before she even had a chance to go inside. You're ready? Evelyn said, suddenly nervous. Harper nodded. I needed to get out of there. The two got into the car, and Evelyn turned it around and headed off. I thought we could head to Oak Bluffs and check out a new lunch spot. Sounds good. The more Evelyn thought about what to say, the more awkward the drive to the restaurant became. Harper didn't seem to have anything to say either. When they arrived at the restaurant, they were seated right away and given menus. Oh, I heard this place has good lobster rolls, Evelyn said. The price isn't even listed, Harper said, a tone in her voice. This is on me, Evelyn said. Get whatever you want. Evelyn's daughters always enjoyed a free lunch, but Evelyn swore Harper scowled at first. Thanks. So, how's the writing? Evelyn asked, but immediately regretted it when she saw Harper's face drop. It's going. Harper's eyes were focused on the menu. It was a move her daughter Samantha would do when she didn't want to talk about things, which told Evelyn she needed to talk about things. Was Harper having trouble with her writing? Did Charlie know? As a writer himself, he suffered from the infamous writer's block. He, of all people, knew what it was like. He had even helped Evelyn out of her own writing funk. When Evelyn had first arrived at Martha's Vineyard, it had been five years of writing nothing of substance. She'd start a story, then drift off and ruin the project. Losing her husband, George, had killed the happily ever after for her. How could she write a romance when her own heart had been broken? She hadn't been able to make anything work, and she had produced nothing. But now, looking back, Evelyn could see everything from a bird's eye view. After George's death, her emotions had flooded her thoughts. Her doubts had wrangled her ideas and made the inner voice take over. Nothing had seemed possible. Anxiety had crept through her words and frozen her fingers. Evelyn had waited and waited for something to change. And that was when she'd gone to Martha's Vineyard. And everything did. But how could Evelyn help Harper? You should stay at the cottage. Evelyn said. What? Harper looked surprised. Stay in the cottage at Seaview. Mateo and his brothers were just about finished with the bathrooms. It'll be ready within a few days. Did Biddy tell you? Harper asked, setting the menu down. 
Tell me what? Evelyn thought back to her and Biddy's last conversation. Harper's forehead wrinkled as though she were putting pieces of a puzzle together. What about the cottage? Evelyn noticed the slight pivot in conversation from Biddy, but decided she'd go back to the subject later. Stay at the cottage, she said. All the great writers change locations when they need inspiration. What about Samantha? Harper said. She's in the city all the time now. Evelyn couldn't tell if Harper looked annoyed or interested in the idea. Sometimes you just need a change of scenery. Get away from your stuff and chores and obligations, and just write. Harper looked like she was thinking about it. Evelyn shrugged. I offered the cottage to Biddy, but she's looking for her own place. Harper tapped her fingers on the table. I can't, and I don't think that'd work. The words came out of Harper harshly, and Evelyn could feel the bite. Okay. She tried to not take things personally, as silence grew between the two of them. Like when her girls were teenagers, they'd snap at her because they knew she'd always be there. But with Harper, it felt different. Like a trapped animal snapping at someone trying to help, versus an angsty teenager. Evelyn picked up the menu, pretending not to be bothered. But she couldn't focus on any of it. What was going on with Harper? Did I do something to upset you? Evelyn finally asked. Harper's eyes snapped up at Evelyn. She shook her head. I haven't written anything, and I have a deadline coming up. Have you talked to Catherine? Evelyn hoped she had. Harper shook her head. Evelyn's stomach sank. She had a feeling things weren't exactly honky-dory with Harper's new novel, but she didn't know to what extent. Catherine had made a few comments, but Evelyn had stayed out of it. She had just connected the two, but her allegiance wasn't to the publisher. It was to Harper. Her editor knew better to complain about her top-selling author's soon-to-be stepdaughter. She'll understand. Trust me. Evelyn leaned on the table. She's dealt with me missing deadlines. Evelyn hardly missed deadlines, but she had been known for writing complete garbage at times and having to start all over again. Harper played with the corner of the menu, then looked up at Evelyn. She's already extended the dates a few times. A few times? Evelyn couldn't hold back her alarmed surprise. Oh, God. Harper dropped her head in her hands. I'm done. My writing career's done. It's not done, Evelyn said, shaking her head. Harper, you are very talented. Harper let out a small whimper. Stop. Listen to me. This is something almost every writer goes through. There are strategies that can help. I can't write, period. I just can't get the words out. Harper looked away as she twisted a strand of hair around her finger. I just sit there staring at that stupid cursor blinking back at me. Evelyn understood completely. She narrowed her eyes and squeezed her fist in the air. That dang cursor. My arch nemesis. Harper gave a half smile. Mine too. Harper's eyes drifted, and her body stiffened as though she saw a ghost. What is it? Evelyn asked, turning around to see a handsome-looking man staring back at her. Who's that? Evelyn whispered as she turned back around. Harper didn't answer. Instead, she kept her attention on the man. Evelyn was about to ask again when she realized he stood next to them. Hey, Harper. Harper didn't say anything, just looked at him. He looked at Evelyn, who smiled and then looked back at Harper, who still didn't speak. And Evelyn realized this was the first time Harper wasn't friendly towards someone. The usual bubbly personality went silent. I'm Andrew. The man held out his hand toward Evelyn, and she realized he was talking to her. I graduated with Harper from MVHS, the local high school. We worked on the newspaper together. Oh. Evelyn shook his hand and connected the dots. 
Oh. Yes. Andrew was the editor of the newspaper and liked to make fun of my silly little poems, Harper said. Is it okay that I'm having lunch here? Or are you here to tell me to leave? Ouch, Evelyn thought. She hadn't seen Harper this fierce and sharp and feisty ever. I don't remember that. Andrew wrinkled his forehead and looked hurt by what Harper had said. I'm sorry again for the other night, and for making you feel bad in high school. Harper shrugged his apology off, but something about the way he looked at Harper seemed genuine to Evelyn. She could feel his nervousness while standing there, but there was also a disappointment in how Harper was reacting toward him. It's nice to see you again, Harper, he said. He gave a wave to Evelyn and walked away. If looks could kill, thought Evelyn. I take it you don't like him very much? Harper shook her head. He's extremely full of himself. Comes from a family that's a disaster, but has money, so they think they can run the island. Ah, Evelyn nodded. She knew the type. He seemed apologetic to me. Harper shot Evelyn a look. Sorry. Evelyn held up her hands and decided to go back to what she was talking about. Set up in the cottage, just for a bit. See if a change in scenery is what the doctor ordered. Harper bit her bottom lip. I'm good. I need to just do it. I try to find the right time to write. Evelyn had to learn herself before she really became a proficient writer. She needed to know when her mind could see the story clearly. That happened to be the early morning hours before her babies woke up. Then it had just become her routine. She had learned to write in the car while waiting for her girls at soccer practice or dance lessons. She couldn't write after dinner, unless she had a major deadline approaching. And if she tried, it would go so badly that it was barely worth it. She had learned she needed to be clear-headed, so she limited herself to one drink, if that, a night. She didn't stay up late, she ate healthy, and she exercised because of all the sitting. Think about it, Evelyn said. As the server came by to take their orders, Evelyn noticed Harper sneak glances across the restaurant, glaring at the man who had introduced himself. Is he really that bad? Evelyn asked, wondering what on earth the guy could have done. He's the guy who kicked Biddy and me out of that party. Ah. Uh, Evelyn couldn't help but turn around and look again. Now the handsome young man seemed pompous and punkish. Well, I guess he shouldn't mess with my girls. Harper gave a small smile. As they sat there waiting for their food, Evelyn decided this was as good a time as any. Harper, I asked you to lunch today because I want to see if you'd like to be one of my bridesmaids with the girls. Harper immediately smiled. I'd love to be a part of the wedding. Evelyn was only going to ask the daughters. She and Charlie only wanted something small at the house, nothing big or flashy. Just their close friends and family standing with them. They thought about Christmas time, after Renee and Mateo's. Charlie liked the idea of an empty beach, just them. The rest of the lunch seemed to go well. Evelyn did notice Harper shooting daggers out of her eyes when Andrew left the restaurant with a very attractive woman. As they left and got in the car, Evelyn remembered the comment about Biddy. What was Biddy supposed to tell me? Harper shrugged. I don't remember now. But Harper's eyes skittered away from Evelyn's, and in that instant, she knew Harper was lying. Chapter 12 Andrew stayed at his parents' house just to please his mother. He worked on his story, trying to follow a lead, but he couldn't stop thinking about Harper Marin. Andrew had prided himself on not being like his father, who was arrogant, egotistical, and pushy. He had believed he had escaped the snobbish attitude, but looking back, he had behaved exactly like his father. He should call her, explain himself. He hated that he had made her so upset. 
He hated Joel for putting him in that situation. Maybe he should have just let it play out. Harper would have seen Joel with Lila as a couple, and she'd know what a sleaze he truly was. But Lila's heart would have been broken. He wondered if she had seen him with Harper the night of the reunion. She certainly wouldn't tell him if she had. Lila rarely told him anything these days, not after he'd caught Joel the first time with the trainer. And if Lila had seen Harper even talking to Joel, she would have said something even meaner than he had, and things would have been much worse than just a few hurt feelings. Harper would have been slayed among the crowd. His mother would be the first to draw her sword for her daughter. Boys will be boys, his father had said about Joel to Lila, the first time she'd broken up with him when he had cheated. That was when she had first called off the engagement. How many times had it been by this point? He'll grow up, William Whitmore had said to his only daughter. But Joel Schaefer never grew out of his wandering eye, and no matter how many times Andrew had gone to his sister about Joel's infidelities, she'd gone back to him. He wondered why she couldn't let him go. What about Joel made her allow him to treat her like that? He'd never understood why people got into relationships if they didn't want to be in one. But then here he was, unable to stop thinking about Harper Marin. That woman did something to him, something he hadn't ever felt for a woman before. He hadn't stopped thinking about her since the night of the reunion. Most women he dated were of two types. The ones who had no opinion about anything, or the ones who wouldn't even consider another opinion but their own. The first didn't care what she did if she got a seat with Andrew Whitmore. The latter was so into herself, her career, her style, her friends, that she did everything to prove she didn't need an Andrew Whitmore. Harper Marin was completely different. She wanted nothing to do with him, and for some reason, that did something to him. Usually, Andrew didn't repel women. Quite the opposite. He had no trouble with women except her. There was always trouble with Harper Marin. Andrew had never dated an islander, even when he was technically an islander himself. It had nothing to do with the girls in his school. He just didn't like the idea of them knowing everything about him. The Whitmores have been on the island as long as the Kennedys, his father liked to say. Growing up among the wealthy and privileged had its perks, but like all things, the highs came with the lows, and the Whitmores had plenty of lows. The first time Andrew became aware of the public's curiosity of his family was when he had read about his father in the paper. An article had come out about one of his father's conquests, a housekeeper who had spilled her story to page six. His mother had sold the house in the city and fired the housekeeping company. Then they had moved to the island full time for his mother's mental health. His father had stayed in the city at the new house, and Andrew and his sister were sent to school on the island for a normal childhood. When he had arrived at the Martha's Vineyard School, the whole student body knew his story before he had stepped inside the doors. It had been one of the reasons he had joined the newspaper. He wanted to be the one writing the stories, not be the story. That's how he had met Harper, at the school newspaper. He didn't remember much about the beautiful woman, other than she had shown up occasionally and wrote poetry and small bio stories of important people in the community. She had stuck strictly to storytelling narratives, which had worked out for him because he liked sports and business pieces. Why hadn't he taken the time to get to know her back then? After the run-in at the reunion, like anything he came across, he investigated. He had googled the new author. Harper had signed with one of the big four publishers and had an editor that was well-established in the business. Her book had tanked, which, from the amount of advertising and publicity the publishers had put in, meant it was a big disappointment. Which he blamed on the cover design and branding. It was all wrong. Her book would have appealed to young adults, 20-somethings looking for an escape from adulthood, not teenagers looking for the next Hunger Games. He noted that it had been a year since her debut, 
and a second title seemed to be coming soon, but was without a date. Other than her novel, Harper Marin was an anomaly. She had absolutely no social media presence. She had no permanent address, no listed phone records, no previous work experience listed on LinkedIn or other websites. According to Google, Harper Marin had lived in one place her whole life, Martha's Vineyard. The idea she had stayed on the island this whole time created even more mystery around her, because when he read her novel, he had sworn he'd traveled through the ancient back alleys of Rome and along the walking path through yellow-flowered countryside of Germany. She wrote it so well that he would have sworn she lived in those places. He looked out the windows that overlooked the Atlantic Ocean. Although Andrew had been convinced it didn't matter, his parents lived with the windows closed, with stiff furnishings and stale air filtered through machines, instead of the earth's tangy scent. He pushed open the wall of glass that his mother had installed but never opened, sliding doors that folded into themselves. He looked out at the view. His parents' house perched the cliffside facing the vineyard sound and had a panoramic view of Sugar Beach and Eastport Harbor. He imagined Harper standing by the water in her flowing dress, her hair hanging down and blowing in the breeze like a goddess of the sea. He decided to visit the one person who would get his mind off feeling like the biggest jerk in the world and a weirdo for being so enthralled with someone who hated his guts. The man he owed everything to, his grandfather. Hey, Pops, he said as he walked into his grandfather's room at the nursing home. Andy, my boy, his grandfather said boisterously from the chair he sat in. A quilt sat on top of his lap. Did you bring them? Andrew nodded, passing the dirty magazines over to Pops, wishing he hadn't started this at Christmas time three years ago. Now, every time he came to visit, Pops asked for them. You're a good boy. Pops patted him on the back as they hugged, but his attention was already on Miss July. What would Grandma have thought of this behavior? Andrew asked. His Puritan grandmother had boasted that her family had come over on the Mayflower. I'll stuff them into the desk after I'm done with them. What are you doing back on the island? Pops asked, setting the magazines aside. I thought you were working on things for the story. I can't seem to find someone who'd go on the record about O'Neill. The crooked judge had worked in the same circuit court as Pops. Even as a young judge, Pops had been concerned that he seemed to be a judge who had frequently ruled in favor of certain attorneys. He had been the one who had encouraged Andrew to pursue this story. Hmm. Did you hear from the DA's office about the inmate calls? They're not going to release them. Andrew seemed to be hitting every roadblock possible. They say it's a form of whitewashing and violates the U.S. wiretap laws. It's called FOIA. Pops made an audible harumph. There's your next question. Who's lining the district court's judge's pockets? Pops pulled out his traditional butt of a cigar that he always had on hand and bit it on the side of his mouth. Corruption is happening all the time in our city courts. That's why we need people like you exposing it. Pops looked deep in thought, and Andrew expected one of his infamous stories would start soon. But tonight, Pops looked tired, worn down. How have you been feeling these days? Andrew asked, looking around the room. A smell of antiseptic and mothballs permeated the building. Andrew wasn't sure if it was him being overly worried, but Pops looked like he had lost weight, and he looked paler. When was the last time you had something to eat? The food's terrible, Pops groaned loudly. Are you sure? Andrew felt something was off. Fine, he huffed, turning on the television. You don't look it. Andrew scrutinized Pops, who looked clammy and cold. I think I should call in the doctor. Pops looked offended, mad even. I'm fine. Then, a tall, gray-haired woman stood at the door. Well, 
Looks like you found some good reading material, the woman said as she looked at Pops. Pops looked confused at the strange woman, but then he smiled as though it had come to him. Well, if I didn't die and go to heaven, to what do I owe the pleasure of having you come visit me again? I heard the articles are very well written, the woman said, smiling at Pops. They are, almost written as well as my grandson Andrew's articles, Pops said, going straight into proud grandfather mode. You write for adult magazines, the woman asked him. Andrew shook his head. Pops had no shame. I write for the Boston Globe. The woman appeared impressed. Well done. He reached out his hand. I'm Randy's grandson, Andrew. We met at the lobster bake, she said. Andrew twisted his face, not being able to place the tall woman. Yes, he thought, maybe she does seem familiar. Um, Biddy, she said. His stomach dropped. She had been with Harper the night of the lobster bake. His mouth immediately went dry. I never meant to hurt her feelings, Andrew said. He could feel the immediate disdain. Yes, well, my daddy always said when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Her words sliced through him like a knife. I was only protecting her. The words came out fast, a habit he had when defending himself. Being Lila's brother, he had to be quick on the draw. She always cried wolf. Biddy's eyebrows raised in suspicion. Really? You told her to leave a party to protect her? You kicked this gorgeous woman out of a party? Pops looked dumbfounded. Biddy raised one side of her mouth in a smirk. You're a dirty old dog, aren't you? I was married for 50 years. Faithful all those years, Pop said loudly, as though the whole island should hear how it's done. Andrew wondered if Pops knew the gossip whispered around the island about his daughter. I'm afraid I haven't been working out like I used to. Pops was relentless, but it shifted the attention from Andrew to Biddy, which he had been grateful for. Biddy's eyes narrowed, but this time at Pops. What happened here? She began to roll up his sleeve, slowly at first, but then Andrew saw the bruise. The further the sleeve moved up Pops' good arm, the more purple the arm became. Biddy gently held it in front of him. Can you bend your fingers? She asked. With both hands, she bent his fingers, then his wrist, carefully keeping it steady. When did you fall? Are you a doctor? Andrew asked, surprised by how she had jumped right into things and seemed like she knew what she was doing. I'm a nurse, Biddy answered. Are you his nurse? Andrew asked, noticing that she wasn't wearing a uniform or any type of identification. No, your mother introduced me to your pops earlier with a job proposition and I thought I'd swing back in to see how we'd get along. Now he remembered his mom talking about a nurse. This Biddy must have been the one she had been referring to the other day. Your mother thinks I need a babysitter, Pops huffed out. You fell again? Andrew didn't think about him falling again. Isn't he at a nursing home? Weren't they supposed to be around for things like that? And what would Pops do if he were at home? Can you bend your elbow? Biddy pressed her fingers into Pop's ribs, a spot Andrew hadn't even thought about checking. Pops looked up to Andrew, then back to Biddy and shook his head. I went to grab the damn remote. Biddy held up her hand. Did you let the staff know? Pop's face flushed red. No. Before Andrew knew what was happening, Biddy called for the nurse, but she turned to Pops. What were you thinking? How long had Pops been sitting there in that chair in pain? When was the last time someone came around to make sure you're all right? He's a big boy, Biddy said sternly at Andrew, 
She put her fists on her hips and faced Pop. Do you want to get a blood clot? Pop sat up straight, but then winced in pain. It's not his fault he fell, Andrew said to the older woman. What was her problem anyway? Someone should be watching him. She didn't say anything but turned to face Pops. Does everyone in your family talk about you like you're an invalid? Andrew almost shot back a harsh retort when he saw Pop's expression. He looked at Biddy with a quiet gratitude, as though the acknowledgement of being seen meant everything to him at that moment. Yes, he said straight away. Andrew's heart dropped. I'll go see where the nurse is. You do that, Biddy said. She turned back to Pop's. You know you have to take care of yourself. Why didn't you call a nurse? Andrew wanted to hear the answer, but he didn't wait. He rushed to the counter down the corridor where a set of nurses sat. Can we help you, sir? My grandfather, he seems to have fallen, he said, pointing toward the room. The other nurse took off toward Pop's room. Is he still on the floor? Andrew shook his head, following the nurse to the room. Pops sat there, rocking in the chair, holding his newly injured arm with his other casted one. Andrew turned to Biddy. I don't know how I can thank you. My pleasure. She smiled, holding Pops' hand, who didn't seem to mind. But when the nurse began her examination, she turned to Andrew and said, How about we take a step out while the nurse checks your Pops? Biddy stood up, picking up her purse. She turned to Pops. We'll be back. Right, Andrew said, following Biddy out of the room. Why did you feel you had to protect her? She asked. His stomach dropped when she said it. He had hoped she'd had forgotten about it. He stuffed his phone into his back pocket and took in a deep breath. If he told the truth, he'd be risking his sister's reputation. He didn't know this woman. Would she spread his story across the island? It certainly wasn't big. A story about a cheating fiancé would spread faster than the tide rolling in. I have no good reason, he said. He'd take the risk of looking like an idiot once again. He had no chance with Harper anyway, so why not just finish it off? Biddy looked him over like one looking over a piece of meat at the deli. He felt like a wobbly slice of chicken. I get it, she said. Andrew didn't know what she got, but he didn't say anything to the contrary. Harper told me about the reunion, about your sister's ex, Biddy said. Ex, he said with a huff. Is that what he told Harper? Biddy's curiosity peaked. What do you mean? Aren't they broken up? Andrew could feel his heart pumping faster in his chest. He could feel Joel's betrayal before this woman even told him. If he continued this conversation, he'd find out the truth, which meant he'd have to tell Lila. Why did he even protect this relationship? How would he tell her? And would Lila just stay with him anyway? Harper seems to think Dr. Schaefer is a good man, Biddy said. Biddy watched him waiting for his reaction. His heart pounded in anger. Good man, Joel Schaefer was a creep. Andrew decided there was no point in hiding it all anymore. I asked Harper to leave the lobster bake because Joel came with my sister that night. He could see the situation unfolding in her head. Oh. In this scenario, Harper would become the other woman. Something like that spreading around an island as small as Martha's Vineyard would destroy Harper. If what he feared was true. I think I should go, Biddy said. Tell your grandfather it was good seeing him again. Does my mother have your number? He asked. Now more than ever, he agreed with his mother. Pops did need someone to watch after him. And he certainly liked this woman. Biddy shook her head. I think I need to find something a bit more permanent. Please reconsider. My mother will pay you generously. 
Sonia Whitmore would never let anyone say she was cheap, especially not someone who worked for her. I'm afraid there are some things you can't buy, she said, putting her purse over her shoulder. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Tell Harper I'm sorry, he said. I never meant to hurt her feelings. Biddy didn't say anything. She just gave him a nod and left. Chapter 13 Harper climbed the stairs to her dad's apartment and could hear Phil Collins blasting from the stereo. That meant Charlie was in a cleaning mood. Before Evelyn moved to the island, Harper would come to the apartment each morning for coffee or to work in the bookstore. Looking back, there weren't too many days in her childhood or adult life that she hadn't seen her dad. But today, Harper realized she hadn't come over in a while. The routine had scattered and disappeared, and she hardly noticed. When had she stopped coming? When she'd gotten her paycheck from the publishing house and had quit working with Charlie. Then Renee and Charlie had turned the bookstore into a bakery. She would help, but she wasn't officially an employee. Harper didn't need a job, unless she couldn't find a cheap place to live. Now she'd have to dip into her savings for first, last, and deposit. Hey, Dad, she yelled out, walking into the kitchen. As she stepped inside, the first thing she noticed were the boxes. Harper, he called from the bedroom. Yeah, she said back, stepping around piles of books and picture frames. She pulled back one of the cardboard box's lids and peeked inside. More books, a lamp, a few knickknacks. What's going on? she asked, shutting the lid and moving to the next box. Then from the corner of her eye, she saw a box with Harper written across the side. I'm finally going through everything and figuring out what to keep, what to toss. Charlie walked out of the bedroom. He wore his favorite baseball hat and shirt that he would wear while painting. Are you planning on renting the place out? She wondered how she could tell him the truth. Your baby messed up again. You need to save her again. She should write a story of a daughter who could never figure out how to live life, who was too afraid to start writing or call a cute doctor. How could people love her if her own mother didn't? Charlie shook his head. We're going to make this into storage and office space. Harper's mouth went dry. Office space? She looked around her childhood home. She had grown up here, getting over her mother's absence, becoming a teenager, dealing with boys, going to school, figuring herself out, and writing. She loved to write in the nooks and crannies of the old Victorian building. Charlie gave her a sympathetic look, but then immediately pointed to the box with her name on it. I put the rest of your things in that box. She walked over and pulled off the lid. Inside sat years of yearbooks, letters, journals, and diaries. Her whole childhood stuffed into a box. Thanks, she said. She didn't know if she was being a brat, but she was upset he had packed it up without asking her to come and do it. Those were her private things. And what about all the other things around the apartment? Had he tossed items that she might have wanted to keep? Have you thrown out a lot? Charlie shook his head. No, I figured you'd want to go through everything. She looked around, still feeling a stab of frustration. Why didn't you call me sooner? I would have helped you. Charlie looked at Harper and smiled. I think I needed to do this part on my own, you know. I've lived here most of my life. Me too, she said, walking over to a box with Martha written on it. What are you going to do with Aunt Martha's stuff? I'm still working on my manuscript, so... He shrugged. I think I'll keep it in the attic. I thought it would be better to give you your stuff instead of lugging it up there. Harper wondered if Charlie noticed her heart slightly tearing. Was that what being an adult was all about? Dealing with the pain of loss? Moving on from her childhood and letting go of the only security she'd ever had? Harper looked down at the half-filled box of mementos, feeling half-full herself. 
Yes, of course. She noticed the picture tucked underneath, and a rage came over her. This isn't mine. She pulled it out, the only family picture they had, and tossed it on top of one of Charlie's boxes. Come on, Harper, Charlie said. He picked up the photograph. Charlie, Tanya, and Harper sat together at the San Diego Zoo. She was two. Don't you want this? Even though she wasn't looking at the picture, she had the image burned into her mind. Harper swore she even remembered being there with her mom. But she knew it was probably because she had studied the picture for so long that her mind was playing tricks on her. Or like her psychologist professor had said, the mind remembers firsts and lasts. Harper didn't remember any other happy family photographs after that, so it must have been her last. That means more to you than it does me, she said. Her fake bravado usually didn't work with Charlie. Usually her dad saw right through her exterior armor, but today Charlie seemed oblivious. Then suddenly his eyebrows furrowed. You want to tell me what's going on with you? Did he know about the apartment? Had Evelyn told him about her writer's block? What do you mean? I heard something about you dating a doctor, Charlie asked. Harper forgot she hadn't told her dad. She usually always told her dad everything. She shrugged. Just a date. Will there be another? Charlie asked. Harper shrugged again hesitant for some reason. A few months ago, she would have spilled everything. But as she stood there among boxes, her childhood packed up. Charlie was the last person she wanted to talk to about all of it. He cocked his head as if surprised she wasn't offering up more. Well, how about the book? You still having trouble? Evelyn told him, Harper said in her head. She looked at Charlie his face creased with worry. Now, just like she thought, he was worried about her. I'm afraid you must have gotten that writing hiccup from me, he said. He sat down on the couch holding the photograph. Then he looked up at her. You sure there isn't anything else bothering you? Harper shook her head. No, why? She tried to make her voice sound cheery and light. I actually had a really good talk with Evelyn and have figured some things out. She lied with no trouble, but immediately felt guilty. Why was she behaving this way? Because her problems would soon be Charlie's problems. He'd focus his attention on her, even sacrificing the happiest moments of his life to help her. I'm good, Dad, she said in the cheeriest voice. Really? He didn't look so sure, but he put the photograph on the coffee table. You know, you should visit your mother. I can't afford a trip to California. Harper didn't know where this was coming from. Charlie had never suggested something like visiting Tanya. Maybe seeing your mother will be a good thing, he said. Harper considered his proposition. Charlie was already worried about her. Are you concerned about me? I've noticed a change since the novel came out, Charlie said. I'm sorry I'm not a number one hit, she said at him, her voice harsh. Charlie cocked his head like he did when she was being ridiculous. Harper, you think I don't know what you're going through? Your debut hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Harper couldn't believe he was going there. They're only keeping me on because of Evelyn. She knew the truth. Her numbers were a huge disappointment. They had expected the next twilight, when all they had gotten was barely a spark of interest. Her reviews weren't bad, but they weren't run out and buy Harper Marin's book. It was more like, if you come across it, check it out, but don't go out of your way. She did have super fans, readers who loved her descriptions with her character's emotions, the setting, the way she brought everything to a satisfying outcome while leaving the reader with just a little nugget for the next installment. She didn't want to come up with excuses because the truth was, good or bad, 
It didn't seem to work. She wasn't a commercial writer. She wasn't an Evelyn Rose, that was for sure. She wondered if Evelyn was disappointed that her protege was unable to lock in her magic. You should invite him to the wedding, Charlie said. The wedding? The statement came so out of the blue that Harper had forgotten what he might be talking about. She must have shown her confusion, because Charlie said, You know, the doctor. Then she remembered he was talking about Renee and Mateo's wedding. Harper thought about it. Everyone in her life had their plus one. Harper would be the only one without a date. Biddy was different. She was perfectly happy being by herself. Plus, she had her plus one. Harper hadn't even dated that much. She hadn't really needed a plus one because she always had Charlie. Maybe, she said. She pointed at the box marked with her name. I'll take that with me. Harper picked up the box, half full with her childhood. Do you need help carrying it out? Charlie asked. She shook her head. It isn't that heavy. I'm fine on my own. Harper turned and left the apartment. Her fallback plan when things got worse. But things were suddenly much worse than she had originally thought. Chapter 14 Biddy sat in the sunroom with Harper as she told her about the apartment. Talk to Charlie, Biddy kept telling the young woman, but the girl's pride was bigger than the bunion on Biddy's big toe. Biddy adored Harper. But sometimes, as much as someone thought they needed help, they really just wanted to sit and stew for a while. Harper was in that sitting and stewing phase. He'll think he needs to take care of me like I'm a child, Harper said. With a hint of a whine in her tone, Biddy noted. It'll cause extra stress on his relationship with Evelyn, Harper continued. It had been the third time Harper had mentioned the relationship between Charlie and Evelyn. Biddy felt for Harper. Harper had had Charlie all to herself for all this time. Only children didn't like having to share their parent. Biddy knew all about that. Look, Harper, Biddy began. What's going to cause your father not to trust you and think you can't handle things is keeping this from him. Tell him. Tell him now before he gets further into packing. I'm not going back there, Biddy. Harper shook her head. Even if I have to stay on the streets, I can't end up there again. It will allow you some breathing room. Biddy wanted to tell this young lady she was being unreasonable. She had a family that would help her in a heartbeat if they knew. Harper chose to endure this stress. On the other hand, Biddy recognized the determination of this young spitfire. She saw quite a bit of herself in her. Too dumb and determined to do something on her own, she didn't see what was right in front of her. There's something I have to tell you. Biddy said, wishing she wasn't the one who brought more bad news to the already anxious and upset Harper. What is it? Harper immediately went into panic mode. Is something wrong? Biddy inhaled. I got offered a job. Harper smiled wide. That's great. Biddy gave a nod, but then said, Yes, well, it's for the Whitmore family. She could tell Harper didn't make the connection at first, the name given out of context. But then, like a light bulb turning on, she figured it out. The Whitmores? Doing what? A crease formed between Harper's eyebrows, and Biddy didn't know how she was going to break this young woman's heart. Just like the situation with Drake, being the messenger of truth might cause her relationship with Harper to end and Biddy had really become fond of Harper. I was asked to take care of Mrs. Whitmore's father. Biddy wanted to sound official for some reason. Andrew's grandfather. That's great. Harper's tone did not indicate as so. I didn't take the job, Biddy said. Her heart started racing. This confused Harper. Why not? I met with Andrew. 
who explained the lobster bake situation, Biddy said, stopping the story. She could feel a heaviness of dread draining through her stomach and down her legs. Honey, are you still seeing that doctor? Harper shrugged. I haven't really heard from him. Why? Biddy inhaled and put her hands on Harper's. I think you need to have a word with him. What do you mean? Harper, Biddy realized, would need it explained. She didn't usually deal with liars and cheaters. She didn't catch the red flags. Biddy looked at Harper. If she'd had a daughter, she'd want one exactly as her. Sweet, innocent, strong, and determined. Andrew mentioned that his sister and the doctor may be back together. Biddy let the words sink in. Harper looked at Biddy, and Biddy could see her processing the information, but Harper said nothing. Andrew indicated that was why he wanted you to leave. Biddy made a face, trying to break Harper's stare and read what was going on in that mind of hers. They're back together? Harper exhaled a long, deep breath. I think maybe she thought they were together, but he told me they broke up before the lobster bake. Maybe talk to him. Biddy was the one who shrugged now. She didn't know if she had the whole story, but the young man believed what he was saying. Biddy raised her hands. I just thought I'd let you know what he said. Harper nodded. Thanks. But she sounded sour and confused and conflicted. I should go. Biddy reached out and squeezed Harper's hand. Stay with me for the afternoon. Let's have margaritas and sit by the waves. The ocean always helped a sour situation. But Harper shook her head. No, I've got writing to do. Stay here. Wait for your parents to get home. Biddy purposefully used the plural. Ask them if you can stay in the cottage until you can find something you can afford. Harper's mouth opened, about to argue, but Biddy raised her finger up in the air. You have these people around you because they love you and want to help. Parents always want to help their children, no matter how old they are. Biddy watched as Harper's face twisted, her eyes moistening and Biddy wanted to grab hold of her and squeeze her with love. Harper blew out a breath. You should take the job. Biddy was surprised Harper's thoughts were on her. I'd have to check more into it, but I wouldn't want to make you uncomfortable. Harper nodded. Don't worry about me. This is what you were looking for. Take it. Biddy smiled at the selflessness. Will you talk to your parents? Harper nodded. But instead of staying and listening to Biddy's advice, Harper said her goodbyes and left Seaview. Biddy didn't sleep well that night, tossing and turning about what she should do. Should she betray Harper's trust and tell Evelyn what was going on? And was she betraying Evelyn by not confiding in her about her soon-to-be stepdaughter? Or should she allow this young lady to figure things out on her own, as an adult, like she had asked? The next morning, when Wanda was dropped off by Marty, she almost confessed her secret to Evelyn and Wanda then, but she hesitated when Wanda started talking about adopting a puppy. I've always wanted a dog, and Marty had dogs his whole life, up until recently. The walk ended up being short the weather cooler than expected, and the wind strong. When they returned back to Seaview, Charlie was waiting with Stan and Marty. The two couples talked about the planned adoption. We want to get a camper so we can travel with Stan, Evelyn said to Marty, who had told them he would take his dogs on his boat. Biddy watched from the outside. The two women who helped put her feet back on the ground deserved this happiness. She needed to get over this pang of jealousy and get her head out of her tush. So what she didn't have a man? She'd be fine. She'd always been fine because she had to be. Richard was gone. Her son didn't want anything to do with her. 
Sea View had always been a temporary situation. She left the couples in the kitchen and went to her room. From inside her wallet, she pulled out Sonia's card and gave her a call. He lives right in Cliffside Point. Sonia didn't even ask what had changed Biddy's mind. I'll meet you there in an hour. Biddy drove over to Randall Martin's home, which happened to be a couple miles away from Seaview. She pulled up to a mid-century ranch that sat on a nice-sized lot. The yard looked manicured and taken care of. She noticed a large branch on the ground. Must have been the branch that helped Randy fall. As Biddy got out of the car and up to the stoop, Sonia and a young woman came out to meet her at the front door. Biddy, Sonia said as Biddy approached the front stoop. I'm so glad you called. Good morning, Mrs. Whitmore, Biddy said, holding out her hand. She passed over a folder with a copy of her nursing license, work history, and job references. You'll find my information in there. Sonia, please, she turned to the young woman. This is my daughter, Lila. Biddy recognized the name immediately. She couldn't help but notice how beautiful Lila was. But like her mother, she was all done up. Her hair blown out and stiff, her makeup thick and perfect, her fingernails painted up. Biddy held out her hand, and Lila limply held out hers. Biddy? Thank you for reconsidering, Sonia said. Biddy! called out a man's voice. Come on in! Sonia rolled her eyes and stepped aside, saying, My father's in the family room in the back of the house. Biddy walked into a front hall and followed Lila to a family room where Randy sat in a recliner. Randy waved her in, patting the armrest of the couch next to him. Hello again, he said. Aren't I lucky to have such a beautiful visitor? She smiled. The old dog had a spark, that was for sure. No dirty magazines today, she asked, and Randy let out a chuckle. I'm afraid my conservative daughter threw them away. He winked at her. Don't tell me. She told you I need help. Biddy smiled, noticing the bruises had begun to heal nicely. How are you feeling? I'm fine, he said, but he didn't move in his seat. Can I get you anything? Sonia asked. Biddy shook her head. I'm fine. I'm looking for someone to help with day-to-day, -day mostly, Sonia said. Help with cooking, cleaning, that sort of thing. I don't need anybody babysitting me, Randy said over her. My father wants to stay in his home, but it's too big for him to take care of, and he should have someone around in case he were to fall again. Sonia was all business, talking about Randy as though he wasn't sitting right there in front of the two. Obviously, he needs nursing care for the time being, but I'd like to have someone here permanently. Babysitting me, Randy grumbled. Staying in the house, Sonia said. As Biddy noticed a magazine hiding behind the pillow of his chair, she realized she had no idea who this man was. And there will be housing available? Biddy asked. Sonia nodded. There's an in-law apartment off the kitchen. Biddy looked out the window of Randy's family room. The house sat perched on a hill overlooking the valleys of Cliffside Point. She could see the white sands of Sugar Beach off in the distance and just make out the lighthouse. Was she up for being someone's maid? Especially one who didn't want her around? He'd probably end up firing her once he got better. But what other options did Biddy have at this point? I'm happy to help. Chapter 15 Harper wished she did write that afternoon like she had told Biddy. If she had written, then she wouldn't have been perseverating on the fact she wasn't sure what to think of Andrew's story. Throughout high school, Andrew had been a show-off, know-it-all, that was too good for everybody. He had basked in the glory of being the school newspaper editor, bragged about being accepted into the best journalism program in the country, 
and even laughed at Harper showing up to prom by herself. But she had never known Andrew to lie. Not that she had known Joel to lie either. She went down the rabbit hole of social media, looking up every post by Lila. Every photograph was filtered and edited to look trendy and magical. She had pics of her and her friends on luxury boats and private jets and hanging out by pools. Every post had hashtags of clever, cool sayings like hashtag blondes have more fun or hashtag happiness is a mindset. Harper also paid attention to how many of those beautiful faces happened to be Joel's. There were pictures of them hanging out on the beach, of the engagement, on amazing destination vacations, and sitting in front of a fire with matching ugly sweaters at Christmas time. Who was lying? And that's what she was thinking when a text from Joel lit up her phone. She didn't even hesitate grabbing it and opening it up to read. Thinking about catching dinner on the beach. Would you like to join me? Then he sent a photograph of a surf and turf plate on top of a red and white checkered tablecloth. Just a day ago, her heart would have been pounding with excitement. Now, like with all things in Harper's life, she doubted everything. This was when she missed her friendship with Matteo the most. When she needed to talk to someone, unbiased. Someone level-headed and clear-headed. Marin's thought in the clouds. That was their nature. She was the dreamer, and he was the sensibility. God, she missed him. She looked at the text from Joel, and then she remembered a collage of photographs Lila had posted most recently. A dinner of surf and turf at the wharf. Harper went to the post and stared at the exact same photo Joel had sent her. Guess she found her liar. Chapter 16 Do you think Tanya's read it? Evelyn couldn't imagine not reading her daughter's published book. She'd be so proud. She'd buy the first hundred copies and pass them out to whoever wanted one. She of all people understood the magnitude of it all. Pouring your heart onto the page, bleeding through the words, it was taxing even to the most professional of authors. Then to let go. She couldn't. She had read about authors never reading the reviews, but she had read every single one of them. Thousands of them. She knew what the college lit chick thought about her lack of knowledge on all things yachting. How Jerry would have liked to see more of a plot and less romance. Didn't Jerry know she was a romance author? Didn't the chick-lit cover of a middle-aged woman standing on the edge of the ocean not give it away? Oh, poor Harper. How could Tanya not read it? Charlie nodded, looking off like he did when thinking of hard times. It was as though he could see the memories flash through his head. She was never good about keeping in touch, and Harper refused to make any effort. Charlie made a face. When the courts didn't make it mandatory, I didn't force her anymore. She couldn't imagine. What if we invited her to the wedding? Evelyn thought about the discomfort, but wouldn't it be worth helping that relationship? Harper clearly had unresolved issues with Tanya. I don't think that's a good idea, Charlie said. I think sometimes fear is scarier than reality. Harper has been rejected over and over, Charlie said, a bit harsher than Evelyn had expected, and she could see she had hit a nerve. Oh, geez, Evelyn immediately felt bad. I didn't mean to sound judgmental. I'm sorry. Charlie nodded, but an awkward silence hung in the air. Tanya's not invited to my house, Charlie said. This surprised Evelyn. Charlie had seemed as though their co-parenting hadn't been hostile, but just distant. Really? Evelyn waited for more of an explanation. But when Charlie offered nothing, she asked, Why? One rotten apple can sour the bunch. It was a comment. Evelyn held up her hands. Look, maybe I'm crossing a line here, and maybe I'm wrong. 
But my mother's intuition is running hot with Harper. She's hiding something. She just started dating this new guy, Charlie said. She always gets giddy when she's dating someone new. It's not about a guy. Evelyn needed Charlie to notice. Like a where's Waldo, once he saw the problem, he'd notice it. She's in trouble, I think. His forehead creased in concern. What do you mean? Red flags. That's all she had at this point. Honestly, it's what she's not saying. She's saying she's fine, but she's not sharing anything about this new guy. She's not talking like usual. She's quiet and a bit closed off. She waited and watched Charlie as he listened. She took in a deep breath. She's in trouble, in a sense that she might be in over her head with things. I know she missed a couple deadlines with Catherine. Charlie's eyes acknowledged what that meant, with just a flicker of movement. I'll talk to her. She placed her hands on his arms. I don't think it's just about the writing. I think it's everything. She's had a really crazy year with the debut, and I think our relationship is hard for her. Evelyn waited for Charlie's usual response to this point. She loves you. She already considers you family. I love her too. Evelyn said her usual bit. That's why I think she should at least see Tanya. Maybe not at the wedding, but at least as our guest. We can open up our home to her. She's Harper's family, which in turn makes us family. Charlie stared at her. He took her hands in both of his and kissed her on the lips. You are absolutely insane. She smiled as he kissed her again. I know. He looked at her quizzically, narrowing his eyes as though trying to figure her out. Does Harper want Tanya here? Harper didn't get in the picture. The moment had been over before she had even noticed Harper off in the dark corner of the room, watching them finish taking family pictures the night of the engagement. What had surprised Evelyn was how she had stayed off in the distance, hidden from the rest of them, as though she didn't fit in. She thought Harper knew she adored her, and the girls adored her as well. They couldn't wait to have a new sister as part of the gang. But if Evelyn hadn't noticed that one moment, she would have missed it. Because Harper was good at storytelling, but not better than Evelyn. Biddy's been hanging around Harper. So I think she's getting solid advice, Evelyn said. But even Biddy's staying mute on things. Seems as though there's something going on. Charlie processed the information, playing with his day-old scruff, like a mature George Clooney. Dang, he's handsome, she thought to herself. I think you need to talk to Harper about Tanya, because I'd have nothing nice to say. Charlie kissed Evelyn on the cheek. But I can talk to her about the rest. Evelyn kissed him again as they stood in her kitchen. Get a room, you two, Renee said as she walked into the kitchen with George. George, you ready for the beach with Grandpa? Charlie asked. George wrangled out of Renee's arms and down her legs before crawling straight to Charlie. Should we ask Stan if he wants to come with us? Ugh. George said seriously to Charlie, raising his arms up, indicating he wanted to be picked up. Charlie bent down and lifted him into his arms. Guess what, y'all? Biddy boomed her voice. I'm moving out. What do you mean you're moving out? Evelyn couldn't believe this. When? Biddy laughed. Tonight. What? Evelyn was clearly surprised. I found a job, Biddy answered, for at least a few weeks, but it's something for me to earn some extra money until I figure out my next step. You know you can always stay here, Evelyn had said it a million times. I know, Biddy tilted her head to the side, like she had a million times. You've always been so gracious, but this is something I need to do for myself. Where? Renee asked. 
packing up a bag for George. Here on the island, Biddy said. Oh, that's great, Renee said. I thought you found something far away. What will you be doing? I'm basically a caretaker for an elderly man in Vineyard Haven. Biddy explained the whole story, leaving the details about Harper out. Wow, Evelyn said. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. The house has a separate in-law suite where I'll stay, Biddy said. But I'll be there to make sure he's taken care of. Who's the family? Charlie asked, holding George out as though he were flying like Superman. The Whitmores. Charlie seemed impressed. I know the family. They run a charity here in town for the veterans. Yeah? Biddy looked impressed. Well, we'll see. Randy, Sonia's father, doesn't seem too thrilled I'm coming and staying. Evelyn felt grateful to have her people in her life, grateful to have friendships that meant so much, a support system that kept her afloat. As she looked at Biddy, Evelyn knew she felt the same way, and that bond meant more to her than anything. Biddy looked happy, excited even. This is great, Evelyn said, but she couldn't help but be concerned. Biddy's relationship with her son had been straining for the past year, and it seemed to only be getting worse. Not to mention that Biddy's financial situation appeared to be in trouble if she was looking for work at 63. And then there was Richard's family situation. I swore George was flying above the house, Biddy said to the women, referring to Evelyn's late husband and her belief that he talked to her through birds. It seemed to just come together perfectly. Evelyn wondered if he had been watching out. She needed Biddy close by. She may be getting married and seemed to have it all together, but it was only because she had the support of her friends and family. You're our family, and we need you near us. This is perfect. Biddy squeezed her hand, then Evelyn squeezed it back. It was a sisterhood Evelyn had thought only existed in her novels. Wanda and Biddy even her daughters now, allowed Evelyn to be vulnerable and share her shame, but also feel loved and accepted, no matter what her choices. Oh, guys, you can't get rid of me, Biddy said it with an accent of what she thought sounded like a New Englander. Evelyn helped Biddy pack. Not everything, since Evelyn convinced Biddy that her room would always be her room, and to leave some essentials behind just in case. When Renee drove Biddy to the new job, Evelyn was alone in Seaview for the first time in a long time. She had a bittersweet feeling in her chest, sort of the same feeling she'd had when she bought the place. She was ending a phase of life she loved and starting a new exciting one she looked forward to. She walked from room to room, memories floating through her head. When the girls got to their teenage years, like all teenagers, they began to pull away, and it had broken Evelyn's heart. The more they had pulled, the more she had squeezed tight. One night, after having a huge fight with Renee about something stupid like taking out the trash or washing the dishes, George had pulled her aside and said, She's not the only one changing. You are as well. What's that supposed to mean? You're expecting more of her, asking more, demanding more he said. Evelyn got defensive right away. She's 14. She should be doing this without me having to nag. Evelyn, you never nagged her about the dishes before, George said. She's changing, but so are your expectations of her. Maybe if I weren't always the bad guy, I wouldn't need to always be the one to nag. The moment the words came out, Evelyn regretted it. But like any wife of 15 years, she dug her heels in, not about to give up the fight, because she also believed it. George always got to be the good guy. He only had short spurts with the kids, so without communicating it as much, she had taken on the heavy-duty parenting, discipline, school events, etc., and George had gotten to swoop in and be the fun parent. George had been the cool dad, 
who showed up to every sixth game, but got greeted by the team. Evelyn had been the buzzkill, the enforcer, the one to remind them to do things. Being passive-aggressive toward me isn't going to fix what's going on with you and Renee. George had sounded like Dr. Rose instead of her husband, which had completely irritated her. George, I'm not your patient. She'd blown out a long breath. I seem to be your punching bag, he'd said, a bit of hurt in his eyes. He had only offered to help by listening, and she had attacked him. Punching bag? Really? Evelyn had rolled her eyes. George had seemed to be more dramatic than her that night. But then she'd seen the hurt in his eyes. Sorry. Me too. He had stood next to her in the kitchen, next to the sudsy sink, and bumped his hip into her. I'm sorry she's hurting your feelings. She's a teenager, trying to find her way and figure out who she is outside of you. Our girls are so lucky to have you guiding them, always here for them. George had held her shoulders. But this is good. You want your daughter to grow up. Being responsible is good, but is it worth ruining your relationship for? Renee's a great kid, and sometimes she forgets to take out the trash. He was right, of course, Evelyn thought to herself, as she walked through Renee's room in Seaview. She wished George could see the women their daughters had become. Renee had created a successful business, was a wonderful mother, and seemed to have found true happiness with Matteo. Her grandson had been the greatest blessing of her life. Samantha studied architecture in graduate school. She had a great relationship with a very kind guy. Evelyn couldn't be prouder to be their mother. But mostly, she was proud she had kept doing her job as a mother, even after losing George. Even after she thought things weren't fixable, things had come together perfectly. She looked down at her ring. She had even found happiness again. She'd found true friendships she had never experienced before. Plus, Wanda had found Marty and... Now Biddy had this new job. Soon, Seaview would be hers and Charlie's and Stan's. Tears burned the backs of her eyes, and a sob escaped her chest. Evelyn was happy. People changed and grew up, and she didn't need Biddy here anymore. That's what all that hard work had been for. So why was she so sad? Chapter 17 Renee drove Biddy to Randy's house and pulled up to a silver Land Rover that sat in the driveway. This was not Randy's vehicle. Let me help you, Renee said from the driver's seat. Biddy looked out at the front door. No, I'm good. Biddy opened the door, pulling out her bags from Renee's van. But as Biddy got out and stood in the walkway, she wasn't sure if she had made the right choice. She wasn't a spring chicken anymore. Would she be able to handle caring for a stranger? What if he had night terrors, or really was a dirty dog? What if he was dangerous? She had no way of knowing. Biddy! Sonia wore an outfit that reminded Biddy of something she'd see on The Real Housewives. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. We'll see how Randy feels about me in a few days, Biddy joked noticing a new large diamond ring on the woman's finger. Biddy extended her hand. Sonia took Biddy's like one would do if they were royalty. Sonia gave Biddy another look. Your accent isn't from around here. No, I'm from Nashville, she asked. No, Oklahoma, Biddy said. Oh, so close. Sonia clasped her hands together and said, Anyway, like I said, we'll need you to help with the cleaning, dad's meals, appointments, things like that. I've got a day nurse coming in during the week. If you need a weekend off, I'll need to know in advance so I can make arrangements. Sonia waved at Biddy to have her follow her inside the house. You'll be staying in the in-law suite, which is right off the kitchen and family room. Where to? 
She held up her bags. Down the hall through the kitchen, the first door on the right. Randy's house wasn't as big as the other houses on Martha's Vineyard, but by Oklahoma standards, it was still pretty darn big. Off the kitchen, like Sonia had said, was an in-law suite stocked with a mini-fridge, a two-burner stove, and a small sink. There was a couch with a small two-chair table. Through a door was a bedroom with a double-sized bed and a nightstand. The white walls had two nautical oil paintings of ships in perilous weather on what she guessed was the Atlantic. She dropped her bags and walked the perimeter of the room. A back door led to a small patio with two chairs along with windows facing the backyard. Through the trees and a few houses, she could see the water. She opened the door and stepped outside. Crossing her fingers, she'd hear the waves. She stood there listening. And very faintly, she could hear the water rolling up to shore. The moment was bittersweet. Biddy was excited about her next journey. It felt good to no longer be living off someone's generosity, not Richard's or his children's or Evelyn's. For the first time in years, Biddy was on her own. But Biddy was on her own. Randy wasn't the girls or her family or Richard. She didn't want to deal with Randy's family or miss out on all the happenings at Seaview. She didn't want to have run-ins with Lila or her mother. She second-guessed everything. She was 63. What was she doing? She decided to get the ground rules underway before she unpacked and headed back to the main part of the house. She looked around. It seemed surface clean, as though someone had tried to keep up but didn't do much more than just the visible surfaces. She didn't blame Randy, but didn't his daughter have enough money to hire a housekeeper? The baseboards were covered in dust. The windows looked like they hadn't been cleaned in years. The floors looked dingy. Cobwebs hung in the corner. Dust bunnies were everywhere. She carried a whiteboard along with the calendar. I'd like to go over a few things while you're still here, she said to Sonia and Randy. Of course, Sonia said, but she had to put her Birkin bag down. Let's start with daily activities, then move to medication, and if you're up for it, exercises. There's no way I'm exercising, Randy grumbled. So you want to keep falling? Sonia snapped back at him. Biddy couldn't hide a smile. Your daughter's right. Exercise will help keep the muscles you need to stay balanced. I know how much medication I need to take, he said, pointing toward the kitchen. I take something for my blood pressure. What about clubs, groups, activities you'd like me to help you attend? She asked. Dad used to go out on his boat and fish some, but I'm afraid it's too much now. Biddy could see the heartbreak in Randy's eyes. I won't sell her, Randy said. Andrew will change his mind and want to keep it. She smiled thinking of Randy in his retirement, fishing on the water. What do you like to catch? Everything. He looked beyond her, as if lost in happy memories. I'd drop lobster pots, try to nap bluefish, or striped bass. Oh, I love the fresh fish out here, but man, do I miss Oklahoma steaks. That I would love to experience. Randy looked up at the ceiling. Biddy made a note to call Richard's son, ask if he could send some of his own steaks out. He at least owed her that much. What else would you like to eat for dinner? Biddy had to admit she had been spoiled over the past year. Everyone cooked at the house, and it was rarely her. Cooking had been the hardest part of parenting. Coming up with a meal every day, with hardly any thanks, mostly complaints, even after the prep, the cooking, the cleanup, she didn't want to cook for everyone again. I'm happy to help with the daily cleaning, but I think you should hire a housekeeper, someone who can keep up with the place. Randy nodded. I never really liked the idea of someone coming into the house. 
It's better than cleaning the toilets yourself. Biddy looked around the room and noticed family pictures hanging on the wall. My Linda would have loved you, he said, handing over a framed wedding photo. Why, don't you look debonair. Biddy meant it, too. Randy looked very handsome in his tuxedo, and his bride was gorgeous, just as she expected. I bought this place on our fifth anniversary, when I got assistant district attorney. He looked at the house. We moved full time when I retired. Sonia stood up and draped her very expensive purse back on her wrist. I'm going to head out now. If you need anything, just call. It turned out Biddy enjoyed Randy's company. He had the game playing while they went over their calendar. He had very few requests. Church every Sunday, dinner on TV trays if the Red Sox were playing, and jazz. Randy liked all kinds of jazz. Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Herbie Hancock, and more names she didn't recognize herself. Country's a lot like jazz and the blues, Biddy said. I once saw Etta James, and she sang these beautiful country songs. He nodded. Don't even get me started on Ella Fitzgerald. She laughed, looking at the older man feeling a bit relieved he was so agreeable with her. Tell me where you're from, Randy said. He appeared interested in what she had to say. I'm from Oklahoma. Hmm. He pointed his index finger at her from his good side. I can hear it. I grew up on a cattle ranch, but lived mostly in the suburbs, she said. My daddy sent me to my aunt's place in Tulsa during the school year after my mother died. Better schools. Biddy had hated leaving the family ranch, hated leaving her daddy alone even more. Each day she worried he'd get hurt. Each night she prayed he'd be okay. After losing her mother from a horrific accident, she feared she'd lose her daddy too. Ranchers had accidents all the time. The stress caused heart attacks and strokes, and then the worst had happened. Tulsa's a great little city, Randy said. Knew a few guys from that area in law school. She wondered what kind of law Randy had practiced. He certainly hadn't made the money his daughter and son-in-law seemed to show off. His one-level ranch was modest, with no glitz and glam like the mansion she was at the other night. Where'd you attend school? she asked. Stanford, he answered proudly. But I grew up in Newton. She didn't know where Newton was, but she assumed it was somewhere in New England. No wonder you cheer for the Red Sox. She leaned toward the coffee table and turned on the television. Do you think a kid from Newton would cheer for the Yankees? He moved and winced. How about you take something for the pain, Biddy said. Time and time again, it would be the male patients who thought they were tough enough to get through the pain. I don't need anything. But he moaned it through clenched teeth, and his hand went to his shoulder. No? She leaned back, not willing to fight a stubborn old man, but she did do a good job at making patients think they were the ones who came up with the idea. It'd take her three moves. It's good to keep on top of the pain she said, flipping the channels to find the afternoon game at Fenway. It's channel four. Randy shook his finger at the television. Isn't the inflammation a way the body heals? She found the channel, and the Yankees were up to bat. She noted Randy, for the most part, was still very with it. Yes, but if the inflammation has gone on for some time... It's good to relieve some of it. You like baseball? Randy asked. Always love the game, she said. Reminds me of my daddy. He laughed. Me too. Sure would be nice to see a game someday, Biddy said. Always did want to see Fenway. Ah, uh, it's way overpriced. He grimaced as he shifted again. 
Randy did not seem like he was cut from the same cloth as his daughter's family. Sonia had been woven with silk, and he was a bit of burlap. She liked the old dog. Do you need to use the restroom? She asked. Need help? I'm fine. He narrowed his eyes at her, studying her. You sure you're a nurse and not a movie star? Is that your best line? Biddy couldn't hold back laughter. You really are something. Where do you live on the island? Why haven't I seen you before? Randy asked. Oh, I'm just staying for a little while. Then I'll probably be on my way, Biddy said. Don't tell me that's back in Oklahoma, he said. But then shouted at the television. Get your heads out of your rear ends. She noticed he flinched from the pain. Man, you're really feeling it if it hurts just to yell. She lifted her eyebrows. Want me to grab some of that pain medication? He looked at the television for a while, then put his hand on his shoulder. You know, I think that might be a good idea. When she went into the kitchen, Randy continued the conversation, shouting at her through the house. She opened the bottle and pulled two pills out as she walked into the living room. She set them on the television tray in front of Randy. Do you plan to stay on the island? He asked. Biddy let out a long, heavy exhale. Oh, Randy, that is the million-dollar question. She closed the bottle and took it back into the kitchen, setting it on the counter with the rest of his medication, which were still in the pharmacy bags, stapled closed. There's plenty of rattles here, Randy said. But Biddy was certain he had no idea what the rental situation on Martha's Vineyard was like. Biddy didn't have to guess. She couldn't afford it. Unfortunately, I'm looking for work during winter on an island for a nurse. She had put her name in for anything that came up. Maternity leaves, medical leaves, termination, anything, short-term, part-time. But she received nothing. I'm afraid no one wants to hire an old girl like myself. She put a broad smile on her face, but her emotions hit her faster than she could rein them in. Then the way Randy looked back at her with moisture in his own glossy eyes, it caught her breath, and she could feel her throat tighten up. Now come on, Randy. Cowboys aren't supposed to cry. It's hard getting old, Randy said, his voice wobbly. It sure is. The two turned to the game, and by the time the Red Sox got the lead, Biddy joined Randy in yelling at the television. The rest of the night had gone better than Biddy had expected. Randy seemed to be in good spirits, and to be honest, as much as she missed the girls and baby George, she was in good spirits as well. Randy reminded her of her grandfather. When he retreated to bed, she paid attention to his routine. When she went to bed, she thought she would have been happy and relieved. Biddy had a job. She got to stay on the island. She was making more money than she ever had. But something tugged at her heart. Like all things in Biddy's life, this wasn't permanent. What happened when Mr. Martin no longer needed her services? What then? Yes, Evelyn's door was always open. But Charlie would be moving in soon. Evelyn didn't need someone latching on. Biddy promised herself as she fell asleep to make a plan for what to do next, when things fell apart again. Chapter 18 The rain hit the fairy's window like the pebbles at the edge of the beach, where the land met with the sea. Andrew texted Pops first and heard nothing. His mother had mentioned that the nurse had changed her mind and would start right away, but... What that actually meant, he wasn't sure. Then he texted Lila for the seventh, no, eighth time that day. He had to tell her. When the ferry came closer to land, he'd call her. She didn't pick up. Reluctantly, he left a message. Hey, can you call me? 
I'm back on the island for a few days, and I'd hope to talk to you. He felt so stupid talking on her voicemail. Anyway, let me know if you're available. He felt even more stupid when he called again and it went straight to voicemail. Lila had declined his call. He brought his car to the island this time. He decided to stay longer than just his usual 24 hours. When the ferry reached the tiny port locals called Eastport Harbor, he could feel the stress from his newest story he had been working on, slightly ease. He never got used to the city, especially a carriage-designed city like Boston. The small, cumbersome, windy streets made him feel claustrophobic. The noises of traffic seemed to echo off the buildings, making Andrew on edge, especially when his story wasn't coming together. He drove directly to Pops, where he planned on staying for the time he was on the island. But now he wasn't so sure if that would be cool since the new nurse was there. His grandparents' house had been more of a home than the monstrosity his parents had built. His parents' house felt more like an exhibit, not a home. How's the story? Pops asked as soon as he arrived at the house. Pops had always been Andrew's biggest fan and supporter. Good. Andrew leaned in for a hug as Pops kissed him on the cheek. The gesture always made Andrew uneasy. Even though he loved that his grandfather felt that much love to kiss him, Whitmore's didn't do that kind of thing. They didn't show emotion or talk about it. They certainly didn't kiss on the cheek. He couldn't even remember the last time his father had given him more than a handshake. Andrew sat in his usual spot. No, it's terrible. Terrible. Pops inched forward in his recliner. What happened to your new lead? Another person suddenly decided to change their mind. Andrew sighed loudly, then heard a noise in the kitchen. I don't know where to go from here. If I can't prove Senator Holmes is asking for favors with judges, then I can't prove these sentences were lenient and not abiding to the law. Go back to the scene of the crime, Pops said. Find the weakest link. Cops, paramedics, young kids who don't know Holmes' ties and connections beyond surface stuff. I've been around since Chappaquiddick. I know how favors are made and how people look the other way. Pops, you didn't touch your salad. Lila walked into the living room holding a to-go container of salad. She stopped dead in the middle of the room and looked at Andrew. What are you doing here? Nice to see you too, Andrew said. There's too much of that stuff, Pop said. Lettuce? Vegetables? Lila said as though Pops was being unreasonable. Yes. Pops folded his arms against his chest. I'm 86 years old, and you want me to start eating vegetables now? Pops twisted his face at the idea. How long are you going to be on the island? Lila asked, while also typing on her phone. For a few days, Andrew said, focusing on the game on television. She walked to Pops and kissed him on the cheek. I'll have my phone on if you need anything, but I have an appointment I need to go to. She took off toward the door and Andrew jumped up from the couch to reach her. Lila, wait up! She stopped with her hand on the doorknob. I'll be back before he has to take his next medication. Where are you off to in such a hurry? He asked. I've been with Pops all day. I'm just tired. Lila sounded exhausted and looked it too. They got along, but spending that much time with both in foul moods was like throwing a lit match on gasoline. Where's the nurse? She went to the city to take her friend to a doctor's appointment or something. Lila hadn't looked at him the whole time she stood there. Lila, I need to talk to you, he said. He knew she'd been avoiding him. Lila finally looked at him, and he could read his twin sister like a book. Sadness and anger mixed with pain were written across her face. She knew exactly what he was about to tell her. Save it she said quickly. He already confessed. Oh. 
He wished he had made it as though that wasn't what he'd been about to tell her. That he hadn't been about to break her heart again. How many times had he been the bearer of bad news? How many times had he been the one who hadn't known what he was talking about? How many times had he just been jealous of what they had? He got a text from another woman at dinner. What did it say? Had Biddy told Harper? He was certain she had. How serious had Joel gotten with Harper? Lila scowled. Does it matter? He shook his head. It shouldn't matter, but it did. It said to stop texting. She let out a sigh. And when I asked him about why Harper Marin would be texting him and saying that, he told me this elaborate story with all the same story elements as the other times he had women texting him. She came on to him. She wouldn't stop texting him. He almost smiled at the thought of Harper texting that to Joel. You didn't believe him, did you? Andrew asked, realizing how insensitive he sounded. She shot him a look like he was the stupidest person on earth. Of course not. He promised it meant nothing. And then I got mad. He told me I was being ridiculous. That's called gaslighting. I just love him so much. And he really did love me. She sniffed. At least that's what I thought. Andrew didn't believe it. But it made Lila feel better, so he said nothing to the contrary. Is it over then? Mom and Dad will kill me, Lila said. Andrew rolled his eyes, and Lila continued. She'll be furious, all her country club friends gossiping about the daughter who amounted to nothing more than an empty spinster. I'm going to end up like the nurse who lives with Pops. So? Andrew looked back at the house. That lady is all sunshine and y'alls. It'd be better than living in a miserable marriage. He could tell she didn't think he was so sure. Then he took the big gun out. Joel will do it again. He always does. It wouldn't be the last time, even after that. Joel had no business staying with Lila. As Lila stood there, he waited for the tears to form, but she looked tired, too worn down to cry at that point. I love him as much as I hate him. She said it looking out, the wind practically covering up her words. She turned to face him and said, I'll talk to you later. Andrew wondered when the dominoes had fallen, when Biddy had talked to Harper. His heart broke as she turned to leave, her dirty laundry out in public. Joel had always looked and flirted, even in high school, but now he did it so openly, actually texting and dating other women. I'm really sorry, Lila, he said. Have you told Mom? She asked, looking away. He shrugged. No. Does everyone know? She asked. He shook his head. I don't know. He was the wrong person to ask. He didn't talk to any of their old friends from high school. He sometimes would talk to Mateo if he ran into him, maybe some other guys from the team. But he hadn't kept in touch with any of them. I think you deserve someone so much better. He couldn't understand her need to hang on to this guy. Lila jerked her head back as though surprised by his empathy. Mom's going to love another broken engagement. Lila huffed out a hard breath. I've got to go. Chapter 19 Harper sat at a small table in books and bread. She missed working at the bakery with Renee, and she had always loved working with her dad. She enjoyed the camaraderie she got when working in a small store like Books and Bread. Everyone had to rely on each other to do their job to make the business work. If one person didn't show up, or if someone missed something they were responsible for, the ship would go down. Renee, however, didn't seem to need much help these days. She had hired a bunch of high school kids who enjoyed being there, even when they weren't working. Renee had a lot of help with George as well. 
between all the women and Mateo's family, Rene hardly asked Harper to watch him anymore. Stan hardly needed his extra walks because Charlie and Evelyn seemed to go every time she was about to offer. Even Joan seemed annoyed she'd been hanging around the apartment more than usual. Ah, the apartment. She had tried to forget about that. She was running out of time. She still hadn't told Charlie. The obvious answer would be to move above the store with him. Her discouragement cut deep as she considered the prospect of ending up right back where she had started, after working so hard to get out of there. She looked out the front window in books and bread and tried typing. The other night, after sending that text to that jerk, Joel, she'd sat down to write and had killed it. Four thousand words. She had never written so much in one day in her life. Words had just streamed onto the pages. But then, like a hangover after a night of excess, she couldn't even look at her computer. She couldn't think of what she had wanted to write next, or think it was good enough to put in words. She knew if she looked back at what she had written, it would sound stupid. No one would want to read that garbage. She sighed, resting her chin in her hand, and looking out at the same harbor, the same scene she'd looked at her whole life. Tourists loved it, and she did too, but the 96 square miles got smaller and smaller by the minute. The island got even smaller when she saw Lila Schaefer marching down Harbor Lane. She looked ahead but then shifted, spotting Harper, and she stopped walking. The two stared at each other, and Harper could see that Lila took in a deep breath and started marching down the road. Harper's heart started beating faster in her chest, and she did everything she could to not look Lila's way. She never imagined Lila entering books and bread. But the bell rang out as the front door opened. Harper swung around as Lila came straight over to her table. Harper glanced at Renee, who was busy with customers. By the look on Lila's face, she wasn't happy. Back in high school, Lila Whitmore had been known for confronting other girls in the school, publicly humiliating them in front of everyone. She took no prisoners from the scenes Harper had witnessed. Harper's heart raced inside her chest. Renee didn't seem to notice the situation happening in front of her, and Harper seriously contemplated whether or not she should call for backup. The Harper from high school immediately started comparing outfits, choice of shoes, jewelry, even the way she did her hair. The price tag of Lila's ensemble racked up in her head. She clearly didn't shop at Target. Hello, Harper, Lila said, her hand gesturing to a chair. I was wondering if you had a minute. May I sit? Harper straightened in her seat, brushing away the muffin crumbs in her lap and moving the garbage out of the way. Sure. Lila sat down, not looking at Harper at first. Instead, she scanned the room. This place looks so different from when it was a bookstore. Harper had never seen Lila at the bookstore. Knowing Lila Whitmore had been there was like saying someone had been in your home without you knowing. Growing up, the bookstore had been as much a part of her life as the apartment above it. She had even slept in the bookstore at times. You said you wanted to talk? Harper could feel not only her anxiety, but Lila's as well. She picked at her phone case with her nails. I'm sorry I went to you that day. It was wrong of me. I took out my anger on you, and I'm sorry. Lila didn't make eye contact. Instead, her eyes skidded around every which way other than at Harper. He kept telling me it had been you who had been hitting on him. So, you know. Harper did know. Harper could feel the insecure teenager cowering inside her, but then she looked at the perfect-looking Lila. She was like a porcelain doll, this beautiful glass shell that could break. As Harper thought of what to say, she couldn't help but feel sorry for her. Look, you don't have to apologize, Harper said. Joel should be the one apologizing to you. 
Harper winced inside as she waited for what might come out of Lila's mouth next. But tears formed, then a muffled sound that Harper guessed to be a sob. Lila dropped her head onto her arms, resting on the table. Oh. My. God. She made Lila Whitmore cry. The 16-year-old girl she had been in high school started to wig out. I'm so sorry if I offended you. I am so sorry. Thank you. Lila looked up at her, her face strangely perfect still. I'm a joke on this island. No, you're not, Harper said. But what did she know? She sat at home and read books. Her closest friends were in their 60s, and her best friend had been her dad since she'd been a kid. Lila made a face like she thought the exact same thing Harper had. Anyway, thanks for being nice about everything. Harper had written a character that had a boyfriend who treated the protagonist badly. It had been almost impossible to write because... Harper couldn't understand why anyone went back to someone who didn't treat them well. Why stay when you're miserable? Why let them continue to treat you badly? Wasn't it just the same reason why she wanted a relationship with her mother so badly? Would you like to go somewhere more private? Harper asked. Lila dabbed her eyes with a napkin, shaking her head. I'm good. Harper didn't know what to say or do at this point. She had forgotten where they had ended the conversation. My grandfather's in love with your friend Biddy, Lila said, lifting up a corner of her mouth. Yeah, Biddy's pretty great. Harper smiled, picturing the old man doting over Biddy. She used to be a cheerleader in Oklahoma. I could totally see that. Lila laughed a little as though picturing Biddy back in the day. Pops just needs someone to make sure he doesn't do anything stupid, like climb a tree with a chainsaw. Lila smiled, but her voice sounded tired and hoarse. Deep circles could be slightly seen through her foundation. Harper didn't even own foundation. Would you like to come over? Lila asked. Maybe have lunch or something. Harper couldn't hold back her surprise. She had not been expecting an invitation to hang out when Lila had first arrived at her table. If you want. But she couldn't help but question the invitation. Would Lila do something like pour pig's blood all over her? Was the invitation like a punked moment where someone would jump out and laugh at her? She couldn't stop noticing Lila's perfect complexion and bright pearly smile. I hope everything works out for you. Harper wanted no ill will. Lila had been duped, just as much as she had been. She nodded, then waved. I should go. And then she was gone. Harper thought about how Lila hadn't set a time or a day for the lunch, that the invitation, though a nice gesture, had been as fake as her eyelashes. Across the floor... Renee made faces at her. She left the line of customers and walked over to Harper. Isn't that the creepy ex-girlfriend? Harper winced at her own words. She looked back to Lila. Just 15 minutes ago, she would have said something nasty. But now as she watched her walking out, she felt sorry for her. I'll tell you about it later, Harper said. She snuck another glance out of the street to where Lila got into a Land Rover. As Harper processed the situation, she didn't know how to feel about Lila showing up into her life. The dramatics alone made Harper uneasy. She didn't trust this new and matured Lila. But maybe she had changed. What if she had truly invited Harper over? Would she really go? Then suddenly, like a rust spigot finally twisting open, an idea flashed through her head, rushing through and out again. She reached for the pen in Renee's bun. Renee looked up and patted her head with her hand. When did that get there? Harper jotted down key words on the back of her arm and then kissed Renee on the cheek. I have an ending. She was pretty sure she had an ending for her story. 
Chapter 20 Biddy quickly got into a routine at the house with Randy. He had reminded her of her daddy, the way he talked and spoke so bluntly. She quickly realized he also lived like her daddy, minus the cattle and cowboy hat. Randy liked watching the news and the Red Sox. If football was on, he'd read westerns or crime thrillers. Lila came during the days, bringing lunch most of the time, serving him some god-awful vegetarian meal with tofu or salads or fake burger meat. She could tell Randy loved his granddaughter by the way he would try everything she brought, then ask for something else as soon as she left. That afternoon, Lila stuck around and hung out in the kitchen as Biddy thought about making dinner. I invited Harper to maybe have lunch but forgot to grab her number. Do you think you could give her mine? She said, handing a post-it over to Biddy. I'll give it to her, Biddy said. Biddy glanced at the young woman, who used an app on her phone to look closer at herself. Biddy couldn't help but notice how much Lila had frequented her grandfather's house. She started by helping out in the mornings for Biddy, then staying for lunch. Now it was already past three in the afternoon, and she showed no signs of leaving. Not that Biddy minded. In fact, she thought it was lovely how much Randy's granddaughter liked to help out around the house. Whenever Lila was there, she was helping with the cleaning and often cooked. But how much did this have to do with wanting to help her grandfather, or because of the cheating doctor? Would you like to stay for dinner? Biddy asked. She wondered if Harper had avoided giving her number. Harper had told Biddy about her strong feelings about Lila. I'm making my girlfriend's seafood pie recipe. Lila scrunched her nose. I'm not a big fan of seafood. This shocked Biddy. You live on an island. She shrugged. I'm not really into fish or meat. Ah, that explains the choice in food for lunch. You should stay anyway, Biddy said. We have salad and bread. Lila looked at her phone. I don't want to be a bother. Not at all. Biddy patted the seat next to the island. Now let me get to know you a bit better. Lila slowly walked over to the stool, then stood behind it instead of pulling it out and sitting down. When did you run into Harper? Biddy asked, hoping not to sound too nosy, but she was definitely curious. The other day at the bookstore. Lila shifted her stance, awkwardly standing there talking. I suppose you've heard all the stuff with my ex fiance Biddy shook her head. It's none of my business. Lila twisted the metal knobs on the top of the chair with her hands. I wanted to apologize for my behavior. Biddy must have done a bad job hiding her surprise, because Lila made a face. I think that's mighty brave of you to admit when you made a mistake. Lila bit her bottom lip. Maybe. Harper's a very understanding person, Biddy said. Lila shrugged, and Biddy could tell whatever had happened still bothered her. I say we call Harper over, grab a bottle of rosé, and gab. Biddy slapped the counter with her hand. Come on, let's get Randy involved. Lila dropped her purse on the counter and pulled back the stool. That sounds great. Randy was allowed one drink with his medication. He chose a Samuel Adams, and he turned on some music, an upbeat jazz tune that played off a record player. Biddy texted Harper a picture of her seafood pie, and in less than an hour later, Harper showed up with two boxes of wine. I found these at the general store. But she stopped short in the doorway. Biddy reached out for both. That's my girl. Lila waved. Hi, Harper. Hey, Harper said. She turned her back to Lila and made a face to Biddy. Biddy made sure to lower her voice all the way and practically mouthed what she said. She needs a friend tonight. Lila watched as Harper and Biddy fell into step, catching up and getting each other's drinks. How'd Wanda's appointment go? Harper asked, popping out the plastic spigot for the wine. 
Good. They believe this treatment is slowing things down like they had hoped, Biddy said. That's great! Harper's face exploded with happiness. Biddy held up her hand. But it's making her feel worse. Oh, Harper sighed. One step forward, two steps back, Biddy said. I'm sorry your friend's sick, Lila said. If Biddy had a special power, it would be reading energy. Her mother called it the spirit's intuition. My beautiful Biddy has the gift, she'd overheard her mother tell her grandmother. Her grandmother had nodded. It was only a matter of time. Biddy didn't know what that gift meant exactly, and she never was able to find out. Her mother was dead in less than a year and a grandmother died of a broken heart shortly after that. Her father had told her it was all silly folklore. Wanda just got married, Harper explained to Lila. Biddy realized they had been conversing while she got lost in thought. Really? Lila smiled. That's awesome. To Marty, the mailman, Harper said. Lila scrunched her eyebrows. Oh, I know him. Didn't he retire? Yes, because he wants to spend every second with our girl, Biddy smiled. He's a pretty amazing guy. Biddy thought that a man willing to do anything to be with a woman sounded too good to be true. She poured three glasses and held hers up in the air. To new friendships and new beginnings. To new friendships and new beginnings. As the seafood pie baked, Harper and Lila sat at the counter and told stories of living on the island, mostly stories from their years in high school. Do you remember Mrs. Baker's English lit? Harper asked. Lila shook her head. That woman hated me. Biddy smiled, listening to the girl's stories. It reminded her of when Drake would come home from school and tell her about his day. He'd bring over his friends, and they'd tell her about what was happening at school. Even when he brought Darlene home for the first time, they all sat around and talked. When had that stopped? She thought she had done well as a mother. She worked hard as a nurse. At the time, she had worked 12-hour shifts, doing what she had to do to make ends meet. She had worked extra whenever she could find shifts. As a single parent, she thought Drake turned out better than she could have ever expected given their circumstances at the beginning of his life. But he had made honors throughout school, went to college on a partial scholarship, and seemed grounded and grateful. Everything seemed great. And then it wasn't. Lila, why don't we set the dining room table? Randy said. That sounds like a great idea, Biddy agreed. When dinner was ready, Biddy helped Randy to his seat as Lila and Harper brought plates and silverware to the table. Biddy pulled out the casserole from the oven. Let's say grace, Randy said, reaching out to Biddy and Lila for their hands. Biddy hadn't said grace in a while. She couldn't even remember when the last time was. Dear Lord, we thank you for these blessings we receive, Randy began. Lila dropped her head. Harper looked out the window. As Randy continued with grace, Biddy closed her eyes and made a prayer of her own. Dear Lord, make me useful for this family. That was it. That's all she could think of that wasn't selfish or vague. She wanted to be useful. It was the reason she'd become a nurse, so that she could make a difference. Her shot at happiness had come and gone, but she could help others. That's what God sent her to the island to do. Help Wanda, help Evelyn. And as she opened her eyes, she looked to Harper and now Lila. She could help these women. All right, Biddy said, looking at the motley crew around the dinner table. Let's eat. Where's Drew? Randy asked. Lila shrugged as she took a bite of the casserole. Biddy waited for her face to twist in disgust, 
but a surprised look spread instead. Biddy, this is delicious. Biddy smiled. Nothing like a stick of butter and a cup of cream. Lila's face dropped, now in shock. It's really good, Harper said. Is this my dad's recipe? Biddy had forgotten that's where Renee had learned it. Biddy nodded. That's right. The rest of dinner, Biddy watched as the two women continued to talk. I volunteer at the nursing homes and at the hospital, mostly reading to patients or just visiting. Lila shrugged. Nothing special. I certainly didn't write a book. I wrote a book, Harper emphasized the single article. Besides, no one liked it. Andrew did, Lila said. Said he really liked it. Harper stiffened. Really? Lila nodded, and Biddy could see this piece of information floating around in Harper's head. Lila surprised Biddy. The young woman who was draped in all designer brand names didn't seem like someone who would volunteer their time in a nursing home or hang out with her grandfather. She could easily live the Kardashian lifestyle of the rich and famous. But instead, she spent her days reading to the elderly, serving the less fortunate, and helping drive and deliver, all for nothing. Biddy was embarrassed she had been so judgmental about this young woman. When the girls left, they promised to meet for lunch. Thanks, Biddy. I had a nice time, Lila said, putting her purse back on her shoulder. I'd love to return the favor. Not if you're cooking, Randy grumbled. Pops, Lila said. The last dinner you made was a vegetarian lasagna. He looked perplexed by the memory. Who makes vegetarian lasagna? Good night, Pops, Lila said, then pointed at Harper. Call me, and we can meet at the beach. I'd like that, Harper said who stayed behind to clean up with Biddy. You look like you had a nice time, Biddy said once they were alone. The friendship had to be a surprise to Harper as well. I thought she was such a horrible human being, Harper whispered to Biddy, putting the dirty plates in the sink. She's lovely, Biddy nodded. People change. Harper turned on the water and started filling up the sink with soapy water. Biddy smiled, grabbing the pair of plastic gloves under the sink. You wash, I'll dry. Harper took the first dish, looking out the window at the black night. I had a really nice time. Biddy agreed with, mm-hmm, as she dried the first dish. Harper peeked into the family room, where Randy had settled himself in front of the television. The Red Sox were in the seventh inning, I'm still so shocked at how different she is. If this were high school, she would have told everyone a rumor about me or something. But you're not in high school, Biddy reminded her, taking the next plate from Harper. She seems a bit lost right now. Harper nodded, looking at her reflection in the dark window. Aren't we all just a little bit? Or a whole lot, Biddy said. Then with her hips, she swayed into Harper softly. I'm sure glad you came over when you did, Harper nodded. I bet she's appreciative to have a friend that told the doctor off. Biddy had seen what Harper had written after he'd had the nerve to send a picture of a dinner he'd had with Lila. One line and straight to the point. Get lost. How many other women do you think he has hit on in their relationship? Harper tilted her head and shrugged. I wonder why she stuck around. People never understood why Biddy stuck around with her first husband. But guilt, along with obligation and expectations, muddled her thinking. Plus, the harsh reality she would face when she did leave, without any help from family, or without any money, but with a baby, made her second guess every step of the way. She also couldn't have predicted what he would do if she took Drake. But it turned out that he'd hardly noticed, even moving a new woman in within months. 
That was when she attended night school, while a friend from church offered to watch Drake. She did that throughout nursing school, swapping babies among other single mothers, trying to make it. She received her nursing degree and got a job right there in town. Things immediately got better once she'd had a steady paycheck. She was sure the fool who'd said money couldn't buy you happiness had never been poor. Having food on the table, electricity on, along with hot water, and living in a safe neighborhood, that brought her happiness. She'd met Richard after Drake had started high school, and as the saying goes, everything had changed after that. Richard had loved to spoil her. At first it was jewelry, then vacations, then bigger ticket items like a car for her and Drake when he had graduated. Richard had been generous, to say the least. He had been older than other men she had dated, but he'd had a good heart and attended the same church as a friend of hers. He had asked her to marry him six weeks after they'd met and had never got discouraged. She hadn't said yes for years, traveling as a nurse wherever she was needed. She'd said she loved the work, and she had, but it had everything to do with the fact that men didn't stick around for Biddy. Her daddy had died. Her brothers had taken the ranch. Husband number one and number two had been deadbeats. There'd been no way this fantastic guy would have stuck around. But Richard had. And finally, Biddy had said yes. Drake had been over the moon about the engagement. He loved Richard as much as she did. Unfortunately, Richard's family had not seen Biddy as a welcome addition and had questioned the relationship the whole time. They had questioned why a young single mother who had just been getting by would fall in love with their father. They had questioned her reluctance, yet called her a gold digger. She hadn't cared if they understood their relationship or not, and she did love Richard. The money never had anything to do with it. But after she had married Richard, he had asked her to quit her job, stay home with him, and enjoy retirement. He said he'd take care of her for life. She'd put her retirement into their account and had quit nursing. What had made her keep her license up, she didn't know. Looking back now, as she stood in Randy's kitchen, the hired help in a rich man's house, she wondered if she'd do it all over again. She wasn't sure. She loved Richard. But maybe he'd been a snake, like all the rest of them. Chapter 21 Evelyn hadn't seen her friend this happy in a long time. You look great. I've been sleeping pretty well, Biddy said. She sat in one of the wicker seats outside her new apartment, bobbing her foot up and down as she took a sip of tea. Then she bit into a pastry Evelyn had brought from books and bread. At night, I can still hear the waves. Evelyn was glad to see her friend had settled in so well. Although she had been sad to see Biddy leave, she had been thrilled to hear she was staying on the island. This is a great space, Evelyn said. The small room was perfect for Biddy. There were plenty of windows and a beautiful patio. Evelyn had brought a basket of potted flowers, along with other house decorations like pillows, a quilt she had just finished, and a few classics like air, Austin, and steel. A desk would be perfect in that corner, Evelyn said, picturing a roll-up. I know the perfect little antique shop we should hit this weekend. That sounds nice. Biddy said. What's your schedule with Mr. Martin? Evelyn asked. He's been moving around much better lately, Biddy said. But he needs help with the cooking, cleaning, that kind of thing. I try to help in the mornings and at night, mostly. I can always arrange with the family to have someone come during the day. His granddaughter is always willing to help. Evelyn nodded. Harper was talking about her. Girl, they were besties by the end of the night, Biddy said, and laughed about something Evelyn wasn't a part of. From inside the house, the two heard a doorbell. I should see who's here. Excuse me. Biddy got up and headed to the front door. Evelyn, curious, decided to follow behind. 
There, in the front doorway, stood Biddy's friend Tommy. Evelyn couldn't hold back her smile. She wondered how he'd found out where Biddy had been staying. But Evelyn didn't appear to be surprised to see Tommy at all. Hmm, thought Evelyn, as Biddy lifted an eyebrow of sass, and Evelyn returned a smirk. Lots of men on the island adored the six-foot southern belle, but Biddy had never seemed interested in any of them. But Tommy somehow always came back around in the mix. Tommy! Randy called out. Come in! Evelyn watched as Biddy froze at Tommy's deep voice coming from the other side of the door. Biddy stepped around the corner, out of sight, but she peeked back to see Tommy shaking Randy's hand. How did he know Randy? I came by to see how you're doing. I heard you had a fall, Tommy said. Randy put his good hand on his bad arm. Just a little fall. Everyone's just making a fuss. Evelyn poked her head behind Biddy. Were you expecting him? Evelyn whispered to Biddy, who shook her head. No, I didn't know they were friends. Biddy peeked around again. Evelyn could no longer see the men, but could hear their conversation, which stuck to baseball and fishing. Why don't you go and say hello? Evelyn nudged Biddy with her elbow. Biddy shook her head. I don't think so. Why not? Evelyn said, looking at the musician. He's very attractive and obviously into you. He's not into me. Biddy shook her head. He pays all his attention to you whenever you're together. Evelyn would have thought Biddy would love to date a guy like Tommy. She loved music. She gravitated toward men who were a bit of a rebel. Plus, Tommy seemed to love the island. He seems like your type. I know. That's the problem, Biddy said. I have a new roommate, Evelyn heard Randy say. I think you might even know her. Biddy looked at Evelyn. How do they know each other? Evelyn shrugged. The island is a small place. Hmm. Biddy drawled out the word. I should say hello. Evelyn nodded and followed Biddy out. She didn't want to miss this. Biddy, Randy said as she walked into the room. Oh, good. Your friend is still here. Evelyn waved and looked to Tommy, who seemed more surprised by Biddy's presence than she was of his. Biddy, Tommy said. What are you doing here? Biddy clasped her hands together. I was wondering the same thing about you. Randy held out his arms to both. Biddy's my new roommate. Evelyn noticed the use of the word roommate. She almost laughed until she saw Tommy's face change. You moved in with Randy? No. She put her hands on her hips. Randy. She gave him a hard look. The old man wrinkled his nose and said, She's my nurse, staying at the house until I recover from my fall. Tommy smiled, putting his hands deep into his pockets. I live right across the way. Evelyn looked to Biddy, who said nothing and looked as though she had no idea. Well, you certainly lucked out with such a beautiful roomie. Tommy gave Biddy a smile, and Evelyn knew for certain Tommy was showing his cards. He had feelings for Biddy. Evelyn watched as Biddy interacted with him. She could tell Biddy had feelings for Tommy as well. So why was Biddy fighting it? Evelyn could practically feel the energy zinging between the two of them. It's good to see you, Biddy said. Evelyn and I were about to take a walk. Where did you say that trail started? Evelyn forgot she had agreed to walk. We can stay and chat with the guys. She didn't want to leave now. Things were just getting interesting. I think we should leave the guys alone. As Biddy said it, her eyes narrowed at Evelyn. Evelyn loved a romance. Heck, she made a very successful career writing about them. She knew her character's heroes better than they did. She'd follow Biddy's cues and leave for a walk today, but tonight 
She was calling Wanda, and they were going to come up with a plan. Tommy, the handsome musician, would be a perfect match for Biddy. When Evelyn returned back to Seaview, only silence greeted her. Renee and George stayed with Matteo now for the most part. Samantha stayed in the city for school and Chase's place when she came to the island. Wanda had moved all her things out. Now Biddy. She walked into the kitchen, noticing how big the house suddenly felt without everyone there. She didn't often drink on her own, but something made her grab the rosé and a small plastic glass, and she walked out onto the back porch and headed toward the beach. She wanted to have a drink with George. She jumped across the hot sand to the cooler, wet sand near the water's edge. She sat down, not caring about her shorts, and looked out. Then she poured herself a glass of wine and made a toast toward the horizon. There were no seagulls in sight. To change, she said. She could feel her throat tightening. She'd been recognizing her feelings better over the past year. Her anxiety triggers always happened in a certain order. First, her chest would tighten, then her throat, then her heart would race at her panicking thoughts. Change caused more anxiety in Evelyn than anything else, and she'd had a lot of it recently. But everything around her remained strangely the same. She took a sip and watched as the waves rolled into the water, the tide pulling them further away from where she sat. And as if he was running late, a seagull landed just feet away, where a crab had washed ashore. I feel like I need to do something more with my life, she said. She didn't mean to seem ungrateful. She had so much. She'd had a new lease on life since coming to the island. She was in love again. Her family was stronger than ever. She had friends she loved. Her successes had been amazing, and she was proud of what she'd accomplished. But she still felt like something was missing. I wonder if I should switch my focus. But the seagull took off. Evelyn looked back at the empty house. What would she do now? Chapter 22 Harper sat staring at the letter, waiting for something to happen. As if the word eviction, written in red across the front, would jump out at her. She thought he'd said a month. She hadn't even reached two weeks. Harper slumped in her kitchen chair and opened it. Inside was an even more official eviction notice, but also a check for her deposit and a thank you card. You were a good tenant, it read. Harper couldn't put off adulting anymore. She obviously couldn't make it in writing. She'd end up working at a grocery store, or worse, at books and bread as a last resort. She didn't want to go to Evelyn's agent again, because she was certain she had only been kind to her because of her relationship with Evelyn, the stepdaughter who couldn't cut it in the industry. Ugh, she was a loser. She'd have to go back to her dad for help. She wished she could call Mateo, talk to him like they used to. He'd know what to do, what to say to her to get her out of this funk. He'd get her to get something done. Why couldn't she just write? Why couldn't she just talk to her dad? He'd be able to help her. She picked up the letter and got up. Because that was her story. She'd always be the kid that couldn't make it on her own. But Mateo had his own family now. He didn't have time to be part of her life either. She thought about their kiss that night last year, before he'd fallen in love with Renee. She wished she hadn't kissed him, because that's when everything had changed. She had always seen him as a friend until that kiss. And then, poof! Mateo had changed right before her eyes. Why had she gotten so scared? She wondered if she'd be just as happy as Renee was. Joan, we will not be homeless. I promise. Harper looked at her cat, who lay on the floor with her belly next to the heating vent. Harper planned out her last paycheck. 
she had enough to live on for a month, if, and that was a big if, she didn't buy any extras like coffees and pastries. She'd buy all her groceries at the grocery store, plan out all her meals, including Jones, and make sure she could pay her utility and electric. She thought about Biddy and her new job. Maybe that's what she needed to do. Just get a new job. Find something, anything to get her out and make some money. Grow up, she said in her head as she leaned against the door. All her mom did was run. Harper loved to run, too. That's why she didn't have many friends. It was easier to keep them at a distance. She ran away from Mateo when feelings crept in. She was doing it now with Renee, Evelyn, and her dad. She pushed away, ran away, or hid. She looked at the letter on the table. What had running away solved for Tanya? Harper never expected her mother to stay. She had walked out so many times. It had always been a matter of when versus if. It was the reason Harper had vowed never to have children of her own. Harper didn't want to ever risk becoming like her mother, and from where she sat right now, running away from her problems seemed to be the only thing she had inherited from Tanya. The urge to open the door and run came over her. But then, she pulled out her phone and did something she hadn't done in almost ten years. She called her mom. The phone rang. By the third ring, Harper went to hang up, but that's when she heard her mom's voice. Hello? She spoke as though she didn't recognize the number, which either meant she hadn't kept her contacts current, or she had deleted Harper's information. Harper stayed silent. Harper? Tanya said. Harper drew in a breath. Then she said, Hi, Mom. How are you? Her mother's voice was like an old song she'd hear on the radio, almost sounding exactly how she remembered, but slightly different. I'm good, Harper said, quickly wishing she hadn't called. How's your dad? Tanya had broken the first rule. She wasn't supposed to bring up her dad. Fine. Are you married? Harper wondered how many husbands Tanya had gone through at this point. No, she said quickly. I haven't been married for a few years now. Harper played with the zipper on her sweatshirt. She wondered if her mom knew about her book, if she had kept up to date with her daughter. She wasn't on any social media sites as far as Harper knew, but Harper had never gone out of her way to look for her mother. She had thought when she published her book, as futilely as it may have seemed, her mom would have reached out. But almost a year later, and nothing should have been a pretty good indicator of two things. She either didn't know or didn't care. When Harper was a little girl, she always tried to win contests and awards, especially in the arts, something her mom would enjoy. She thought by winning awards or being the best at something, Tanya might change her mind and see what a great daughter she had. In her fantasies, her mom would come back and ask to move in again. Harper looked around her apartment. I should go, she hung up. Her phone immediately began to ring, her mother's number, but she quieted the call. She didn't answer. She waited, watching her phone, and then it arrived, a voicemail. She looked at the transcript. Harper, please call me back. It was good to hear your voice. I've missed you. Please call me back. I want to hear what's happening in your life. Please, Harp. Please call me back. No, I love you. No, I'm sorry I haven't reached out to see you, talk to you, wish you a happy birthday for ten years. Just ten years of silence. Harper pounded her head against the door. What was she thinking? She should have just gone to the store, ran away. She threw her phone on the couch and left the apartment. She ran down the stairs and out to her car. She needed some fresh air. She needed to get away. 
She needed to figure things out and stop making everything worse. Two hours later, she landed outside Biddy's new place. Harper? Biddy opened the sliding glass door to her apartment. Harper handed her a plant that she managed to purchase, breaking her promise not to buy any extras. Oh, you shouldn't have. Biddy stepped back with the plant and waved her arm. Come on in. Harper smoothed her dress with her hands, feeling very unladylike in front of Biddy suddenly, who had this southern lady thing down. It was a Tuesday, and she looked as though she had a blowout that morning. You look great, Harper said. Thank you, Biddy said. I'm making myself eat well with Randy, and I've lost a few pounds. Plus, I'm not eating as many pastries without Renee Bacon in the kitchen. That's great, Harper said, unsure how to start. You okay? Biddy asked. Harper didn't want to run. I need help. Biddy's face dropped. Harper choked back her tears, but it was no use. The pressure had hit its boiling point. I'm just a loser. My dad finally found happiness, and I don't want him to worry about his 30-year-old daughter. I mean, I'm ridiculous. I literally can see what people think about me. Biddy held out her hands. Whoa, slow down. Tell me what's going on. I got my eviction notice. Harper looked down at her hands. Oh, sugar, I'm sorry. Biddy rubbed her knee. You know, I'd love to offer a place to stay, but I'm not in the position. But I can help in other ways. Have you talked to your dad? Oh, Biddy, I didn't mean for you to offer a place. I just need someone to talk things through a bit. Harper felt even stupider. Biddy was her closest friend. A 63-year-old caretaker was her closest friend right now. I called my mom. Biddy nodded slowly, taking in the information. How'd it go? Harper shook out her hands, still not believing she had done it. But as she stood there, thinking about her mother's reaction, her eyes stung with tears. She shrugged. I hung up before we really talked. Why'd you call? Harper didn't know why she called her mom. I don't know. I started thinking about her, and I just called. Did you think about her because you missed her? Or because you wanted to talk? Biddy asked. Harper thought about it. She wiped her eyes with the sleeve of her dress. I wanted to know if she'd read my book. I mean, if she ever loved me, she would have read my book, right? Her own daughter's book. The tears welled up in Harper's eyes. Biddy took hold of her hands with hers. You would make me so proud if you were mine. The words made a sob break loose from Harper's chest, like a dam opening, water splattering out, rough at first, then gushing like a release. She cried hard, like her whole being had let loose the anger, the sadness, the guilt, the shame, all of it pouring out of her. That's it, Biddy said, her arms suddenly holding Harper's body up. Let it out. At that moment, as Harper let the built-up pain loose, she felt as though she had stepped out of her body, as though she could see Biddy holding on to her from above. She could feel the room's energy, the waves moving outside, the moon, the heavy feeling pulling out of her soul, like a thread being ripped away from a seam. Everything came out. She didn't know how long she cried. She didn't even have the time without her phone. Biddy just held her, shushing her, swaying back and forth, but not letting go. That must have felt good, Biddy said, when silence filled the space. It did, Harper said holding on to Biddy with her own arms now, feeling a bit lighter, but drained. 
She thought about how Biddy probably wasn't going to stick around. Let's come up with your plan, Biddy said. We can sit out on my patio and look for some rentals. Fresh Atlantic air always makes our minds work better. Harper wiped her face and nodded. Sure. Biddy patted her hand. Let's start with just the low-hanging fruit. We don't need to go fixing any mother-daughter relationships in one sitting. But maybe we can figure out what you need to do about your apartment situation. I feel like this could be that opening for me. Like pushing a bird from a nest, Harper said. Biddy looked at her. That's a positive way of thinking about it. But it just feels wrong, Harper said. It feels like I'm being shoved out of a moving train. Tears threatened again. Let's start with a to-do list, Biddy said, grabbing the notebook from Harper's hands and opening it up. She crossed her legs, tapping the pen on the pages. Number one, find a new apartment. Harper took in a deep breath, then hiccuped. Thank you, Biddy. Of course, Biddy smiled. Everything is going to be all right. Harper had waited her whole life for someone to say that to her. Okay, let's look at what's available. Biddy suggested searching through real estate websites, then they looked through different newspapers' classified ads. Most places were marketed toward tourists and astronomically out of Harper's price range. The more they looked, the more Harper's anxiety returned. Harper moaned as they went back to the sketchy rental that was three times what she could afford. I'm never going to find a place. I'm realizing Mr. Milano was a really good landlord and helped me out. Biddy laughed at Harper's innocence. You know the obvious answer, don't you? She did. Harper wasn't stupid, just not very good at the game of life. I can't go back to my dad's place. Ask Evelyn if you can rent the cottage. That's like asking to live above books and bread. Harper couldn't go back. From inside, the women heard a knock, then Mr. Martin calling out, Biddy, my grandson's here. Oh, God, please don't make me talk to him, Harper said, getting up and brushing off her leftover tears. She had avoided Andrew for the past few weeks. Biddy held up her hand. Why not? He's a great guy. A writer, too. Harper saw a twinkle in Biddy's eye. Don't even think about it. He's adorable, Biddy said. She was thinking about it. He's always coming by and checking in when he's in town. No one likes being set up, Harper said. But you're too shy to do it yourself, Biddy said, winking at her. He's annoying. He's not the kid from high school, believe me, Biddy said. When do I give you bad advice? The knob on the door twisted. Hold on, Biddy called out. The door began to open by the time she got up. There, standing in the living room of Biddy's apartment, was Andrew, wide-eyed and looking straight at Harper. Oh, you have company, Mr. Martin said. I thought you said come in. Harper. Andrew looked surprised, then smiled, showing off a perfect pearl grin spread across his perfect chiseled face. She couldn't help but notice how attractive Andrew Whitmore was. Andrew. You two know each other, the old man said. Andrew smiled at Harper. This is Harper Marin, Charlie's daughter. Oh, that's right, Mr. Martin said with a smile. I can't believe the bookstore is gone. Well, it's still technically there, but with a bakery inside, Harper said. Have you been? Yes, great scones, he said. Harper looked down at the notebook sitting out in plain sight with the words find an apartment on top. She quickly reached out and closed it shut, but not before she noticed Andrew looking over. Had he seen before she closed it? What are you boys up to this afternoon? Biddy asked. Well, my grandfather and I were going to take Linda out for a short... Andrew stopped and looked at his grandfather. 
short sail around the sound. Biddy's eyes widened. You slick old dog. You got someone to give you a ride. Join us, Mr. Martin suggested. Biddy looked at Harper. You up for an adventure? Everything in Harper said run, run fast and run hard. If she had been with anyone else, she would have left. She let the whole fight versus flight thing take over. She'd get away as fast and as far as possible from the uncomfortable situation unfolding. But there was something about the way Biddy held her stare, challenging her to take the leap. Maybe it was the way Andrew's eyes glowed like the moon, or how Mr. Martin looked so dang cute in his sailor's hat, or Biddy's words about Andrew being a good guy. She looked to Andrew. Maybe he wasn't as bad as she thought. After all, he was trying to protect his sister. She could see how embarrassing it might have been at the party for Lila. Have you been on a boat before? Randy asked Harper. Pops, Harper's from the island, Andrew said, as though the question was ridiculous. The truth was, Harper hadn't ever been on a boat in the Atlantic, except for the ferry. Her whole life, she had lived on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and she'd never been on a boat. It seemed like an oxymoron. And Shonda Rhimes' self-improvement book flashed through her head. Sure, she said then looked back at those eyes. That sounds wonderful. Chapter 23 Andrew could not believe his fortune. Not only did he get to drive his grandfather's boat, something he had loved to do since the time he could walk, but he got to drive his grandfather's boat with Harper Marin. That was the last thing he had expected to happen. Do we have to wear life jackets? Harper asked as they walked down the docks. He led the way through the marina, where Linda sat in the same slip that it had been sitting in since he was a little boy, ever since his grandfather had retired from the court. Come, this way, Pop said, shuffling down the wooden decking with ease. His sea legs had kicked in. Harper followed in back, holding her canvas bag against her chest. There are life vests if it makes you more comfortable, but... Most people don't wear one on this kind of boat. Andrew wondered if she came because she wanted to ride on the boat, or if he still had a shot with the beautiful rider. As he approached the boat, the vessel fondly named after his grandmother, he said a silent prayer for smooth waters and conversation. He had been known for sticking his foot in his mouth around this woman. He held out his arm toward the boat. After you. Pop's 36-foot motored boat cost more than most people's houses. Pops had practically lived on the boat when Andrew was a kid. Whenever they came to Martha's Vineyard, Pops would be on the boat. Fishing, sunbathing, sailing, sleeping. Pops would be on the boat morning, noon, and night, which meant Andrew would be on the boat with him. His travels with Charlie were spent on a Hinkley yacht rather than an RV. As he led the group on, he couldn't help but sneak glances Harper's way. He knew he must have come across as creepy, worse even, a bit stalkerish, when she started noticing him looking, but his eyes couldn't help themselves. Something about the way Harper carried herself was unlike any other woman he had been around. The way her chin rose as if she were looking curiously for something off in the distance, the way she twisted a loose strand of hair around her finger the way she didn't back down in a staring contest, the way she stood up to Joel, the way she didn't melt at Joel's advances, the way she treated Lila. Harper had every reason to tell off his sister, yet Lila said they had not only worked it out, but it hung out. Who was this woman? Women in his family compared and gossiped and dismissed. He wanted to know everything he could about her. Pops assigned seats as they got in. If you've never been on a boat, then you deserve the pilot's chair. He patted the leather chair that sat next to Andrew's seat. He had to give it to Pops. He certainly knew how to work the ladies. Harper didn't hesitate to sit down. 
Andrew couldn't even get her to text him, and his grandfather had the girl of his dreams sitting next to him for a romantic afternoon boat ride. He couldn't write this stuff. Like always, he took starting the boat trip seriously, even if it was a trip he'd taken hundreds of times. Pops respected the process. First, he checked in with the marina, letting them know their plans and approximate locations. Then he checked all the systems, making sure everything was in check. Pops checked the weather. Clear skies for another few hours, Pops called out. Wind speed at five knots. New England's weather could change within a blink of an eye. Blue skies might be out now, but the Atlantic Ocean was unpredictable. She never could keep her mind straight. Like Harper, he supposed. One minute she seemed to loathe him, and the next she appeared to enjoy his company. Andrew turned the key and could feel the excitement ripple in his chest every time he took out the boat. He said what Pops always said before taking off. Fair winds and following seas. Pop shouted out, Anchors away! from the boat chair behind Andrew. Harper's chin rose as she looked straight ahead out the windshield. He slipped out of the dock slowly, carefully, not too cockily, though Andrew could do it with his eyes closed. Looks good on my side, Pop said, looking over on the left. Andrew drove through the wake, watching for traffic and making sure his eyes stayed glued ahead. They drove slowly through the marina, waving as they passed by. This is a lovely way to spend my day, Biddy said from behind him. Andrew smiled to himself as his pops pointed out different things about the boat. He snuck a glance at Harper, who stayed as stiff as a board in her seat. She looked either nervous or like she couldn't stand to be around him. Are you riding these days? He asked. He figured he'd stay safe with the one thing they had in common. No. She didn't add anything else, and her twisted face made him regret that softball question. He held the wheel, wondering how to come back from that. Never in the thirty years of life had he had this much trouble talking to a woman. Maybe he should take the hint and leave her be. He checked the radar, just so he wouldn't have to look like the idiot he felt like. Not as much as I'd like, she continued. Me neither he said, almost a bit too eager to share. He began to navigate through the last of the wake. He turned around to face everyone and asked, Where should we go? The leaves are breathtaking this time of year. Could we just travel along the coast? Biddy said. Perfect idea. Pops clapped his hands together. Shall we? The boat may look like a geriatric picnic boat, but the thing had an engine that took things to the next level. Andrew knew these ladies weren't here for its speed. We can take it easy, Pops. Speed is what excites the ladies, Pop said, winking at Biddy. Andrew groaned silently. Harper probably thought Pops was a dirty old man, and Andrew his sidekick. Really, though, Pops was a hopeless romantic, waiting to meet up with his wife in heaven and trying to settle down his grandson. Andrew didn't go any faster, but headed northeast toward his favorite scenic route along the coast of Martha's Vineyard. They would be able to see the harbor, Cliffside Point, along with Sugar Beach. The cliffs of Greyhead would be in full display and sparkling from the low autumn sun. Leaves would be falling into the water, creating a kaleidoscope of burgundies, peaches, and golds. It's gorgeous, Harper finally said, after an excruciating silence. He nodded, noticing Pops starting a side conversation with Biddy about the cliffs. Why haven't you been riding, she asked. He thought carefully about his response. Since meeting this woman, he had continuously said the wrong things. For the first time, he would think before he spoke. I don't want to believe the story, he said. What do you mean, she asked. I'm investigating these men who have wives and children, and it makes me feel bad that I might ruin their lives by exposing them. 
didn't they ruin their lives themselves? She asked. It seemed that simple. These men had laundered millions of dollars. They had corrupted the system and should pay the price. He shrugged as he focused back to steering the boat slowly up the coast. Maybe it was that simple. Maybe it was his upbringing. He had grown up among the men he was investigating. Men who used their wealth to get what they wanted by whatever means necessary. Corruption hung in the most glamorous events, even at family lobster bakes. That is hard, she said. He nodded. It is. But think of how grateful the other families will feel once you expose them. Harper played with a strand of her hair, twirling it around her finger as she thought intently on what she was saying. It's why I do it, he admitted. I like exposing the bad guy, once I get over the guilt. She cracked a half-smile at him. Then she noticeably took in a deep breath and let out a long, exaggerated exhale. I can't believe you haven't been out on a boat before, Andrew said, hoping this subject would be received better. My family couldn't afford it, she said, her tone instantly cold. Ouch. Guess not. When we were kids, Pop would take me and Lila out on it to get away from everything that was happening in my family. He didn't need to tell her. The flicker of recognition flashed across her face like an aha. That Andrew might feel for the bad guy because his own father had been dragged through the mud. Most people on the island knew him because of two things. One, because he was his father's son and two, because of the scandal the island couldn't stop talking about. The affair that had rocked every household throughout America. His family's scandal had graced the covers of tabloids and the primetime news television spots. She looked at him like someone trying to crack a code. He seems like he loves you a lot to let you drive this. Andrew cocked his head in recognition. That he does. He leaned over and whispered, he still hasn't let Lila. Harper's eyebrows raised, and she didn't carry on the conversation. God, he just couldn't figure her out. He almost thanked her for hanging out with Lila. His sister didn't seem to have the greatest friends these days, but figured that would sound bad. What do you like to do? He asked, reaching for anything at this point. Harper looked at him then out the windshield. I used to write in my free time. Looks like you picked a good career then, he said. But her smile dropped. Yes, well, you need to be able to have something to write about. And I seem to have a problem in that area. His face twisted, wanting to know more. He understood writer's block better than most. Are you having trouble with the writing part? or the coming up with a story part. She looked straight at him, her eyes haunted. He had that same look in his eyes two years ago. Both, she said. God, I hate that feeling, he said, watching the speed as he came close to the beginning of Greyhead. The lighthouse could be seen off in the distance. You know, I read your book, and it's really good. I mean, really good. Harper stared at him, her mouth agape. Oh, that's Evelyn's place, Biddy called out, pointing toward the shore. Harper stood up, getting a better look. He slowed more as the women got up and walked out to the deck. He had hoped she'd come back, continue their conversation, but she and Biddy stayed in the back, helping Pops out onto the stern, where couches sat on either side of the back deck, while Andrew sat alone in the cockpit. For the next 20 minutes, Pops pointed out familiar landmarks as Andrew slowed by them. He pointed out the Elizabethan Islands and Vineyard Haven. He showed them further beaches beyond Greyhead Cliffs and a further inlet where famous movie stars resided. That's a biggie. Biddy pointed her arm out toward the house. That's my daughter's place, Pops said. Pops didn't add any stories or legends about the house. The conversation died, 
as they passed by the massive structure, which used to be the home of one of Andrew's friends from his childhood. After his father had bought the house, he had torn it down, even with some of their things still inside it. Hey, kid, how about we take a break so I can take a leak? Pop said. Sure. Andrew pulled the throttle back to neutral. He walked to the galley and looked in the fridge. Hopefully, Pops had something more than his usual. He looked inside. Only a six-pack of Miller Lite. Guess not. Beer? Biddy lifted her hand. Don't mind if I do. She jabbed her elbow into Harper's side. Come on, what's one beer going to do? Harper's expression changed from concern, wrinkled forehead to one raised eyebrow, then to a half-smile surrender. Okay. He'd take it. By the end of this boat ride, he'd convince her he wasn't a creep. He twisted the caps off the beer, then threw the tops out and came out to the back of the boat. Thanks, darling, Biddy said in a thick southern accent. She reached out as Andrew handed her one first, then Harper, then Pops. He didn't take one himself. Even if he wanted a beer, Pops wouldn't allow it. No drinking while driving the boat. As they sat there, taking in the view, he thought about what he knew about Harper. He knew her father owned the bookstore in the village before it had become a bakery. He didn't really understand the relationship between her and Biddy, but admired how close they seemed to be a friendship that reminded him of a sisterhood. Not too many women with that kind of age difference hung out together. Not too many women Harper's age hung around the elderly in general. Women he had dated in the past had found it odd that he had such a close relationship with his grandfather. His former girlfriend hadn't understood why he'd rather stay with his grandfather than at his parents' house. He also knew Harper was a talented writer. Throughout the years in high school, She'd been in his English classes, along with their journalism course. Back then, his writing had been dry, and he remembered wishing he could take some of her talent with figurative language and sprinkle it into his writing. But never in the four years of high school had Harper Marin paid any attention to him. Do you know my grandson works for the Globe as a journalist? Pop said, winking at Andrew. Oh, God. Andrew thought to himself. Why did he agree to come on this trip? Yes, I did, Harper said. I liked the piece on the school board in reading. The piece had been one of his first big stories. Thanks. His editor had promised an A2 spot, but it ended up on the front, under the fold. He couldn't believe it. People throughout the region wrote into the Justice Department asking for change. An investigation had taken place, and people were held accountable, all because of him. I always loved your writing, he said. If Andrew paid attention better, he would have stopped while he was ahead. But he continued. You had such a strong voice, even in high school. Biddy looked at Andrew as if impressed he knew. But Harper didn't say a thing. In fact, for the rest of the boat ride, Harper stayed visibly quiet. Even her friend Biddy tried getting her to join the conversation, but other than a few murmurs of agreement, she didn't talk. By the time they returned to the marina and docked Linda into her slip, they all headed toward Andrew's car, but she slowed down behind them. You know, I think I'll walk, Harper said. What about your car? Biddy asked. It's still at the house. Harper looked to Pops. Would you mind if I picked it up later? Pops shook his head. Not at all. Great, thanks. Harper kissed Biddy on the cheek. Everything all right? Biddy asked. Her face showed the same amount of confusion Andrew felt. Why was she taking off? Was it something he had said or done? When Harper left, Pops turned to Biddy and asked, Is your friend okay? Biddy looked back at Harper who was walking down the sidewalk from the marina and heading toward the little seaside village. I'm not quite sure, Biddy smiled at the two of them. I think the water got her mind moving. 
It's funny how a little fresh sea air can put things in perspective. Andrew started the car but kept his eyes on the mirrors, watching Harper walk away. Had the water given her a new perspective, or tumbled her troubles? He wished he could run after her, talk to her, help her. But Harper didn't seem to want or need anyone. Chapter 24 Harper got up that morning and walked over to the apartment. When she walked by the bakery's kitchen, she could see Renee and some of her staff working. The smells of fresh bread and confectioner's sugar wafted through the air. She walked up the steps to Charlie's and took in a deep breath as she stood outside the door. She knocked. I'm coming, Renee, Charlie said as he swung the door open. His head jerked back by the surprise. Harper! A while ago, he never would have expected anyone other than her. Hey, Dad. It's good to see you, he said, pulling her into a hug. Harper wrapped her arms around him. The embrace and warmth felt better than she had expected. I've missed you, kiddo, Charlie said, stepping back into the apartment and letting her in. Me too, she said. She could smell coffee and maple syrup. Having oatmeal? I'm going on a hike with Evelyn later this morning, he said. I went on a boat, Harper suddenly remembered. You're kidding, Charlie said, moving to the coffee maker. Want one? Yes, please, she said. She looked in the living room and noticed most of the boxes were gone. Where are you hiking? Along the cliffs, Charlie said. We're looking for the treasure. Harper noticed her great aunt's journals on the dining room table. Still treasure hunting? I've gone through every journal at this point, Charlie said, pouring the coffee into a mug that said, World's Greatest Dad, and handed it to her. Now we just have to comb through it all. He handed over the mug, and Harper held it with both hands. She thought about what she was going to say all night. Where did you go? Charlie asked. Just up the coast to the lighthouse on Greyhead, Harper said. It was my first time on a boat like that. Charlie cocked his head. You've been on a boat before, haven't you? No, she said. Hmm. Charlie wrinkled his forehead in contemplation of this revelation, and she wondered how many times Charlie had been on a boat. Who'd you go with? Biddy, and the guy she's working for, Randy, she said. Randy's a great guy, Charlie said. Harper twirled her mug around in a circle with her hands, not sure how to bring up the fact that she needed a place to live. What's on your mind, Pumpkin? he asked, resting on his elbows. This was it, the moment she had been dreading for weeks. Mr. Milano's going to give the apartment to Sonny. Charlie's mouth widened in shock. When? The end of the month, she said, still focused on twirling her mug. That's not a lot of time, Charlie said, his face turning red. Anthony can't just break a contract and give no time. He gave me plenty of time, Harper said. I just didn't tell you. Charlie swung his hand up. Why? She stopped twirling and began to pick at the tablecloth. Because I didn't want to make you have to worry about me. He looked hurt, so she looked away. She could feel the tears pushing through the backs of her eyes. Oh. You're so happy lately. I didn't want to ruin anything, Harper said. Plus all the stuff with Renee's wedding. The countdown had begun, according to Evelyn and Renee the last time she was at Seaview. She didn't even want to think about the plus one she didn't have. You can stay here, Charlie said. It's perfect. Problem solved. Harper shook her head. I'm not coming back to live here. He made a face. Did you find another apartment? She shook her head. She looked up at her dad, pleading through her eyes. She needed his help not with the apartment, but with life. 
I didn't want to end up where I started. He knew what she meant. He had moved back to Martha's Vineyard after leaving for Los Angeles to make it big, but then fizzled out. So he had returned to the island, jobless and with a kid. Let's start looking for something. There's got to be someone who has an empty place. Charlie snapped his fingers. I was talking to Mr. Thompson at the hardware store, and he was talking about how they needed to winterize their rentals. Maybe you could rent one for the winter. Harper could feel the weight immediately lifting from her chest. Why had she waited so long to talk to Charlie? He got up from the table and grabbed his phone. Let me make a few calls. I bet we can get you set up in a place for the next six months, Charlie said. He stood as someone answered on the other end. Bob, Charlie here. I'm calling about that rental you were talking about. Harper looked around the kitchen, remembering being little at the very table, swinging her legs underneath the very chair she sat in now. Nothing had changed. She was still the little girl who needed Daddy to fix things. Oh, that's a shame. No, I understand. She got up as Charlie walked back to the table. He ended up putting the property on the market. Harper nodded, looking at the apartment, remembering when they had first moved there after they'd left Los Angeles. She had hated Charlie for making her move there. She hadn't fit in with the island kids. She hadn't had a boat like the others. And she lived above a store in a small apartment with a crazy old lady. And she hadn't had a mom. I'm going to keep looking around and asking, Harper said, in the most upbeat voice she could muster. I'm sure I'll find something. Or you stay with Evelyn and I, he said. There's plenty of room at Seaview. Harper's heart slowed down, and tears of gratitude sprung in her eyes suddenly. This was the invitation Harper had been waiting for all along, an invitation to be part of his new life. Thanks, Dad. What made her doubt everyone in her life? You will always have a place to stay as long as you need, he said. He put his arm around her shoulder. I'm sorry I'm a disappointment. She couldn't get the words out without the tears coming to the surface. Charlie looked shocked. You are not a disappointment. He pulled out the chair next to her and sat. He got close, forcing her to make eye contact with him. It was a trick he had used throughout her childhood to make sure she was listening. I am so proud of you, Charlie said. You are the best thing I ever did. I'm a total failure. Harper's throat tightened around a breath. I'm bombing the second book. I can't figure out relationships. And I'm going to be homeless. She buried her head in Charlie's chest and cried. You are going through what every writer goes through. And you will figure it out, I promise. Charlie rubbed her back. You will also find the perfect person, but you have to be patient, and you are not going to be homeless. Harper kept crying, feeling stupid and young and like a loser for crying. What would her superlative in her reunion catalog be? Most likely to become a cat lady? A mixture of relief and guilt filled her as she left the apartment with Charlie to head to the store. Renee filled her in with all the details of the next few weeks. The bachelorette will be at Seaview, Renee said. Then the wedding. Renee showed pictures of the practice cakes she had made the night before. How was your writing session? Renee asked as she flipped through the pictures. Harper flinched, almost forgetting that was her excuse not to come. Good, thanks. Charlie went to the office in the back, once again taking on Harper's problems. Now she wished she hadn't said anything as she stood next to Renee, as she talked about the wedding in the store that she co-owned. The comparison of daughters between Charlie and Evelyn was comical at this point. Harper thought of an excuse to leave, but didn't have anything. I should get going. Are you coming for dinner tonight? Renee asked. 
Harper suddenly felt guilty comparing herself to Renee. Her new stepsister was amazing and someone she admired. Renee had gone through more adversity than most and had made it out on top. I'll try to make it, she said. When she left the store, she headed down toward her apartment, and she saw Lila waving at her through a window at the library. Lila held up a finger, and soon she came out of the front of the library with five books in her arms. Hey, Lila said. You checking out all those books? Harper asked. She looked at the titles. Mostly mysteries, a few detective novels, and even an Evelyn Rose. I pick out titles that the residents at the nursing home like to hear, Lila said. Harper looked back at the books and then to Lila. That's really nice of you. What are you doing? Lila asked. Would you like to have lunch? Harper's heart dropped. Here was cool Lila Whitmore, who volunteered instead of worked. I don't think I have time today, Harper said. Well, what about tomorrow? Lila said. There's a new lunch place I've been wanting to check out. Harper scrunched her face, not wanting to keep making excuses. I'm sort of trying to save money. Lila waved the comment away. I can take care of it. Harper could feel that insecure little girl inside, backing into the corner, hiding away. No, I don't think so. Then come to my house, and I'll make you lunch, Lila said. I always have salads on hand. It was a joke from the other night when Randy complained about Lila's salads. Besides, I wanted to tell you about what happened with Joel. Harper's curiosity was piqued. Something happened with Joel? Lila grabbed hold of her arm. He sent me dozens of roses to my house to apologize. Harper's mouth dropped. You're kidding! Lila shook her head. I sent them all to the hospital where he's doing surgeries all day. Harper smiled at the thought of Joel walking throughout the hospital and seeing his roses everywhere. He deserves worse. Lila squeezed Harper's arm. Come for lunch, and I'll tell you the rest. Harper should be looking for an apartment. She should be writing now that she had these small breaks in her writer's block. She should be helping with preparations for the wedding at Seaview. That would be fun. Sure. Turns out, Lila lived exactly how Harper had expected. The typical gray colonial had perfectly manicured lawns and even a pool in the backyard. Harper couldn't keep her mouth shut when she looked around the front hall, where a staircase spiraled up to the second floor. This place is beautiful. My parents bought it for Joel and me when we first got engaged, Lila said. It's perfect for a family. Harper couldn't help but hear the tone in Lila's voice, a sadness hidden under her perfect smile and polished makeup. Lila ushered her down the hall to the kitchen, which sat in the back of the house. As they walked, Harper noticed the formal living and dining room, both filled with fancy furniture and furnishings she had only seen in magazines or houses like Evelyn's. But as she could feel the tiny bit of resentment filling her stomach at Lila's perfect house and perfect decor, she noticed a picture of Lila and Joel. It looked like a candid shot, as though someone had taken it when they weren't looking. They were both smiling and happy. Harper looked at Lila, the girl who she had thought had everything in high school, and who now only had a house full of things. Let me tell you about what happened, Lila said, getting out a glass pitcher from the fridge. Do you like lemonade? Harper nodded and took a seat at the counter, as Lila went through the whole ordeal with the delivery, sending the flower guy to the hospital, and delivering Joel a message. I wrote the exact same thing you did, Lila said. Don't ever text me again. Harper couldn't help but smile. Lila poured the drinks animatedly, her energy accelerated. Lila looked happy. You're nothing like I thought you were, Harper suddenly said. Lila had been such a legend in her own mind. 
Lila made a face. What did you think I was like? Cool, Harper said. You were like the most popular girl. Andrew said I was sort of a jerk, Lila said. She sighed. I always thought you were super nice. People always assumed Harper was friendly, but really, she had been so needy that she had clung to anyone. It didn't matter who, she'd hang out with them, which to others meant she was friendly. She hadn't cared what group someone had been a part of or what sport they had played or what table someone had sat at, just as long as they could carry a conversation. Because living above a bookstore with Aunt Martha, who had called Harper by Martha's dead sister's name, hadn't made her a good conversationalist. Harper had needed peer interaction. Then middle school had started, and girls who had mothers had pretty outfits and nails manicured and pedicured, and she hadn't fit in at all. Charlie hadn't been any help during her teenage years. He had encouraged her to read, work in the bookstore, and help take care of Martha. He let her shop, but he hadn't known how to make an outfit cute like a mother would have. Harper hadn't known what to do when she needed to start shaving or get a bra, or the worst, when she got her period. Charlie had handed her a book, told her to ask questions if she had any, and did a prayer sign against his chest when he left. To the girls with mothers, she hadn't fit in, dressed weird, and had been completely off the mark. They had devoured her. Girls would tell her she looked cute, then ask which garage sale she had picked her outfit up at. I never really fit into any groups, Harper confessed. I didn't really have friends. Harper didn't mean to come and complain about her experience in high school, but so many people, her teachers, other kids, even Mateo, had asked why she chose to stay in the background, waiting for others to include her. That was why. She'd never fit in in the first place. Andrew always had a crush on you, Lila said. What? This was not at all the response she had expected. Andrew? Your brother? Yep. He had a crush on me? Harper said. Still does, if you ask me and Pops. But he'd never admit it now. Lila opened the fridge and dropped a few perfectly laid out charcuterie boards onto the counter. Do you have these just hanging around? Harper pointed at the salami wrapped into a shape of a rose. I might have been cool, but it was only because Joel made me popular. Lila looked away, picking at the tomatoes and placing them a different way. Even now... My friends knew the whole time, but just talked about it behind my back. Lila picked up an olive and popped it into her mouth. That's what my friends do. I'm sorry they did that to you, Harper said. Lila shrugged again. It's how that group always acts, pretending to be perfect. Never really getting to know who one another really is. Because surface friendships are easier when you stab people in the back. Ouch, Harper said in her head. She thought about everyone in her life. Her dad, Evelyn, Renee, Samantha, Biddy, and Wanda. Her new family. As Lila brushed off her friend's heartlessness, Harper felt grateful she had a supportive group of people in her life that would never betray her trust. Harper realized she had a family, and a good one at that. She had people who'd do anything to help her. You should come for dinner at my family's house, she said to Lila. We can even invite your grandfather, and Biddy will come. Lila smiled. Okay. And Harper thought to herself that maybe she would be just fine. Chapter 25 it didn't take Biddy long to convince Randy to come for dinner at Seaview, but Andrew was a different story. They don't even know me, Andrew said, shaking his head. I'd feel uncomfortable showing up. 
My girlfriend Evelyn loves a full house. Now come on, Biddy said, shooing Randy and his grandson out the door to the car. We love party crashers. I don't know, he said. Harper will be there, Biddy said. Let me drive, Andrew said, rushing to the side of the passenger's seat. That better not be for me, Randy said to Andrew with the door open. No, Pops, it's for Biddy, Andrew said. Biddy noticed Randy gave Andrew a wink, but Andrew went to Pop's door just as he reached for it and opened it for him, too. Andrew followed Biddy's directions to Seaview, but he seemed to know exactly what house she was talking about. I know the house. It had been one of his favorites growing up on the island. He drove up the driveway. Wow, it looks great. Evelyn had the whole thing renovated, Biddy pointed to the widow's peak. All the way to the top. This is quite the place, Andrew said. Is that Lila's Land Rover? He didn't know his sister had also been invited. Biddy looked away. The afternoon had been one of conspiring with the young woman. When Lila had spilled the tea about Harper's reaction, when she told her about Andrew having a teenage crush, Biddy couldn't help but remember the looks she had noticed him giving Harper when they were on the boat. It makes so much sense, Biddy had said to Lila. He was doting all over her the whole time. He's been head over heels for her for years, Lila had said, shrugging. I don't know why he never had the nerve to ask her out, but that's Andrew for you. Biddy liked the young man who visited his grandfather and was willing to take the fall for the dirty magazines. Invite him along, Biddy had encouraged. We'll bring the whole lot. Will Evelyn mind my whole family coming? Biddy had shook her head. Evelyn will be completely on board. And, like Biddy had predicted, she loved the idea of inviting everyone. That's a great way to just let them get to know each other, Evelyn had said to Biddy, agreeing to not do anything that would make Harper know they were trying to set the two up. Maybe we should invite the whole writers group so it looks more planned, Evelyn had suggested. Hank, along with Anita, had agreed to come. Andrew slowly got out of the car, following behind Biddy and Randy. Biddy walked them up the porch and back down, where she could hear voices from inside. Just as she turned to let Andrew in, she saw him stop before stepping inside. She looked at what he was looking at and noticed Harper staring back at him. The two didn't break eye contact for a long moment. And that's when Biddy noticed just a little smile perk up on Harper's lips. Biddy still had the magic. The night went better than Lila and her could have guessed. Inviting the writers group was a good idea, Biddy said to Evelyn. Wanda stepped in between them. They're adorable together. Biddy nodded. Harper had been having a great time. Actually, everyone seemed to be having a great time. The guys talked about riding and fishing in Randy's boat. The women talked about riding and gardening and knitting. I used to knit with my grandmother, Lila said, holding George in her lap. I like the idea of knitting a baby's blanket or something small and cute. Biddy nodded, making note. Lila was probably hurting from the loss of what might have been. She might have had the happily ever after. She might have been a mother. She seemed mature enough, but youth made it hard to see that doors being closed made you open new ones instead. Charlie enjoyed talking to Andrew, but for most of the night, Andrew and Harper sat talking to each other. They sat next to each other during dinner, then together for drinks in the gathering room, then later when they all had dessert. The two sat close, lost in their own private conversation, letting the whole world go on all around them. By the end of the night, Biddy heard Andrew ask Harper out for a date. That sounds wonderful, Harper said. Biddy couldn't hold back her smile. When Andrew drove them all home, Biddy sat up front and said, Do something thoughtful, like a picnic on the water, 
or a poetry reading or something terribly romantic. Randy cleared his throat. Use the boat. Biddy leaned over the console and hit Randy on the knee. That's a great idea. Women love the boat, Randy said to Andrew. She was just on the boat. Do you think she'd want to go again? I sure do, Biddy said. Wower by taking her to Cuddy Hunk Island, Randy said. You're kidding me, Biddy said. Cuddy Hunk? She's going to be wild, believe me. I proposed to my wife right there in the middle of the island. Biddy imagined what Randy had been like with his wife. The cranky old man was a sweet romantic at heart. Order out if you can't cook, Biddy said once they got home. She tried to think of what would knock Harper's socks off. She loves Italian. Doesn't she live above a pizza place? Andrew asked. Yes, and she also has family that owned a bakery, so get a real good dessert. Biddy patted him on the arm. Good night, gentlemen. Night, the men said from the living room. Biddy walked back to her area of the house and put an empty glass in the sink. She folded a dish towel back into a neat fold and tucked it back on the rack. When she turned on the light, she smiled at the feel of the space. Her little apartment felt most cozy at this time of night. The cooler nights made the sounds from the ocean travel up the valleys of Cliffside Point differently here than at Seaview. More like a melody than a symphony. She turned on the lamp next to her couch and sat down, thinking about how nice the night had been, how happy Harper had looked when she left and Andrew had said goodbye. That's when her phone rang, bouncing across the coffee table. She saw Drake's name right away and registered the time difference. It was about eight o'clock his time. Hey, honey, she answered cheerily. Hey, mama, he said, his drawl sounding thicker than ever. She noticed the use of mama, and she decided to keep it light. How y'all doing, Darlene, the kids? Great, everyone's great, he said. That's wonderful, she said quickly, her voice high, trying to hide her nerves. She didn't want to blow this. I wanted to let you know that Darlene and I are getting a separation. He said it so matter-of-factly that she didn't know if he was joking or serious at first. Oh, I'm sorry, Biddy said. She rubbed the ribbing of the couch's cushion with her thumb back and forth in hard strokes. Are you? He said with a bit of a sneer. She nodded as if he could see her through the phone. Yes, I am. Separation is hard on everyone. She took the house and most of my paycheck, he said. Biddy's heart dropped. He was calling to ask for money. She wants everything, even the minivan, he said, and snorted. She wants a new husband. How much do you need? Just a few hundred, so I can find a place where DJ and I can stay. He sighed. She's already with someone else. Biddy wished she had better hope for her son, but she had never believed Drake and Darlene would make it. Darlene had all the same characteristics as his father. Unfortunately, Drake must have inherited Biddy's poor judgment in people. Where are you staying? At the local motel, he said. It's a dump. She could hear the hitch in his voice. Do you want me to come home? So we can both stay in a motel? He said it sarcastically, like he wanted it to sting. She wanted to remind him how much she had done for him, how much she had given up. Of course she'd help him, but love wasn't a one-way street. I have a few hundred saved. I'll send you what I can. She looked at the house. She could scrimp by enough to send the rest to Drake. She would ignore the glaring fact that her situation wasn't permanent by the fact that Randy was healing better than expected, 
and how she hadn't seen any episodes of confusion like the family had explained. She had a feeling it would be even shorter than she'd thought. What if we look for something in the neighborhood where Darlene has the house? Biddy said, knowing she could find a job traveling out in the boondocks. We'll see, maybe, Drake said. Will you be able to send the money tomorrow? But Biddy didn't answer because she wasn't sure how she felt about being used so blatantly. There was urgency in his voice. She could understand his nervousness, but she couldn't understand his complete disregard for her over the last few years. She wondered if she could let it go, if it had already started eating at her. I love you, she said to him. She said it like all the times when she'd look at his face and wonder how she got so lucky to be his mom. I'm here whenever you need me, sugar. Thanks, Mom, he said. Maybe DJ and I could come out to visit at Christmas, Drake said. Darlene doesn't want Drake at Christmas? Biddy couldn't believe it. If I have him at Christmas, we could come there, he said. Biddy's heart warmed at the offer. That sounds wonderful. You could stay at Seaview, I'm sure, or here where I'm working now. You're working? he asked. When was the last time she had really talked to him? What's the place like? he asked. It's magical, she said, looking out the window at the lighthouse, illuminating a trail of amber that swept across the island. DJ would love it. Drake didn't say much more and said nothing about why him and Darlene had decided to divorce, but Biddy didn't push it. I love you, Ma, Drake said as they were ending their conversation. Her heart expanded. How many years had it been since he had said that? Five? Seven? Love you too, baby, she said back. The scrappy woman inside of her wanted to call Darlene and warn her to stay out of his life. But the calm, mature woman she had become on this island told her to wait patiently, to not get involved, which would only cause more trouble. Maybe she shouldn't give him the money. Maybe he was taking advantage of her. But her daddy would have done the same. And so would have Richard. He would have taken the shirt off his back for his family. She'd figure things out. Biddy always did. Chapter 26 Andrew decided to go casual, but ended with a more white-collar casual, which meant a tailored shirt and dress pants. He styled his hair, shaved, threw on some cologne, and took off in his sensible but high-end sedan. He may stay at his parents' house, but he had earned his own money. He pulled up to Seaview and looked out at the original Victorian home that'd been built on the island in the 1800s. Captain Houses stood the test of time. Not too many of the originals still hung around these days. Most people came in and tore them down, then built eyesores like his parents' place. He decided to pull out all the stops, flowers and a gift, which was a book of one of his favorite photographers, Mitsuaki Iwago, who photographed cats. When he walked up the front steps, he saw her through the screen door, her laughter filtering out from inside. Harper Marin stood in the kitchen, silhouetted by the late afternoon light, and looked like a goddess with her long blonde tendrils hanging down her back and her flowing dress that hung all the way to the floor. It flowed around her as if she were underwater, and he was certain he'd never seen a more beautiful woman in his life. When she met him at the door, his breath rushed out of his lungs. She looked even more stunning in the burgundy dress up close. She pulled her hair around her neck and over one shoulder. You look amazing, he said as she took the flowers in gift. Thank you. She smiled with her left eyebrow quirked up. She seemed suspicious as she looked at the gift. You'll have to open it, he said and smiled. She stepped back, opening the door wide. 
Come in, and I'll put these in some water. He followed through the hallway into a large open kitchen that looked out to the ocean. This is quite the spot. Did you live here in high school? She smiled and shook her head. No, but my family is crazy and made me get ready here. An older woman whom he recognized from dinner the other night came walking into the room. Aren't those beautiful? She walked over to the bouquet that Harper set in the middle of the island. Harper set the gift down without opening it. He wondered if that meant that she still wasn't very interested in him. A small gesture wasn't going to change her mind about him. Well, don't leave me hanging, the woman said. Harper looked to Andrew, who held out his hands. Andrew, you remember my friend Wanda? He reached out his hand to her. Yes, nice to see you again. Well, don't mind me, Wanda said, looking at the gift. Okay, Harper said, picking up the item that was clearly a book, a heavy coffee table type. She ripped the paper off and looked at the bright cover with a cat and lion in the same pose. I heard you have a cat, he said. Mateo had given him one pointer. She loves her cat, Joan. She smiled as she read the inscription aloud. To Joan, may you discover your wild side. She let out a laugh. How'd you know what she wanted? He took her laugh as a good sign. I just had this feeling. Why isn't this a lovely gift? Evelyn said, walking in from the back patio. She walked up to Andrew and gave him an embrace. Great to see you again. He nodded and looked behind her. Coming from outside with a margarita in hand was Charlie. Hello, Mr. Marin. Andrew reached out his hand. Good to see you again, Charlie said, winking at Harper, who rolled her eyes. How about you two have a drink with all of us before you go? Harper made a face at Charlie and then mouthed the words, I'm sorry, to Andrew. He laughed at Harper's reaction but said, I'd love whatever you have there. Harper noticed Evelyn smiled at her. It was Harper who dragged Andrew away from Evelyn and Charlie. Four riders in one space opened endless conversation about craft and the profession. By the time she finally got Andrew out of there, Charlie had set up a golf date, Evelyn had invited him to dinner, and Wanda had invited him to lunch the next time they were in Boston. I really like your family, he said, as they walked out to the car. She looked back at the house and smiled. Yes, they're very cool. Pops had been right, of course. Even though they didn't leave the dock, the boat was a perfect idea. He had dinner being delivered in an hour, a charcuterie board made by Lila sitting in the fridge, and a bottle of red wine in the cabinet. This boat is amazing. Harper said as she sat down on the couch. It's warm in here. The fall night had a chill in the air. You could live on here all year. I'd love that, Harper said. She grabbed a notebook out of her purse and began to scribble something down. Sorry, it's just that when ideas come these days, I have to write them down. Like butterflies, he said, like the old saying. They do disappear, Harper continued to write. I always remember loving your poetry, he confessed. You weaved the story through the words. He shook his head in pure astonishment. I could never do it. My dad had taught me a tip that always worked with poetry, she said. It's my favorite hack to this day. He tipped his head. What is it? He told me to write down all the words associated with the main focus of the poem, if you're writing about the ocean, then you write down every word that comes to mind. Waves, swells, shore, drown, drench, trudged, and so on. And then what? he asked. She flipped her notebook to a new page. Then you find their verb forms and use it throughout the poem. She drudged her heart through the sand. He nodded, liking that idea and thinking about his next story. He liked the idea of the focus. Swindle, 
launder, cheat. Lots of words came to mind. That's a good tip. What about you? What's your writing tip? She asked. Be kind to yourself, he said. I used to think that first draft had to be perfect. But I read a quote that writing the first draft is like shoveling sand into a box so later you can build castles. Harper smiled again. Why didn't you ever ask me out in high school? The question surprised him, but then he remembered Lila. You were way too cool. Me? Harper seemed shocked by this. Yes, you lived this little bohemian lifestyle with your nomad dad, and I was this geek whose sister everyone wanted to date. You were a big jock on the football team, she said, that read Steinbeck and Kerouac. He leaned back on the bar. Andrew changed the subject, wanting to get back to finding a way he could help her. You really need to figure out what's blocking you in the first place, because it's never about the writing. My apartment reminds me of my failures, she said. I sit there and think about everything that's going wrong in my life, and I can't escape it. I come here on the boat and write sometimes, Andrew said. You should come too. She looked around the cabin and then back at him. I'd love that. When dinner arrived, he unpacked the meals and lit a candle at the dinette. Once they sat, he lifted his glass of wine and said, To flowing words and meeting deadlines. She held up her glass. To something new. His eyes were on hers. To something new. And he leaned over the table and kissed her. Chapter 27 Harper woke and touched her lips. She had hardly slept, but she bounced out of bed. Joan, I think this is going to be a wonderful day, she announced. Joan didn't even lift her head off the bed. The sun just peeked over the horizon when she left her apartment. The streets of Eastport Village were quiet and empty. She walked down to the harbor and met Andrew in the marina's parking lot in the early morning fog. Good morning, he said, greeting her with a cup of coffee. Thank you, she said. Good morning. She had worried about the next time she saw him after he had dropped her off last night. Would things feel as comfortable as they had when she had left him and he had kissed her good night? Or would things feel strange and weird? Andrew leaned over and kissed her on the cheek. Are you sure this is okay? She asked. The harbor was still. Only the gentle lapping of waves could be heard. It's fine, he said, opening the marina's gate and walking down the dock to the boat. He unlocked the doors and opened them, then turned on the lights and opened the curtains. Harper set her computer bag down in the booth seat. There's a bed down there you can sit on. Andrew said, pointing to a small door. He played with a the thermostat. Or wherever. It won't take too long to warm up. She looked around the space, but also kept her eyes on Andrew, unable to stop thinking about their kiss. He looked so handsome and sexy, walking her through the boat, and she couldn't stop stealing glances at him. Thank you so much for this, she said when he was done explaining about the winterized bathroom and how she couldn't use it. You're welcome, he looked at her. I'm happy to help. They stood there, in the middle of the boat, staring at each other. Slowly, lifting on her tippy toes, she kissed Andrew, closing her eyes and softly touching his lips with hers. He didn't stop looking at her after she had stepped back. Wow. She smiled. I'd better get to writing. He nodded, walking backwards to the boat's door. I'll be at Pops if you need anything. He stumbled on the corner of the dinette and tripped. Harper couldn't help but laugh, because he still hadn't stopped looking at her. She waved as he left. With a big inhale, she pulled out her computer and opened to her document. 
The boat lifted up and back down, and she wrote her first sentence. It lifted up in a swell again, softly rolling back and forth like a baby cradle, lulling her to the sea's rhythm. Before Harper knew it, the words poured out of her. As she sat there, rocking back and forth, the story became clear in her head, the character's motivation straightforward. It was like the story had to get out, and her fingers couldn't keep up. By the time Andrew came back to the boat to check on her, she had written more than she ever had in a day. I need to come back, she said, almost worried she might not be able to. Something had come alive in her head on this boat. Come back any time, Andrew said. Do you think I could stay a bit longer? She looked out at the darkening sky. Why don't you stay and write, and I can grab us dinner, Andrew said. She smiled. That sounds perfect. Chapter 28 As the days went by, Biddy noticed Lila coming around more and more frequently, now often arriving for breakfast and some days coming for dinner. Biddy could count on Lila asking to help with whatever Biddy would be doing at the time, and her company was always welcomed. That morning, Lila arrived extra early, and she and Andrew sat at the breakfast table. And that's when Lila sprang the idea on Randy. Why don't you rent out your boat to Harper? she said to her grandfather. Why would a woman want to stay on a boat during the winter on Martha's Vineyard? Pop said. Because she's been riding like crazy on it and needs a place to live, Lila shrugged. Besides, what does being a woman have to do with anything? She's been riding on it, Randy frowned. For how long? Pops, you're not going to use it. Lila said. Mom would be more than willing to hold on to it if you're getting a little bit of rent. Tell her she has to pay for electric and the dock fees, Randy grumbled. But Biddy could see his face soften. I will, Lila said, perking up. She picked up her phone. She'll take great care of the boat. What is she going to do on a boat? Pops gruffed out. He was pouting like Randy liked to do when in the end he always gave in to those kids. She's going to write, Andrew said, standing behind his twin sister. She'd be doing you a favor by taking care of it. What if she smokes in it, Pop said. You're just worried she'll find your Cubans, Biddy said. She had found a box in his office cabinet the other day. It's like jail in here, he huffed as he took a seat. Fine but you can't drive it. Stop that moaning, Biddy said as she walked to the kitchen. She's a doll, and you know it. She better keep it clean, Pop said. No parties. Lila smiled. She's going to write a novel, Pops. She's not going to party. Lila dialed Harper's number right away, and Biddy could hear Lila squeal while telling the story. Biddy smiled to herself as she washed down the counters from breakfast, imagining Harper's reaction on the other end. She dropped the plug into the drain and filled the sink with water to wash dishes. She grabbed her phone, about to check the weather, while waiting for the sink to fill, when her phone started to ring. It was Harper. Biddy, she said as soon as Biddy answered. Yes, sugar, what is it? Though Biddy was sure she was calling about the boat. Guess what, she said into the phone. What's that, Biddy said, excited for her. I found a place to stay. Biddy's heart swelled with joy. She didn't tell Harper about the scheming behind the scenes. I've written like 6,000 words a day since I've been writing on it. I'm totally connected to this boat, Biddy. It's like I'm meant to be moving with the tides, swaying in the waves. Biddy laughed. Her little daydreamer was back. I'm so glad to hear it. I can't wait to have you over. When Harper hung up, everyone left, and she settled Randy in with Judge Judy and went back to her room to look at her calendar. Renee's wedding festivities were just around the corner, 
and Betty still didn't have a date. Evelyn had bugged her for weeks about asking Tommy, but she kept dragging her feet about the idea. She'd felt as though she'd have more fun by herself. But now that even Harper looked like she'd have a date, Biddy decided if she was going to ask, she'd better do it before it was too late. She called Tommy's number, glad she hadn't agreed to Evelyn the other night. If Tommy said no, then she wouldn't have to answer any questions. Biddy, I was hoping you were going to call me, Tommy said as he answered the phone. She smiled. Hello, Tommy. To what do I owe this pleasure? He spoke smoothly, like his voice was singing as well. Well, I was hoping you'd like to be my plus one at Evelyn's daughter's wedding on the 6th. Biddy held her breath as she waited for him to answer. Oh, I wish I could. But I'm working that night, he said. Oh, Biddy felt so stupid. Her daddy would be rolling in his grave if he even knew she had asked a man out on a date. Even though his excuse was legit, she felt silly even thinking that he'd want to go with her to a wedding. Of course he'd be working during wedding season. He was a wedding singer after all. No problem. Sorry I bothered you. Biddy, he said, cutting off her apology. I would have loved to have gone with you. She smiled, but still felt silly getting turned down, no matter what the excuse. Okay, then. Well, I'll talk to you later. She hung up right away and dropped her phone on the couch. She was fine, she told herself. She hadn't made a complete fool out of herself. She was totally fine. She hung her head back and stared up at the ceiling. She didn't need a man. Things were fine better than they had been in a long, long time. Men had caused nothing but trouble in her life. Besides, she had more than enough to worry about with Randy, Drake, and his marriage, and all the girls. She didn't need to add a relationship to it. No, Biddy would be just fine alone. Chapter 29 Harper carried in the last of her bags and dropped them in the two-by-four walking space of her new place. If someone would have told her that her life would change because of a boat, she would not have believed them. But as she stood in the tiny cabin, in the one spot she could stand, she literally felt the change happening inside her. An energy grew with every second, and she could feel it burning at the tips of her fingers. She wanted to write. Within just a few weeks, Harper had almost finished the first draft of her novel. That first day, she had sat on the boat, buoying up and down with the waves, was like unlocking a key to buried treasure. And the story had just floated out of her. She would be done within the month, and from what her editor had seen, she liked it. A lot. Well, Joan, here we are. She opened the cat carrier, and Joan stretched out her two front legs, then stretched out her head and shoulders, acting as though it were another day in the life of a cat. But she then ran into the bed area and hid. You don't have to be tough, Joan. Harper felt his footsteps before she saw Andrew walking down the plank. It was one of those full, dark, gloomy days where dried leaves spun in the wind, and the waves crashed onto shore. He stepped onto the boat with no trouble at all, and she met him on the back deck, holding out her arms. Welcome aboard my new home, she said, and laughed at the idea still. The first thing he did was kiss her. I missed you. She bit her bottom lip when they separated, still feeling the tingle of his five o'clock shadow scruff on her lips. She brushed off a piece of fuzz in his chin and couldn't believe this was her life. Andrew, the boat, her almost finished novel. How did your meeting go with your editors? She asked. Good. I think they're going to go all in on the story, he said. His tone level, but Harper could see the excitement in his eyes. This was big. That's great, Harper said. Above the fold, he said. 
Her eyes expanded, and she jumped up, wrapping her arms around his neck and celebrating. That's wonderful! Are you ready for the bachelorette? Andrew asked. Harper nodded. She had planned most of the festivities since Samantha was in school. Not that she minded, of course. Most of the things Renee wanted to do had been easy enough to plan, and Renee didn't want to have the typical bachelorette. Being a mom of a toddler, she wanted something close to home, to include everyone, and have good food. Harper had wondered if she should hire a stripper anyway, just in case. But Samantha had laughed at the idea, which made her think against it. You meeting up with Matteo and his brothers? She asked. Andrew nodded. The two had become closer since they all began having dinner together at Seaview. Do you think your dad is going tonight? Andrew asked. Harper nodded her head. No one is left out. Do you need help with unpacking? He asked, moving through the bags of clothes and Harper's things. She looked around the space, not sure where she would fit everything. Before moving to the boat, she gave away most of her furniture, which had been hand-me-downs from Charlie. She had kept her box of journals and yearbooks at Seaview, just to be safe. She'd gotten rid of everything else, and it had felt liberating. No longer would she hold on to things she didn't need. She put her hands on her hips and took in a deep breath. I'm good. Andrew nodded, then pointed at one of the few books Harper had brought to the boat. Hey, my book made the cut, he said. The book he had purchased for her on their first date sat displayed on the very small bookshelf in the cabin. Joan hasn't read to the end yet, she teased. How's she doing? Andrew asked, looking around the small space for her cat. Harper jerked her thumb to the bed. She's going to be in hiding for a few days. Then she'll be lounging on the steering wheel. Andrew kissed her before he left, and she watched him walk down the docks to his car. Harper wondered how she would introduce him at the wedding. Was Andrew Whitmore her boyfriend? He was certainly a good kisser, an awesome writing buddy, and an even better friend. She had no idea how she would ever thank him and Lila for thinking about her and arranging the boathouse. She picked up her phone and took a selfie. Then she went to the bedroom and found Joan. She snapped a photo of the hiding cat and sent it to Lila with a message that said, Joan's adjusting. Come on, Joan, she said. Don't you at least want to cuddle? Joan meowed, but she wasn't moving. I'll be in the kitchen, Harper said, pointing three feet away. Real close. She decided to tackle the bag at the dinette now so she could get ready for the bachelorette. After ripping open the trash bag she had used, she pulled out a few of her things and looked back at the small closet. Oi! She looked at the four other bags filled as tightly as the one she already didn't have room for. Maybe she would have to use that closet Evelyn had offered at Seaview. She dropped the clothes as soon as she heard her phone. She expected it to be Lila calling about the boat, but it was her mother's name that appeared on the screen. Her heart raced as the blood drained down her body, making her lungs heavy. Hello? She said quietly, as though Tanya would come jumping out of the phone. Harper, it's Mom. The word felt odd, even coming from her mother. Harper didn't know what to say besides, Hey. I was calling to ask if you'd mind me coming to the island and maybe visiting with you, Tanya said. Harper's mouth became dry. Um. Tanya had made these kinds of promises before, and she had never come to visit. What made her change her mind now? Charlie was getting married. When? Harper asked. Her heartbeat slowed down, returning to normal. I was thinking next month? Tanya raised her voice at the end of her question. But only if you're okay with that. The word no sat on the tip of her tongue. No, she didn't want Tanya sailing into the island right before Charlie finally got his happiness. 
No, she didn't want her mother to come in pretending that 20 years hadn't gone by with her making no effort toward their relationship. No, she didn't want Tanya thinking that they could have a relationship when she had never bothered to have one before. I read your novel. Tanya's voice sounded small. I liked it. Harper wondered if that were true. The vague comment had no substance, and certainly wasn't a compliment. She waited for her mother's comment to pierce her heart. But instead, she remembered a conversation she'd had with Evelyn when some of her reviews on her book had started coming in. Only listen to the reviews when they understand the craft, Evelyn had said. Don't listen to the ones who have nothing constructive to say. They don't understand what it means to bleed on the page. A part of Harper wanted to tell Tanya about Evelyn helping her. She wanted to brag about her wonderful new stepmother, who had given her a chance, worked with her on edits, and had found her an agent and a deal from the publishers. Evelyn had done everything she could to help Harper, not only with her writing, but with life. She had offered her work. She had offered her home. And as simple as it sounded, Evelyn had offered her heart. Harper froze at the realization. All this time, she had focused on the fact that Tanya hadn't offered her heart. Harper had completely lost sight that Evelyn's arms were wide open, along with Renee and Biddy and Wanda and Samantha. She had spent all her time focusing on what she had lost instead of what she had gained. I think that sounds nice, but I don't have anywhere for you to stay, Harper said. Tanya sighed on the other line. I can stay at a hotel. Okay. Harper didn't know what else to say and waited for Tanya to fill the space. But when she didn't, Harper said, I better get going. Harper, Tanya said. Yeah? I miss you. Tanya sounded sincere. A part of Harper wanted to believe that her mother really did miss her, that her trip to Martha's Vineyard was because she wanted to forge a relationship with her daughter. But the other part, the one that had been disappointed so many times, didn't. I look forward to seeing you, Harper said, getting ready to hang up. Send me the details when you have them. Then she ended the call. She stared at her phone, her hands shaking, not knowing what to do next. So she dialed Biddy. My mom just called, she said right away. She wants to come out. That's great, Biddy said. Harper could hear the television in the background. Do you think I should let her come out? Harper wasn't so sure. Are you worried she's trying to ruin the wedding or something? Biddy asked. Harper didn't even know if Tanya knew Charlie was in a relationship. What if she blows me off again? Biddy let out a heavy sigh. Oh, sugar, you have us to lean on if that happens. Harper's throat tightened. I'll see you tonight. You'll see me tonight, Biddy said back. Harper spent the rest of her time writing forgetting about the bags of clothes that weren't going to fit into her new place. She wrote until she had no more time to even get ready. She threw on the only dress she had unpacked and hoped no one noticed how wrinkly it was. As she ran out, she made kissing noises to Joan. I left your favorite right under the table, Harper kissed again. You don't want your blood sugar to drop. With a quick touch-up of her lip gloss, she raced out the door. As she stepped off the boat, she looked back at the illuminated cabin. Maybe she should have turned off the lights, conserved energy. It certainly was wasteful. But she wanted to see the boat lit up in the harbor, under the orange harvest moon that glowed in the calm ripples of the water. When she arrived at the store to help set up, the place had been fully decorated. Samantha, I would have helped. Harper said, dropping the party favors she had remembered to bring onto the counter. 
You did everything already. I was just setting things up. Samantha picked up the bride sash and crown Harper had managed to find. Besides, I love decorating, Samantha said, arranging flowers in a vase. A while back, Harper would have questioned Samantha's sincerity, wondering if she would say something behind her back. You know who was super awesome in helping me, though? Harper said. Who? Samantha asked. Lila. She supplied the guys with tickets to the socks. You're kidding. Samantha couldn't believe it. That's amazing. She pulled some strings, Harper said. Mateo had been thrilled. Harper wasn't sure if there was a bigger fan. The only catch is they have to take Randy, Harper said, and she smiled at the idea of Andrew's grandfather hanging out with all of them. That Randy is a hoot, Samantha immediately laughed. I'm glad Lila's coming tonight. Harper thought back to how excited she had been when Evelyn and Charlie had started dating, how she had so badly wanted a family, but then she wouldn't allow herself to believe she would belong. My mom called me, she said, not sure why she had picked Samantha to share this information with. Harper wasn't super close with Evelyn's youngest daughter. Samantha looked at her as though she too were surprised by the news. What did she say? She wants to come and visit me. Harper could feel the doubt creep in. And she thought of a reason why her mother would bother to visit her. She probably needs money or something. Samantha stopped arranging the flowers and looked up. Maybe she's ready to be a mom. Harper didn't believe it. Maybe. Maybe she's figuring out she let go of the best thing she ever had, Samantha said. Maybe she's changed. Yeah, maybe. Harper thought about how much had changed in her life since she'd last seen her mother. She stood in the same building she had grown up in, but was now so different. She looked around at the bridal decorations, the white lilies and vase glasses, the fairy lights glowing around the room, and the candles flickering on each table. Different, but better. Different, but more in every way. Different, but perfect. I think you should let her come. Open that door so that you always know you tried, Samantha said. Harper agreed. And it felt easy to. Yeah, maybe you're right. If Tanya followed through and wanted to come out, maybe she had changed. As she thought about her mother coming to Martha's vineyard, that's when she saw Andrew walking in with the group of bachelors. Mateo led the guys inside the store, and Renee's eyes brightened the second she saw him. Harper had thought she'd never feel that kind of happiness with another person. In her past relationships, all she'd felt was anxiety and perpetual fear of them leaving her. But as Andrew and the rest of the guys made their way inside the bakery, an energy radiated throughout her whole body, and when he smiled at her, she swore her heart skipped a beat. As everyone congregated together in the bakery, talking about the plans for the evening, Harper's heart swelled at being part of the activity. I'm ready for some dancing, Julia shouted out as Samantha and Hank poured champagne into glasses. She dropped her head back and took the whole glass in one gulp. Mama's getting loose tonight. Julia's husband, Jose, smiled. Maybe we should skip this and go home. We have a completely empty house. Julia made a face. You're joking, right? Mateo wrapped his arms around Jose's neck. Come on, brother. We're going to see the socks in a box. That's like a dream come true. Having a night with my wife alone is a dream come true, said Jose, as Julia stood on her tippy toes to kiss her husband. Where's Lila? Harper asked Andrew, figuring they'd be together. Andrew looked at his phone, then shrugged. I don't know. She's usually late. He kissed her on the cheek and said, Pops is here with Biddy, and I'm going to park the car so she can drive home later.
I'll be right back. Harper watched as Andrew took off. The rest of the group all talked together, the energy loud and joyous. Biddy walked in with Randy, and the guys all shouted, Pops! Randy held up his fist in the air, and the guys whistled and clapped. Harper looked out the window, waiting for Andrew, when she noticed a figure stop in front of the store's window. The figure turned to walk back to the front door and came inside. Joel? Harper couldn't believe it. Dr. Joel Schaefer came strutting into the store. The guys were still boisterous, but the women instantly stopped talking. Mateo turned and broadened his chest. What are you doing here? Joel didn't notice the change in atmosphere since he walked in, or he didn't care. He walked through the small group of people as though he weren't intruding on an intimate gathering of friends. Joel held out his hands, rubbing them together, and said, Harper, I hope you don't mind, but I saw you in the window. I've been wanting to apologize for... Joel? Andrew came walking in from the back of the store. Joel turned around, his forehead creased as though confused at Andrew's presence. I should have known, Joel said to Andrew. What do you want, Joel? Harper asked, hoping and praying he left before Lila came. I just wanted to say I'm sorry, he said. A lot less sincere than before, his focus solely on Andrew's glare. What do you want, man? Andrew didn't say anything. Lila and I were never going to work, Joel said as he huffed. I mean... She was completely off the rails, going after Harper like she did. The vein on Andrew's forehead pulsed as he kept his stare on Joel. Hey, Andrew, let's head out to the game, Mateo said, patting him on the shoulder, but Andrew kept his eyes on Joel. Don't worry, I'm not interested in your sister anymore, Joel said, and he turned to Harper. Let's take this outside. Andrew said. Harper's eyes widened. Andrew, what are you doing? Something I should have done long ago. Andrew rolled up his sleeves. Joel laughed. Sure, whatever, Whitmore. Get lost. Joel turned back to Harper. I'm really sorry about everything. But if you let me explain, you mean... Like how you told her I cheated on you with my trainer? Lila said from the door. I don't even exercise. The crowd started quieting down. Renee's head snapped from one person talking to the next, like she was watching a tennis match. Joel backed away from Harper, and she moved toward Lila. But I heard you cheated with the trainer. And your assistant nurse, and my best friend, Lila said. Joel's mouth dropped. Are you serious right now, Lila? She folded her arms across her chest. Yes, completely and utterly serious. Andrew stepped behind Lila. Harper smiled as Lila stood up against Joel, back straight and chin held high. He looked at the crowd who looked back at him. He shook his head, then left the store. You okay? Harper asked Lila. Lila didn't look okay, but she nodded. Yeah, fine. Harper didn't push it, but she gave a look to Andrew. The men ended up leaving shortly after to catch the game. Samantha ran off the events for the night. Renee looked over the moon about everything wearing her crown and her sash with pride. At the end of the night, it was just the daughters back at Seaview with Evelyn. I'm so hungry, Samantha said, opening the fridge to look for something to eat. George is sound asleep, Renee said as she walked back into the kitchen from upstairs. Marty had babysat for the evening. Look in the pantry, Renee said. Samantha's eyes widened as she looked to her mother. You didn't, Evelyn nodded and smiled. 
I did. Samantha ran to the pantry, looking for what the sisters were talking about. Harper waited as Samantha walked to the table with a tin cookie bin in her hands. Mom? Samantha said as Evelyn rushed to the fridge. I'm on it. Renee pulled out four glasses. Mom makes the best homemade chocolate chip cookies. Coming from Renee, a master pastry chef, Harper was impressed. I didn't know you baked. Harper hadn't really seen Evelyn do much baking. Samantha pushed the tin to Harper first. You have to try them. Harper took a cookie and bit into it. The three women watched as she chewed. She placed her hand in front of her mouth but couldn't hold her moan back. Oh my God, this is fabulous. It was the best cookie in the world. See where I get it from, Renee said. Evelyn shook her head. This is the only recipe I have. Harper grabbed a second cookie and smiled as the rest of the women each ate a cookie too. Harper was happy to be there with them, to be included in this intimate moment. They ended up sitting around the table for hours, talking about everything and anything, but mostly the wedding. When Matteo called to check in after the game, telling Renee how much he loved her, Harper could see the love she had for Matteo glow from within her. Harper knew the two were perfect for each other. And Harper was happy for them. When the talking wound down, Evelyn tried to convince Harper to stay the night. Joan is freaking out right now, Harper said. But really, she couldn't wait to arrive back to her new place. Are you sure? Evelyn asked again. Mom, she wants to go back, Samantha said, giving Harper a look as though she too got annoyed with Evelyn's pushiness. But Harper didn't get annoyed. Instead, she reached out and hugged Evelyn, taking her by surprise. Oh, Renee said, spreading her arms around both of them. Hey, I want in too. Samantha yawned, but wrapped her arms around all of them. Thanks. I mean, I love you, guys. Harper stumbled through the words, so happy they jumbled in her mouth and so emotional she couldn't get the right ones out. Harper drove home in silence, replaying the night on the way home. Everything about the moment seemed magnetized. The whistling of wind over the car, the stillness outside, the darkness of the night. She pulled into the empty parking lot. Only seven other brave souls stayed on their boats throughout the winter. Most people stored their boats on land at the marina, or took off down the coast to warmer waters. She locked her car and walked down the docks to her slip. Linda glowed from the outside. The boat floated ever so slightly with the sea underneath her belly. She really looked beautiful under the moonlight. The cold moved Harper inside. Joan, she called out as she shut the doors behind her and locked them. She walked through the cabin to the bed and looked underneath. Meow, Joan cried. Have you had any dinner? Harper asked, looking behind her to the full food bowl. Meow. Joan went on with her rant, meowing in different octaves to really give Harper a hard time. Come on, Harper patted her legs. Joan hesitated, but slowly and surely, Joan stretched out her paws, climbed out from under the bed, and started rubbing her body against Harper. As Joan moved her way to Harper's lap, Harper looked around the space. It was small, smaller than she could have even anticipated for some reason. She wouldn't be able to fit most of her things. Joan was going to take a lot of time to adjust, and it was only until Randy wanted his boat back. But Harper loved it, and she finally felt like she was home. When Joan had had enough, Harper got up from the floor and heard her name being called out from outside. Harper! There was a knock on the glass of the door. She could tell it was Andrew before she even opened the curtain. He wore a Red Sox hat and a jersey and held a foam hand. Did they win? She asked, opening the door. I love you, Andrew blurted out. 
What? Harper hadn't expected that. I can't stop thinking about you, Andrew said, dropping all his merch. I know this is a lot, and I'm probably ruining my chances by being here, but I- Harper grabbed hold of his shirt and pulled him into the cabin, kissing him on the lips and shutting the curtains. Chapter 30 Evelyn sat up in bed, looking out as the sun slowly made its way above the horizon, the oranges and yellows and purples all blushing together over the water. Off in the distance, she found what she was looking for, a seagull gliding above the earth. George, can you believe our baby girl is getting married? She said it with a laugh, but her heart caught in her throat. She exhaled, sitting in silence for a bit longer than usual, holding her emotions together. If she started crying now, she'd be a wreck the whole day. Shaking out her hands, she exhaled again. And in the quiet, Evelyn said a little prayer, almost the exact same prayer she said the moment she first held Renee in her arms. Please watch over her. Taking one last deep breath, Evelyn got up, ready for this next moment in her life. The morning had been a blur as the excitement buzzed throughout Seaview. Everyone fluttered around getting dressed, helping with setting up, and moving around as the photographer grabbed shots of the day. Evelyn almost couldn't keep it together when Renee dressed George in his suit with the cutest brown leather shoes Evelyn had ever seen. Everyone looked amazing each one having had help from the others when dress shopping. Evelyn had picked out a burgundy floor-length chiffon with a gorgeous lace shawl. The girls all wore the same navy color, but in different styles that fit their taste. Samantha and Harper both looked beautiful. Then it was time for Renee to get dressed. Evelyn helped as Renee got inside, buttoning up the back as carefully as possible, trying to do everything just perfectly so nothing went wrong. Evelyn choked up as she stood there alone with Renee. You look beautiful. Renee smiled, looking in the mirror at herself. She twirled around, checking out every angle. I can't believe we're really here. Evelyn looked at her daughter, the tears forming in her eyes. She had never seen her so beautiful. Your dad would have loved to see you so happy. Renee grabbed a tissue. He and Mateo would get along so well. Evelyn laughed at the idea of George talking woodworking with Mateo. Your father would be following him around to all his jobs and asking how he did things. Renee dotted her eyes. I sometimes feel like Daddy brought him to us. Evelyn loved the use of the pronoun us. I think you may be right, Evelyn said. Biddy and Wanda arrived at the house, both looking stunning in their dresses, eager to start helping. The photographer captured everything. As the limo pulled up, the girls helped Renee inside, and Evelyn watched from afar, looking at the scene happening in front of her, and whispered, We did it, George. We did it. In the rectory of Mateo's childhood church, the wedding party stood in their lines, Harper and Samantha each paired with one of Mateo's brothers. You ready, Mom? Renee asked, standing poised in position, cool as a cucumber and as happy as can be. Evelyn had braced herself for this exact moment. She wasn't ready. She looked out at the doors where she would walk her eldest daughter down the aisle for her George. Walking Renee and Samantha down the aisle had been the one thing George had always looked forward to doing as their father. How unfair, she thought. George wanted nothing more than to experience this exact moment. In Samantha's arms, baby George wiggled and squirmed. Mama! George cried, holding out his arms. The music began to play, and Samantha started to panic as George weaseled his way out of her arms. Georgie, you're supposed to walk Auntie Sammy down the aisle, Renee said to the unrelenting toddler. She remained completely calm through his temper tantrum. Hot! 
All of George's limbs moved up and around, his body twisting in Samantha's arms. He was not going to stay in his aunt's grasp, no matter what. Samantha tried all she could, but George got loose, and Renee took him, holding him out in front of her, and baby George settled right down. His legs wrapped around her designer wedding gown, and she held him in her arms. He took the pearl necklace Renee wore and started speaking his talk. You want to come with me down the aisle? Renee asked. George nodded emphatically. Geez, Georgie, Samantha made a face. Then he pointed at the doors. Me too. Renee looked down at Georgie, and it reminded Evelyn so much of how Renee would act with George Sr., wiggling out of Evelyn's arms as soon as he had walked through the door, doing anything and everything to get away from her. Evelyn's feelings had been hurt when Renee would cry and scream for her and then calm completely down in his arms. Now as she watched Renee hold her and George's grandson, she felt his presence. A tear fell straight down her cheek, but she whisked it away before anyone noticed. I know you're here, she said to him in her head. Okay, little man, Renee said, as though this wasn't the biggest moment of her life. Let's go down the aisle together with Nana. And that's when the doors opened, and the whole congregation stood. Evelyn didn't see anyone's faces with the tears that welled up in her eyes. She wore a smile she couldn't break, but she couldn't pick out anyone's face. It didn't matter, though. Evelyn knew everyone they loved and cared about were all there, sitting in the seats. The one person she could see, standing at the front of the church, beaming with his own tears, was Matteo, waiting for Renee. And that made everything perfect. Evelyn took Renee's arm in hers as she held on to baby George, and she walked them down the aisle. Chapter 31 Biddy whistled as Renee and Matteo kissed. She clapped so hard and loud, her hands were bright pink by the end of the ceremony. She did love a good wedding. Randy patted his eyes with a handkerchief, then pretended to clean his glasses when she peeked over at him. They're all smudged. No shame in being emotional. I'm not emotional, Randy humphed. I was a district court judge. I am impartial. You're an old sentimental fool who loves a good cry. Biddy wasn't letting him fool anyone. Come on, let's go see the bride and groom. She looked so amazing, Lila said from the other side of Randy. I think the bridesmaid's dresses were really darling. When Biddy agreed to care for Randy, she had expected nothing more than a job and a paycheck. She thought she'd be losing everything she had gained moving to the island. Never had she imagined through accepting the job she'd find more friendships. But her little circle of three women who had gone on a singles cruise had now grown, and she couldn't be more thankful for it. Everyone filed out of the church, stepping outside into the crisp autumn air. Leaves cascaded down as the newlyweds took off to the reception. Biddy drove with Lila and Randy to Seaview, where a large white tent had been set up outside. The whole place had been lit only by candles. As Lila and Randy sat down at their seats, it appeared to Biddy that everyone had brought someone but her. She hadn't recovered from Tommy's rejection to brave another attempt. Not that she had anyone else to ask. The island at this time of year tended to be empty. She thought about Richard, and if he would have liked this type of crowd. Would her cowboy want to mingle among East Coasters? He wouldn't be able to talk Patriot football, but he'd enjoy everyone's company. Then she thought about Drake. Would her son fit in like Evelyn's family? She knew they would open their hearts and welcome Drake and his family, but would he be as willing? Would they love her son as much as she did? Yes, she thought, as she looked around. They would. Before she sat down at her table with Wanda and Marty and the rest of the writer's crew, she sent a text to Drake. Let me buy you tickets to come visit. No pressure. 
but I'd love to have y'all out here. She turned off her phone. She'd keep it off for the rest of the night. She had planted her seed with good intention. To mend. Did you hear why they used all these candles? Wanda asked as soon as she sat down at the table next to her. No, why? Biddy thought it looked amazing. Renee and Mateo wanted to make it look like Prayer Cove, Wanda said. The small cove sat at the end of Sugar Beach, just a short walk from Seaview. Back when Martha's vineyard had been filled with fishermen, wives would light a candle and make a prayer for safe seas while their husbands were away. Now people brought prayer candles and lit them, saying prayers or just lighting up the cove at night. Biddy had gone and lit a few candles herself. It really does look amazing. Biddy couldn't think of a better word for it. The place looked like a fairy tale. Even though they sat in a tent in the middle of October, it felt warm and cozy, and she could still hear the waves breaking. Flowers draped every surface, and crystals shimmered the candles' lights everywhere and on every one. The whole place sparkled. Evelyn hadn't spared a dime. A string quartet played in the background as people ate their filet mignon served with a lobster tail or grilled Atlantic salmon in a balsamic demi-glace. Biddy couldn't remember all four of the options. She chose the beef. I heard Harper's bringing the new one to the next writer's meeting, Anita said to Wanda and Biddy. It's about time, Hank said. She's been dating him for a few weeks now. Who's dating? Evelyn said as she stepped up to the table. Evelyn, the table exclaimed. She put her arm around Biddy and leaned into her. Renee looked gorgeous, Anita said to Evelyn. Yes, oh, Evelyn, what a beautiful ceremony, Dan said. She looks stunning, Marty said. She did, didn't she? Evelyn put her hand on her heart. I could barely keep it together walking down with her and George. Everyone oohed and awed at the memory. You glowed with happiness walking Renee down the aisle, Wanda said. What a very special moment. Biddy could see the flicker in Evelyn's eyes, the slight pain she had felt about taking the place of her past husband. Wanda probably felt it too, which is why she had recognized it. Biddy reached up and squeezed Evelyn's arm. You did great. Evelyn nodded, pulling back her emotions. Then as the conversation moved on to others, Evelyn leaned down and whispered in Biddy's ear. Guess who I invited to the wedding, Evelyn whispered. The mischievous smile on Evelyn's face worried Biddy. What did you do, Evelyn? Evelyn's favorite motto lately had been, Go big or go home. And since technically Biddy didn't have her own home, she did not want to have to go big. I invited the band, she said. Then with a wink, Evelyn dashed off with Charlie to talk to another table, leaving Biddy dumbfounded at the table, sandwiched between couples. She invited the band, she said to Wanda, thinking she had been listening to the conversation but Wanda looked at her as though she had no idea what she was talking about. What did you say? Wanda asked, who Biddy now realized had been talking to Marty. Never mind, Biddy said, noticing the quartet had stopped playing. From the other side of the tent, set up in front of the dance floor, was a tiny stage. Then she saw Tommy enter with his guitar, strapping it around his neck. He stood at the microphone in front of the crowd and looked directly at where Biddy sat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tommy Taylor, and this is our little band. The couple asked us to get you all moving on the dance floor. He began to play and sing, but Tommy kept his eyes on Biddy the whole time. The rest of the night was a blur. She hadn't danced that long and that late into the night since she was younger much younger. It felt good, and she could tell her body was going to pay for it later, but she danced. She danced with her friends, the kids, 
with Charlie, with Mateo, and even Randy. She twirled and swirled and jumped and YMCA'd and had more fun than she had in years. As Renee and Mateo said goodbye to the crowd, Renee threw her bouquet into the air, and Harper jumped straight up and caught it. You'd think she played football, Biddy teased to Charlie. Charlie looked surprised and delighted at the same time. She's really into this guy. He's a darling, Biddy put her hand on his shoulder. Charlie let out a breath. I do really like Andrew. It's not him, it's me. Guess I'm not ready to let her go yet. Biddy smiled. She's really doing great. She's a lovely young woman. Charlie nodded. They looked at Harper talking to Andrew, the bouquet between them. When Randy fell asleep in his chair at the table during shout, Biddy made an executive decision that it was time to take him home. I can drive him back, Lila said. Nonsense, Biddy said. Lila stood in bare feet, her hair up in a sweaty ponytail, still in full-on party mode. Biddy had had a wonderful time, but her feet were throbbing. She wanted to use her own bathroom, and she was tired. I'm happy to head back, Biddy said. Stay and have fun. Biddy headed to Randy, and that's when she noticed the live music had stopped and recorded music was playing as people continued to dance. Biddy, a man's voice called out from behind her. She turned to see Tommy coming toward her. I tried to tell you about the wedding, he said. She felt foolish. She remembered how she had cut him off and hung up in humiliation. He had tried to tell her, but she didn't listen. I'm sorry. It's okay, he said with a smile. You could ask me to be your date now. She looked around the half-empty room and saw Randy slumped asleep in a chair. Her heart plummeted when she saw all the kids still dancing and having a good time. Off in the corner, Evelyn and Charlie slow danced. Marty whispered in Wanda's ear. Diddy made a face. I have to take Randy home. I can help take Randy to bed. Tommy nodded at Randy, who snored contently in the middle of the tent. Deal, she said. Then she remembered her phone and the reply she had hoped would come from Drake. How about another night? Uh-oh, he said. Like a real date, Biddy said. He tipped his head. You promise? She nodded. They both looked to Randy. How about this, Tommy said. Let me take you and Randy home and say goodnight. She eyed him. He held up his hands. I swear, no funny stuff. My daddy taught me two things before I went into kindergarten. What's that, Tommy said with a smirk. How to use a shotgun and how to use my knee, she said. Your daddy sounds mighty scary, Tommy said, and Biddy roared with laughter. You think you can lift him without hurting his arm? Biddy asked. Tommy nodded. Okay, a ride would be great. She figured having a hand with Randy was a better idea than not, even if that meant staying up a little longer talking to Tommy. She trusted him enough to know he didn't expect more from her than that. Did I tell you how amazing you look tonight? He said, as they walked toward the sleeping Randy. No, she said. She looked for Evelyn and Wanda, wanting to make sure to say goodbye. Harper and Andrew were some of the few left dancing to the music, arm in arm, as though they were the only two people on earth. It turned out to be a good thing Tommy helped, because they also needed Andrew and Harper to help too. They got Randy into the car and Tommy drove them home. They sat in silence for the five-minute drive down the road, but it didn't feel awkward or strange. It was the kind of silence that was shared. By the time they got Randy into the house, Biddy could do the rest on her own. Randy didn't need his friend seeing him in his nightgown. Thank you for your help, Biddy said at the doorway. Tommy stepped back. 
I'm glad I got to spend time with you tonight. She smiled, leaning a little bit out toward him. I thought maybe we could go on a bike ride. Hmm. He made a face, as though he wasn't sure he liked the idea. That sounds real nice, but how about a motorcycle ride instead? Biddy laughed. I'll need to think about that one. She rested her head against the doorframe, not wanting to leave that spot and have this perfect evening end. Good night, Tommy, she said. He walked backwards down the sidewalk toward his van. Good night, Biddy. She watched as Tommy drove away. Then she went back to her apartment. She decided to step outside to check her phone. It had been hours since she'd sent the text to Drake. She turned it on. Messages flooded her inbox, and she could see so many names and alerts. She scrolled through, making sure she didn't skip any, when she saw his name. Her thumb hovered over it. Her hands shook. Please say yes, she said to herself. We'd really like that. I showed DJ the photos of the beach, and he can't wait to see the ocean. He wanted me to send a picture for you to see how big he is. Biddy opened the photo and enlarged it to see her grandson standing in front of a school with a wide grin on his face. He's missing his front tooth, Biddy replied back, and she sent a heart. She waited to see if he'd reply. Then she saw the dots. He can't wait to see you again. Her hand covered her mouth, holding back a cry of joy. She laughed as tears fell down her face. I can't wait to see you both. Biddy gazed out at the stars hanging low above the ocean and knew everything would be fine. She was sure of it. Christmas at Cliffside. Romantic Women's Fiction. Cliffside Point, Book 5. Written by Ellen Joy. Narrated by Jennifer March. Chapter 1. Lila Whitmore stood in the reception room of the wharf, among the women of Martha's Vineyard's elite, as they chatted about decorating their beach houses or winter houses or weekend getaway houses for Christmas. I found this amazing fabric designer in Europe, Abigail Schofield said, just vaguely enough to make Lila question her. Abigail tended to exaggerate the facts. But Lila didn't care enough today. She didn't care about interior designs or country clubs or summer parties. She didn't care what their husbands, children, or extended family did. She didn't care about their charities or the philanthropy work they were doing, because none of it mattered. All that mattered to the women standing together at the annual Christmas luncheon was who was wealthier, skinnier, classier, or whatever else made these women better than the other. All they did was compare themselves and try to outdo the others by what they wore, what they drove, or where they lived. And as she listened to Abigail tell the women how wonderful her new curtain rods were, Lila wondered why she never noticed this behavior before. Lila! Abigail said suddenly, as though Lila had missed an important part of the conversation. Excuse me. Lila made her smile as perky as possible. What are you doing for Christmas this year? Hannah Taylor asked, her face scrunched as though she were hitting a nerve. Lila glanced around at the dozen or so women, all waiting for her to answer. They were like vultures, waiting for a sick animal to die. Whatever Lila said at this moment would be spoken about, examined, and judged. I'm staying on the island and celebrating with my family, she said. Gigi St. Pierre tilted her head. I thought your parents were going down to Palm Beach. Shoot, Lila said in her head. Gigi hadn't forgotten her parents' annual plans. She noticed Gigi looking at Abigail, swallowing back a laugh. Yes, I know, Lila said. I'm staying with my grandfather. Hannah made a face at Abigail, who made a face at Gigi. That's nice, Gigi said with fake enthusiasm. 
Roland and I are headed to Paris again, Hannah said. I just love it there at Christmas time. Have you ever been to Provence's Christmas markets? Abigail asked, a bit of competition in her voice. Lila looked out the window, wishing she hadn't come to the annual ladies' Christmas luncheon for Martha's Vineyard's Charity Society. She could have just dropped off presents at the local church and accomplished the same exact thing. As the women continued to one-up the other, Lila snuck away to the window of the dining room. The wharf sat right along the Atlantic coast, and from where she stood, the water seemed as though it went under the restaurant. She stared out at the cold gray sea, its waters choppy with whitecaps. The clouded gray sky above matched the water below. Inside the wharf, it looked like a Christmas Hallmark movie. Light strung around a tall Christmas tree with gorgeous glass ornaments, wreaths hanging on doors, garland wrapped around doors and the large mirrors, everything colored in reds and golds and greens. She looked back at the group of women standing together, not even noticing Lila's exit. It didn't matter, she kept reminding herself. None of what they thought mattered. They could say what they wanted about her. It didn't matter. Her mother was deep in conversation with Abigail's and Gigi's mothers. Gigi's mother, Deborah, snuck a look in Lila's direction and quickly glanced away. It didn't matter. Lila kept her gaze on the choppy gray waves. She smiled to herself, thinking of her friend Harper writing on the boat, typing away with the sway of the ocean. Lila almost wished she had thought of staying on the boat herself. Not that she didn't want Harper to have a place to live, but Lila didn't want to go back to her big, empty house. Deborah snuck another look, and Lila decided to head to the restrooms. She'd sneak out if it weren't for the award she was receiving after the meal. As she walked through the crowd and made her way to the bathroom, she noticed her mother with a new group of women. Sonia did not seem to be happy about whatever was being said. Lila tried to remember a time when Sonia was happy. When was the last time her mother had laughed? Like, belly laughed. When was the last time she had looked like she enjoyed herself? Lila couldn't remember. It had to have been a year. Christmas last year, Lila had seen her mother happy when the engagement had been announced. Joel had even gotten her father's permission. Sonia had cried with joy at the announcement. Lila picked up her phone, about to text Andrew, her twin brother, to ask if he had seen their mother happy in the past year, when she heard her name. Lila's got nothing else going for her but this award. Lila froze before turning the corner. It was Abigail. Lila's former best friend's voice was unmistakably annoying. She looks like a complete fool being here today, Hannah said. I mean, she was only asked to head those events because of her mom. And now we must sit through this ridiculous ceremony. Lila's pulse sped up. It doesn't matter, she said to herself. It doesn't matter what they say. Did you hear? Her parents invited Joel to their place in Palm Beach still. And that's why she isn't going? Abigail said with a laugh. Can you imagine your parents choosing your ex over you? Lila's heart dropped. Have you seen who she's been hanging around with lately? Hannah said, lowering her voice. Oh, I know, that weird girl from high school. Harper, Abigail said with a giggle. Joel told me he had stayed with her because he was worried about her. Lila's throat went dry. No wonder he left her, Hannah said. Lila jumped behind a plant as Abigail and Hannah came around the corner. They didn't even notice her standing there, barely hidden by a ficus tree. Had her father invited Joel to Palm Beach? Lila was positive Sonia wouldn't have invited him, but would her father? Andrew would flip out if it were true. He didn't need more ammunition to start in on their father. She looked at her mother, standing in the middle of the room, her minions orbiting around her like planets around the sun, just doing what had always been done, 
without ever changing course. She could hear Abigail's laugh over the crowd's murmurs. As people started to move toward their seats, she noticed Sonia looking for her. A Whitmore wouldn't let a little gossip ruin the spotlight. Her mother had been waiting for this moment since the day she made Lila sit on her charity board. It didn't matter if anyone in the room liked or respected Lila, as long as the trophy or award said Whitmore on it. Lila stayed in the shadows, wishing she could be anywhere but there. Her phone buzzed with a text message from her mother. Where are you? Sonia's swan-like neck swung around to see where Lila was. I'm not feeling well, Lila texted back. Could you accept for me? Her mother read the text in the middle of the room, then dropped the phone to her side, storming off toward the honoree's table up front. She whispered something in Marjorie Hatfield's ear and put her phone away. She never texted Lila back. Knock em dead, Biddy sent. Lila immediately felt guilty. She had practiced her acceptance speech with Biddy at her grandfather's place the night before. She had been hanging out a lot at Pop's, or on Harper's boat, or Sunday dinners at Evelyn Rose's house. She hung out at Books and Bread and volunteered at the library and nursing home. Anything so she didn't have to go back to the house. But as her mother rolled her eyes with her friends, probably telling them about her having to save her daughter once again, Lila had no desire to play the game any longer. That's when something came over her. Something she wouldn't be able to explain later. A sudden jolt of courage she hadn't had with this group or her mother before. She walked out onto the floor where, for some reason, a makeshift dance floor sat, which no one ever used at these kinds of events. She plowed past the group with Abigail and Hannah, past their mothers as they circled around Sonia, and walked up to the stage, where Marjorie was trying to wrangle everyone's attention. If you ladies could find your seats, please, Mrs. Peterson, the head co-chair, said. She and Lila's mother had scrutinized the seating chart for hours. Like a wave coming to shore, the women moved together toward their seats. Sonia hesitated before moving, all the while keeping an eye on Lila. Lila gave her a smile, which seemed to satisfy Sonia enough to find her seat at the front table, where she and the other royal members of the Martha's Vineyard Charity Society sat together. Lila's heart pounded hard inside her chest. She was going to do it. Do what she had said she would the other night as a joke with Harper. Marjorie leaned over the podium and into the microphone. Lila would take the microphone off the stand. She wanted to hold it in her hands, so she had something to do with them. Then she'd give her speech, the one she had practiced with Harper over a bottle of wine. As Nancy began welcoming the group, Lila second-guessed herself the whole time, especially when she saw Abigail lock eyes on her after whispering something in Hannah's ear. Marjorie read her own speech, which Lila's mother had written, listing all her work through the year. No wonder Harper had hated Lila in high school, because back then, she would have done the same thing if she were in Abigail's position. She'd divert the attention to something else, or in her case, someone else, and Lila was a pretty good target. Everyone knew Joel had cheated on her with his trainer and his assistant. Abigail just seemed to think that Lila didn't know about her sleeping with Joel. Everyone. Please put your hands together for this year's Volunteer of the Year Award winner, Lila Whitmore. Marjorie held out a glass award with Lila's name engraved on it. Lila didn't even stop her stride as she took the microphone off its stand. Thank you, Marjorie, Lila said. She gave a quick look at Sonia as she took in a deep breath. I have always enjoyed giving my time and volunteering, but never more so than this year. As many of you know, this has been one of the most difficult years of my life. Sonia's eyes widened in horror. Smirks began to grow around Abigail's table. But since no one really wants to sit here and talk about my charity work, and would rather hear about Joel's affairs, I'll clear the air. She looked directly at Abigail, 
who quickly caught on. She had bet wrong on Lila, terribly wrong. All the rumors are true. Joel cheated on me. He cheated on me with his assistant at his office, his trainer before that, and with one of my dearest and closest friends. And probably more women I don't even know. Abigail's mouth dropped in horror. The rest of the women sitting around the table, the very women who would have been her bridesmaids, all had immediate reactions of shock, horror, and enjoyment. They were supposed to be her best friends. But she wasn't sure if they ever had been true friends. How could you sleep with your best friend's fiancé? Either way, Lila certainly didn't want to be friends with them any longer. Sonia stood up, but Lila had expected this, and it was why she held the microphone. Sonia would have to rip it out of her hands. I want to thank all of you who looked the other way instead of telling me. Lila stared directly into her mother's eyes. Oh, and I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you for the award. <laughs>